Translator's Preface of Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines. 1882-1943. In presenting this, Jung's crowning work, to the English-speaking world, I would like to make a brief sketch of the curve of the author's thought, for like everything that is rooted in reality, Jung's standpoint shows a definite line of development, and the following of this progression may add a historical sidelight to the understanding of the present work. I would have preferred to avoid the troubled waters of controversy, but it does not seem possible to relate the history of Jung's standpoint without at the same time contrasting it with that of Freud. That this somewhat thankless task was necessary is proved by the still frequent coupling of the two schools of thought under a common denomination, suggesting that the general mind has, as yet, failed to make a clear distinction between the contrasting standpoints. Freud undoubtedly is an analytical genius, one has only to read his early studies upon the ideology of hysteria to be struck by the virtuosity of his subtle reasoning. It was an intuitive capacity of no ordinary shrewdness that revealed the hidden significance of the hysterical syndrome, for it opened the way to an entirely new conception of the unconscious, and led to a rediscovery of the dream as a significant and purposeful product of that same unconscious activity of which the hysterical manifestations were a somatic expression. Freud was like a master detective, tracking down the incriminating complex in the unconscious, while Brewer, his colleague, contented himself by exercising the repressed elements from above by abreaction under a hypnosis. In medical science, we can discern two main human types or attitudes whose behavior towards the therapeutic problem presents a characteristic contrast. The chief interest of the one lies in the welfare of mankind and the healing of his patient. The other's interest is monopolized by the ideological problem presented by the patient's condition, and is concerned in a less degree with its remedy. The one attempts to discover a remedy before understanding the problem. The other tends to become so completely immersed in the problem that the original objective, e.g. the healing of mankind, is often lost to view. We do not find the greatest minds succumbing to either of these frailties, but it is not out of place to outline such typical predispositions, since the vague benevolence and imperfect understanding of the one are as far below the scientific desideratum as are the other's exclusive ardors for the scientific chase, a blemish upon the ideal of humanity. While Brewer, therefore, seems to have been content with the therapeutic efficacy of hypnotic abreaction, Freud found in this procedure merely a starting point for a further investigation of those avenues which the abreacted material opened out. And, as he rather naively admits, no one was the more surprised than himself to observe that this further investigation of the patient's subterranean activities produced valuable therapeutic results. It is, of course, true that some of the most beneficent therapeutic measures have been discovered in precisely this way, as incidental by-products, as it were, of the process of scientific investigation. But for the purpose of comparison, it is important to stress the fact that Freud's approach was preeminently that of the empirical investigator, because it is in this attitude that we find both his strength and his limitation as a psychologist. We will return again to this point when the picture has been more fully outlined. While Freud was enduring the obloquy of the psychological pioneer in Vienna, Jung was approaching similar conclusions from a very different angle in Zurich. By a further elaboration of the word association experiments formerly employed by Galton and Wundt for other ends, he succeeded in the most delicate task of devising objective criteria for the recognition of unconscious complexes. The discovery of prolonged reaction time, perseveration, etc., associated with the effect-toned presentations led to his invaluable formulation of the complex, 
from which he advanced to the same fundamental concept of repression which freud had reached by the clinical route this naturally brought the two pioneers together and jung found in freud's masterly analytical technique the admitted high road to the unconscious processes in so far as it was purely a question of method freud and jung found themselves in harmony but the study of psychological processes can never remain a mere question of method sooner or later it must challenge the investigator to produce a philosophical standpoint and here a basic psychological difference began to make itself felt freud the empiricist wanted to limit his psychological principles to empirically ascertainable matters of fact on the lines of orthodox scientific determinism he preferred an exclusively causal and reductive account of the psyche jung on the other hand appreciated the fact that man was more than a variously disordered object he was also a self-creating subject he argued that the causal explanation cannot be regarded as exclusive in the psychological realm since the final or purposive explanation finds equal justification in human experience he began to feel that the inevitable sexual interpretations however widely the term might be stretched were too poor a rendering of the passionate and infinitely diverse aims of the human soul in harmony therefore with robert mayer's conception in the realm of physics he developed the energic conception of the libido thus lifting the whole subject from a one-sided purely empiricistic standpoint to the level of universal concepts where science and philosophy are able to understand one another the actual point of divergence between the two standpoints occurred significantly enough over the question of the mother imago as is well known freud's interpretation of the mother image in dreams is exclusively referred to the actual mother or the mother surrogate jung contended that the almost magical influence of the parent imago with its supreme dynamic effect upon the whole course of a man's life not only shaping his actions thoughts and relations to the world with secret and invisible determination but also creating the figures of the father and mother deities in his religious and fantasy life could find no final explanation in the actual events of infantile and adolescent experience the difficulty was admitted by freud but the acceptance of inherited racial experience as an integral factor in psychic life opened such menacing vistas involving frank disaster to the comprehensive system he had devised and was prepared to demonstrate to the world that he resolutely shut his eyes to the possibility of this boundless and primeval continuity he was only prepared to explain the discrete individual psyche and jung's conception of the collective unconscious opened the door to unnamed things from the jungle and primeval forest it introduced a world of unknown elemental forces which must be unconditionally excluded from a scientific system but apart from the considerations above alluded to jung's argument was incontestable the lungs of the newborn infant know how to breathe the heart knows how to beat the whole coordinated organic system knows how to function only because the infant's body is the product of inherited functional experience the whole story of man's struggle for adaptation to life his whole phylogenetic history are represented in that knowing how of the infant's body is it then blindness or fear that urges us to deny to the infant psyche that same functional inheritance which is so manifestly present in the other organs what is this dark fear of our archaic past which prompts us to reject the possibility of any psychic experience other than that of our individual lives at all events it is clear that once the existence of these inherited psychic structures is admitted as the basis of psychic activity that conception of the unconscious and its contents which regards it as derived exclusively from objective experience in the single individual life must go by the board here then was the alternative which from the historical standpoint we must regard as crucial either jung's conception of the collective unconscious must be admitted and with it the whole inner world of the subject wherein the inner images or archetypes are granted an equal determining power with the objects of the outer world or the one-sided empirical system must be maintained with its somewhat arbitrary postulates 
and the whole disturbing vision of the collective unconscious be rejected as a fantastic impossibility jung's great work psychology of the unconscious was the final statement of his separation from an advance beyond the freudian standpoint and freud's reaction to this work made it clear that he too recognized an inseparable opposition for in this work jung did not confine himself to a reduction of the miller fantasies to their instinctive roots he also identified the personal themes with universal religious and mythological conceptions thus raising them to a level of general importance but in so doing he also proved the necessity of the synthetic standpoint in analytical psychology a demonstration that bore unavoidable implications unfavorable to the freudian position that the divergence between freud and jung must sooner or later have become acute will i think be clear when we remember that between the two men there existed not only the difference of race but also a radical difference of type an extrovert by his very nature is bound to produce a psychology differing essentially from that of the introvert for freud the aims of empirical science with its centripetal bias towards a minute and detailed analysis of observable facts were absolute whereas for jung a purely objective psychology was not enough in that it entirely omitted the undeniable reality and power of the idea this is not the place to enter into a discussion of the relative values of the extroverted empiricistic and the introverted abstracting attitudes in human thought the struggle of these two elements as jung shows in the present work is synonymous with the history of human culture they are both essential as mutual correctives and it is only when either tendency becomes a one-sided habitual attitude that common sense steps in and makes its inscrutable judgment in science these two general tendencies appear as the twin capacities of empirical observation of facts and of intellectual abstraction from the facts observed of generally valid principles but only in the man of genius do we find both capacities fully and symmetrically developed in my view criticism of freud's achievement should be based not upon the fact that he failed to perceive the possibility of a general application of his ideas this he apprehended only too clearly but upon his inability to frame concepts of general validity he attempted to make the infinitely complex phenomena of the psyche harmonize with theories intuitively derived from clinical material but he was unable to enlarge or reconstruct his theoretical system to embrace the wider aspects of human experience and culture the normal was considered in terms of the pathological a gradual but very definite movement of intelligent opinion away from the freudian standpoint at the present time is in my view a common-sense reaction to the damaging depreciation of essential human values in this reductive valuation of the psyche for the reductive standpoint fails to see that every complex is janus faced and that the energy invested in it is never purely regressive but is rather a reculaire pur mieux sauté the extraordinary vitality of the infantile complex would be quite inexplicable on the supposition that it was a wholly regressive tendency but it demands a synthetic standpoint to perceive that every dawning possibility in life is heralded by the image of the child the symbol of eternal youth and that the infantile complex with its simplicity and trust in life is also the growing point of the developing personality every child perceives what the investigator may fail to see that a living man in his most eager and productive moments exhibit certain essential characters of childhood creative activity demands the power and complexity of the man as well as the simple attitude of the child but jung himself deals so fully and so much more ably with the limitations of the purely reductive standpoint that i need not elaborate this aspect of the subject here it has been argued that psychoanalysis does not claim to be more than a therapeutic technique and a method of research and that it is irrelevant for the psychologist to concern himself with the question of human development or with the inevitable ancillary problems of morality religion and human relationship in this very argument the essential limitations of this standpoint stand self-confessed 
since a psychology that excludes the most vital problems of life from its fear of responsibility requires no further criticism it is already moribund actually of course a psychological nihilism which broke down every individual form into its elements and put nothing in its place could not conceivably have anything but disastrous therapeutic results but freud does put something positive and definite in its place for there always remains the transference to the analyst which in the case of the positive transference involves a gradual assimilation by the patient to the analyst's general attitude to life and in the alternative case a very definite rejection of the man and all his ways this unconscious identification with the analyst is quite outside the sphere of the latter's control it is inherent in the analytical relationship but for the analyst to wash his hands of this unconscious effect with its far-reaching moral influence upon the patient's subsequent development is as irresponsible as though a surgeon were to shut his eyes to the inevitable dangers of hemorrhage and sepsis the question of moral responsibility therefore is inherent in analytical practice and since this is so we have every right to demand of a practical psychological system that it shall attempt to discover the fundamental laws of human development and as far as possible to formulate them we said at the beginning that freud was an empirical investigator and that this was both his strength and his limitation it is his strength because it required the empirical attitude to discover and establish the psychoanalytic technique and it is his limitation because the general attitude to life which is governed solely by objective facts and considerations is quite incapable of judging man as a subject if as freud points out in totem and taboo human morality can be traced back to the first primeval act of parricide a derivative of some remote arboreal conflict between the parents authority and the son's lust for his father's wives then morality can exist only as a constituent of herd psychology and the individual moral law is as much a delusion as is free will to a determinist it is obvious that a purely objective standpoint must similarly interpret all the realities of the inner world as mere derivatives or reflex of the objective facts man is wholly determined therefore by things outside himself he is nothing but a singarate a mere mechanism that gets out of order and by an appropriate use of the correct method can be put right again this standpoint is well illustrated by the freudian interpretation of dreams which always explains the dream figures as carefully disguised images of real people or concrete things quite ignoring the possibility that such things may also be symbols of subjective realities existing in their own right the freudian standpoint then in attempting to explain all the phenomena of human psychology in terms of objective facts remains one-sided and the extent of its limitations may conceivably be measured by the intolerance with which it discusses or ignores every standpoint that ventures beyond its circumscribed terrain since there have always been large numbers of men for whom the objects and experiences of the psychic life bear a more immediate sense of reality than the world of objective facts it is clear that a purely objective account of the psychological processes could not win any considerable support beyond the specialized limit of its own peculiar faculty but however much the historical eye may regard the wider subjective valuation and synthetic method of Jung as the inevitable response of psychology to essential human demands the greatest honor must none the less be given to Jung, for not only was he the first psychologist to perceive these demands but he also voiced them in principles whose universality could embrace the heights and the depths of the psyche and comprehend its manifold diversity in establishing the two typical mechanisms of introversion and extroversion together with the main categories of human types based upon his fundamental antithesis jung has demonstrated the impossibility of every attempt to formulate a generally valid theory of human psychology which ignores these typical differences for a theory whose validity is incontestable for the psyche from which it originated proves itself worthless and even misleading for an individual of another type from considerations such as these 
we must confess our inability to devise any rigid or dogmatic formula which can be authoritatively promulgated as a general system of psychological therapy. A physician once justly complained to Jung that he had made analysis so difficult. It is certainly true that the pronouncements of Freud relieve the analyst of a very considerable onus. He is not required to ask himself what is the individual way of this particular subject. He has merely to reduce his patient's psychological material to its elementary constituents according to prescribed orthodox formulations, and if the patient is not satisfied, he either proves himself psychologically inadequate to receive the truth, or so immersed in his morbid state that the analytical light serves only to reveal its impenetrable obscurities. In his subtitle to this book, Jung has called it The Psychology of Individuation, and therewith he affirms the essential principle of his philosophy. For to Jung, the psyche is a world which contains all the elements of the greater world, with the same destructive and constructive forces, a pluralistic universe in which the individual either fulfills or neglects his essential role of creator. The individuality is the central coordinating principle of this realm, analogous to the principle of royalty in the nation, and in so far as this coordinating will achieves an effective command of the diverse and conflicting elements which constantly tend to disrupt his kingdom, we are justified in speaking of a differentiated individual. The individuality is universally present, but as a rule it exists mainly in the unconscious, often finding expression in dreams and fantasies, in some royal or princely figure. It is a principle, therefore, which has to be created out of the unconscious by accepting individuation as a deliberate and conscious aim. It may be asked what has individuation got to do with the treatment of nervous disorders. This question springs from the assumption that there is no fundamental relation between the realities of the psychic life and the symptomatic conditions of the body, and yet the lives of religious founders, one and all, bear witness to the fact that the healing of the body is not unconnected with the inner life. If differentiation and coordination of function are admitted as the vital principles of organic life, it is difficult to see how one can regard psychic or functional disorders as anything else than a statement of the relative suppression of these principles in the individual in question. The psyche, therefore, has to be considered as a totality and not as an ill-assorted collection of instincts and faculties. For if man is not a mere passive mechanism to be shaped to the pattern of a chosen formula, he stands before us as a self-creating subject whose individual way may be directly opposed to the analyst's most cherished theories. It has often been leveled against Jung that his is a pedagogic system, that he tries to teach people how they should live, how they should settle their problems, instead of merely indicating the unconscious state of affairs and leaving them to find their way out. We are told that the physician should confine himself to a purely medical aspect of the case, and that to voice any criticism which might suggest a definite moral or religious standpoint is to encroach upon other domains for which he has no qualifications. This point of view is very common and has a certain justification, supported as it is by the whole traditional constitution of society. But in spite of an argument apparently so overwhelming, the individual psyche persistently overrides the social categories, and notwithstanding every rational attempt to regard it in terms of mechanisms and functions, its claim to be considered as a whole has never once abated. Since this claim appears to have a socially subversive tendency, and occasions very real fear in a great many minds, it might be well to examine its character. If we assume, and without this assumption no system of psychotherapy has any reasonable basis, that a neurosis is an act of adaptation that has failed, we are faced in an individual case with the question, what is the nature of the reality to which this individual has failed to adapt? The materialist would fain have us believe that the only reality demanding psychic adaptation is represented by the sheer concrete facts of the physical environment. But if concrete facts were the only reality, there would be no spiritual problem, and consequently no neurotics. 
the minimal adjustment to objective conditions demanded by social life could present no insuperable difficulty to any one but an imbecile unless there were another reality of a very different nature always competing with the concrete world for prior claim upon our energy the other psychic or spiritual reality which comprises the inner life of the subject is as constantly demanding new forms and expressions of its energy as is the world of external objects even though it does not make the same compelling demand upon our attention the fantastic hallucinations of the delirium tremens patient or the paranoic are equally strong evidence for the reality of these inner claims as are the ecstatic experiences of the religious mystic only in the former case they are seen from the reverse side for this reality the evidence is necessarily subjective the snakes and frogs seen by the patient in his delirium however delusional to an objective valuation possess an undisputable reality to the man himself clearly therefore there are two quite different kinds of reality both of which while pressing their respective claims upon our capacity for adaptation are nevertheless mutually dependent in the case that neglect or disregard of either eventually destroys the validity of both again thousands of lives are fruitlessly spent in a neurotic attempt to escape an overpowering parental influence just as there are innumerable lives seeking a release from the unconscious tyranny of collective authority the need of the growing child to differentiate himself as an individual from the magical parental influence is essentially the same as the individuating impulse to distinguish oneself as a single separate person from the collective en masse but the developing child who seeks to adventure beyond the magic circle of the family encounters not only the authority and conservatism of the older generation but also the far more dangerous inertia and infantilism of his own psychology in either case it is essentially the same conflict between the individual and the collective elements whether within or without and what could prevail against the authority without or the inertia within but an inner necessity or law whose incontestable superiority can stand firm against every attack the genuine rebel in his resistance against the law can win our sympathy in spite of ourselves notwithstanding every rational resistance the inner superiority enforces our recognition of its power the genuine neurotic as opposed to the social deserter is typically a man who cannot reconcile the claims of traditional forms and values with those of the obscure but unbending law within for him the inner and outer claims are contradictory and mutually exclusive in answer to the persistent demands of the social tax collector he can only guarantee the overdue payments to caesar when caesar shall first have recognized the paramount claims of god for such a man to be delivered over once again to the orthodox representatives of traditional values whatever the formula may be is merely to hand him over to his creditors before he can do justice to traditional forms or fulfil his social task he must first submit himself unconditionally to the fundamental law of his own being this is his stronghold this his root in an enduring reality and with this security he can go out into the world not only to settle the old imperial demands but also perchance to reanimate the forms that are with the vision of what he is to be to the critic then who charges jung with pedagogic interference we would reply jung does not teach a man how he shall act or think or live but he gives him a technique by which he can comprehend and finally submit to the laws of his own nature the basic principles of human development are not vested in any faculty they have no academic formula for they embrace every function of human activity they are commensurate with life it is not surprising therefore that it is from just those quarters where authority reigns and where truth is already congealed into a dogma that this particular criticism usually springs it is easier to teach and practice a formula than to try to interpret the meaning of life but a rational formula is doomed from the outset because it tends to seduce men to turn away from the enigma of life by offering them a formula in its stead thus it opposes life and its inherent destructiveness determines its own fate 
No psychological formula can ever explain life. At its best, it can only present the living process in a thinkable form to our reason. As soon as it claims to have explained a living process, its effect is destructive, since it interposes an authoritative, ready-made explanation between the individual and the real problems life presents, thus apparently relieving him of the need to seek his own individual solution. This is what Jung describes as negative, in contrast to positive or creative thinking. For what we call character is nothing but the measure of sincerity with which an individual creates a positive adaptation to the essential problems of life. A formula is an artifact, a rigid and arbitrary frame into which the plastic and changing forms of life are impressed. The resistance of the unconscious to this imposition is perceptible in the impassioned dogmatism of the man who has accepted a formula as an explanation of life. A principle, on the other hand, acquires its validity not from the authority of the man who lays it down, but from life itself, whose manifold processes it correlates, and brings into abstract form. Formulae live and die like their authors, one might almost say with their authors, whereas the validity of an abstract principle is just as durable as the processes it embraces and comprehends. It needs neither authority nor defense. It bears within it its own prerogative. Jung's analytical interpretations are admittedly based upon the principles established in the present work, but practical application of them, i.e. their translation again into life, rests wholly with the individual subject. The individuality is the alpha and omega of Jung's system, not, however, as an expression of personal power as the egoist would like to interpret it, but essentially as a function of the whole. This in itself sufficiently disposes of the pedagogic critics, for a system which aims at individual autonomy cannot justly be described as pedagogic. Naturally, there could be no interpretation at all without a standpoint. In practice, therefore, the most that we can humanly demand is that the standpoint of the analyst should constantly be oriented towards the individual way or greatest ought of the subject. It is, of course, true that however generally an analyst may strive to realize the same, his interpretation will, to a large extent, be subjectively conditioned. This is psychologically unavoidable, but the very sincerity with which he strives to interpret the fundamental needs of his patient from the material at his disposal must surely make for individual autonomy, whereas the opposite standpoint that would reduce psychic experience into terms of arbitrary mechanisms must inevitably tend to standardize mankind, because in this case the main criterion of judgment is the relative measure of conformity with the orthodox formula. From the point of view of social economy, there can surely be no two opinions that a psychological technique whose aim it is to create individuals is of greater value to society than a system which aims at conformity. For an individual who is at one with himself seeks a creative collective expression from inner necessity, while the dragooned neurotic is of as little service to society as an unwilling conscript. But how, it may be asked, can a physician learn to forego the customary collectivized view of his fellow man and train himself to an unprejudiced view of his patient's individuality, unobscured by his own unconscious projections? It will, I think, be clear that before a physician can fully recognize and respect the individuality of his patient, he must first have given allegiance to this principle in himself. This does not mean to say that only a differentiated individual is fitted to practice analysis, such a condition would disqualify every candidate, but it does demand that the analyst shall himself have been analyzed and shall have made a sincere attempt to deal with his own life problems before undertaking to deal with those of his patients. The aims of the individuality can never be fully apprehended by exclusive reference to the biological or instinctive life of the subject. In fact, just as little can they be explained in terms of instinct as a work of art in terms of energy. One might attempt to formulate the chief aim of the individuality as the effort to create out of oneself the most significant product of which one is capable. On the biological plane, this is clearly the child, but on the psychic level, 
this must be interpreted more broadly as something that bears for the individual in the fullest sense of the term a significance at least analogous to that of the child for the greatest individual value is always pregnant with value for mankind hence the budding personality with its potentialities for good or ill is frequently represented in dreams in the form of a child the whole symbolism of rebirth is quite unintelligible from a purely biological standpoint hence a system that is blinded by its preoccupation with purely instinctive interpretations presents a definite obstruction to the whole transforming or spiritualizing tendency of the libido the obvious prospective significance of the rebirth symbolism in dreams is to my mind so apparent that one is tempted to accuse the reductive school of willful blindness but this would of course be quite absurd and one has to remind oneself that the dream like the lily of the field is a natural product unassisted by human intention and that it is quite as rational to regard the lily as a fortunate accidental grouping of basic organic elements as to conceive it as a symbol of purity the standpoint therefore eventually decides the interpretation as it also decides the manner in which the interpretation is employed i have now revealed the very practical motive which prompted me to bring this whole question of the underlying opposition of standpoint into the foreground of discussion this attempt although foredoomed to excite controversy will i hope in spite of the obvious inadequacy of such a brief outline help to clarify the situation in a way that a more cautious and non-committal statement would fail to do the great value of the present work lies in the fact that it is a mature and conscious survey of the psychological field viewed by a mind of unique range and development whose astonishing wealth of psychological experience illumines the whole work the range of jung's thought has developed with his experience the psychology of the unconscious was the shaft of the tree this work is its ample spread for practical psychologists it must assuredly be regarded as the foundation of the science for in no other work do we find basic psychological principles whose validity is commensurate with the undeniable facts of man's historic development and the realities of individual experience the actual translation of the work was a task of such difficulty that i often despaired of giving the book an adequate rendering into english fortunately i had exceptional opportunities of assistance from the author himself for whose unstinted patience and generosity in listening to my translation week by week and offering invaluable suggestions i cannot be too grateful for most valued assistance in the various preparatory stages of the work i wish to tender my warmest acknowledgments to my wife to mrs lillian a clare to mr john m thorburn of cardiff university and finally to mr w swans stallybrass of messrs keegan paul and company limited my publishers for whose friendly offices and indefatigable care in the matter of punctuation and typography throughout the book i offer my very cordial appreciation with regard to the use of italics in this book i wish to explain that with the exception of titles of books italics have been reserved to denote stress had all the numerous foreign words occurring in the text been printed in italic type in accordance with english typographical convention the special value of this type from the point of view of the author's meaning would have been lost our only other alternative was to use quotation marks but in many places foreign words occur so frequently that this would have served merely to blur the page and confuse the eye there are a few exceptions to the above rule the reasons for which will be obvious double quotation marks are used for actual quotations single marks for indicating philosophical terms used in special senses façons de parler etc for the fact that with the exception of the quotations from kant i have nowhere availed myself of existing english translations either of the oriental or the european authors quoted in the text i must plead my residence in zurich where the various works were inaccessible h g baines twenty four camden hill square london w eight end of translator's preface Section 1 of Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Hilton Godwin Baines. 1882-1943. Forward. This book is the fruit of nearly twenty years' work in the domain of practical psychology. It is a gradual intellectual structure, equally compounded by numberless impressions and experiences in the practice of psychiatry and nervous maladies, and of intercourse with men of all social levels. It is a product, therefore, of my personal dealings with friend and with foe. And finally, it has a further source in the criticism of my own psychological particularity. I do not propose to burden the reader with casuistry. It is, however, incumbent upon me to link up the ideas derived from experience, both historically and terminologically, with already existing knowledge. I have done this not so much from a sense of historical justice as from a desire to bring the experiences of the medical specialists out of narrow professional limits into more general relations, relations which will enable the educated lay mind to make use of the experiences of a specialized terrain. I would never have ventured to attempt this expansion, which might well be misunderstood as an encroachment upon other spheres, were I not convinced that the psychological points of view presented in this book are of wide significance and application and are therefore better treated in a general connection than left in the form of a specialized scientific hypothesis. With this aim in view, I have confined myself to a discussion of the ideas of a few workers in the field of the problem under review, and have omitted to mention all that has already been said concerning our problem in general. Quite apart from the fact that to catalogue such a collection of correlated material and views with even bare adequacy would far exceed my powers. The inventory, when completed, would make no sort of fundamental contribution to the discussion and development of the problem. Without regret, therefore, I have omitted much that I have collected in the course of years, confining myself as far as possible to the main questions. A most valuable document that afforded me great help has also been sacrificed in this renunciation. This is a bulky correspondence which I exchanged with my friend, Dr. H. Mitt Evals, concerning the question of types. I owe a great deal to this interchange of ideas, and much of it, though of course in an altered and greatly revised form, has gone into my book. This correspondence belongs essentially to the stage of preparation, and its inclusion would create more confusion than clarity. But I owe it to the labors of my friend to express many thanks to him here. C. G. Jung, Kuznach, Zurich Spring 1920. End of section 1. Section 2 of Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines. Section 2. Introduction. Quote, Plato and Aristotle. These are not merely two systems. They are also types of two distinct human natures, which from immemorial time, under every sort of cloak, stand more or less inimicably opposed. But preeminently the whole medieval period was riven by this conflict, persisting even to the present day. Moreover, this battle is the most essential content of the history of the Christian Church. Though under different names, always and essentially it is of Plato and Aristotle that we speak. Enthusiastic, mystical, Platonic natures reveal Christian ideas and their corresponding symbols from the bottomless depths of their souls. Practical, ordering, Aristotelian natures build up from these ideas and symbols a solid system, a dogma, and a cult. The Church eventually embraces both natures, one of them sheltering among the clergy, while the other finds refuge in monasticism yet both incessantly at feud. End quote. H. Heine, Deutschland, Chapter 1. In my practical medical work with nervous patients, I have long been struck by the fact that among the many individual differences in human psychology, there exist also typical distinctions. Two types essentially became clear to me, which I have termed the introversion and the extroversion types. When we reflect upon human history, 
we see how the destinies of one individual are conditioned more by the objects of his interest, while in another they are conditioned more by his inner self, by his subject. Since, therefore, we all swerve rather towards one side than the other, we are naturally disposed to understand everything in the sense of our own type. I mention this circumstance at this point to prevent possible subsequent misunderstandings. As may well be understood, this basic condition considerably aggravates the difficulty of a general description of the types. I must presume a considerable benevolence on the part of the reader, if I may hope to be rightly understood. It would be relatively simple if every reader himself knew to which category he belonged. But it is often a difficult matter to discover to which type an individual belongs, especially when one's self is in question. Judgment in relation to one's own personality is indeed always extraordinarily clouded. This subjective clouding of judgment is, therefore, a frequent if not constant factor, for in every pronounced type there exists a special tendency towards compensation for the one-sidedness of his type, a tendency which is biologically expedient since it is a constant effort to maintain psychic equilibrium. Through compensation there arise secondary characters, or types, which present a picture that is extraordinarily hard to decipher, so difficult indeed that one is even inclined to deny the existence of types in general and to believe only in individual differences. I must emphasize this difficulty in order to justify a certain peculiarity in my later presentation, for it might seem as though a simpler way would be to describe two concrete cases and to lay their dissections one beside the other. But every individual possesses both mechanisms, extroversion as well as introversion, and only the relative predominance of the one or the other determines the type. Hence, in order to bring out the necessary relief in the picture, one would have to retouch it rather vigorously, which would certainly amount to a more or less pious fraud. Moreover, the psychological reaction of a human being is such a complicated matter that my descriptive ability would indeed hardly suffice to give an absolutely correct picture of it. From sheer necessity, therefore, I must confine myself to a presentation of principles which I have abstracted from an abundance of observed facts. In this there is no question of deductio a priori, as it might well appear. It is rather a deductive presentation of empirically gained understanding. It is my hope that this insight may prove a clarifying contribution to a dilemma which, not in analytical psychology alone, but also in other provinces of science, and especially in the personal relations of human beings one to another, has led and still continues to lead to misunderstanding and division. For it explains how the existence of two distinct types is actually a fact that has long been known, a fact that in one form or another has dawned upon the observer of human nature or shed light upon the brooding reflection of the thinker, presenting itself, for example, to Goethe's intuition as the embracing principle of systola and diastola, the names and forms in which the mechanism of introversion and extroversion has been conceived are extremely diverse, and are, as a rule, adapted only to the standpoint of the individual observer. Notwithstanding the diversity of the formulations, the common basis or fundamental idea shines constantly through, namely, in the one case an outward movement of interest toward the object, and the other a movement of interest away from the object towards the subject and his own psychological processes. In the first case, the object works like a magnet upon the tendencies of the subject. It is, therefore, an attraction that to a large extent determines the subject. It even alienates him from himself. His qualities may become so transformed in the sense of assimilation to the object that one could imagine the object to possess an extreme and even decisive significance for the subject. It might almost seem as though it were an absolute determination, a special purpose of life or fate that he should abandon himself wholly to the object. But in the latter case, the subject is and remains the center of every interest. It looks, one might say, as though all the life energy were ultimately seeking the subject, thus offering a constant hindrance to any overpowering influence on the part of the object. It is as though energy were flowing away from the object, as if the subject were a magnet which would draw the object to itself. It is not easy to characterize this contrasting relationship to the object in a way that is lucid and intelligible. There is, in fact, a great danger of reaching quite paradoxical formulations, which would create more confusion than clarity. Quite generally, one could describe the introverted standpoint as one that under all circumstances sets the self and the subjective psychological process above the object and the objective process, or at any rate 
holds its ground against the object. This attitude, therefore, gives the subject a higher value than the object. As a result, the object always possesses a lower value. It has secondary importance. Occasionally, it even represents merely an outward objective token of a subjective content, the embodiment of an idea, in other words, in which, however, the idea is the essential factor, or it is the object of a feeling, where, however, the feeling experience is the chief thing, and not the object in its own individuality. The extroverted standpoint, on the contrary, sets the subject below the object, whereby the object receives the predominant value. The subject always has secondary importance. The subjective process appears at times merely as a disturbing or superfluous accessory to objective events. It is plain that the psychology resulting from these antagonistic standpoints must be distinguished as two totally different orientations. The one sees everything from the angle of his conception, the other from the viewpoint of the objective occurrence. These opposite attitudes are merely opposite mechanisms, a diastolic going out and seizing of the object, and a systolic concentration and release of energy from the object seized. Every human being possesses both mechanisms as an expression of his natural life rhythm, that rhythm which Goethe, surely not by chance, characterized with the physiological concepts of cardiac activity. A rhythmic alternation of both forms of psychic activity may correspond with the normal course of life, but the complicated external conditions under which we live, as well as the presumably even more complex conditions of our individual psychic disposition, seldom permit a completely undisturbed flow of our psychic activity. Outer circumstances and inner disposition frequently favor the one mechanism and restrict or hinder the other, whereby a predominance of one mechanism naturally arises. If this condition becomes in any way chronic, a type is produced, namely an habitual attitude in which the one mechanism permanently dominates. Not, of course, that the other can ever be completely suppressed, inasmuch as it is also an integral factor in psychic activity. Hence, there can never occur a pure type in the sense that he is entirely possessed of one mechanism with a complete atrophy of the other. A typical attitude always signifies the merely relative predominance of one mechanism. With the substantiation of introversion and extroversion, an opportunity at once offered itself for the differentiation of two extensive groups of psychological individuals. But this grouping is of such a superficial and inclusive nature that it permits no more than a rather general discrimination. A more exact investigation of those individual psychologies which fall into either group at once yields great differences between individuals who nonetheless belong to the same group. If, therefore, we wish to determine wherein lie the differences of individuals belonging to a definite group, we must make a further step. My experience has taught me that individuals can quite generally be differentiated, not only by the universal difference of extra and introversion, but also according to individual basic psychological functions. For in the same measure as outer circumstances and inner disposition, respectively, promote a predominance of extroversion or introversion, they also favor the predominance of one definite basic function in the individual. As basic functions, that is, functions which are both genuinely as well as essentially differentiated from other functions, there exist thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuition. If one of these functions habitually prevails, a corresponding type results. I therefore discriminate thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuitive types. Every one of these types can moreover be introverted or extroverted, according to his relation to the object in the way described above. In two former communications concerning psychological types, I did not carry out the distinction outlined above, but identified the thinking type with the introvert and the feeling type with the extrovert. A deeper elaboration of the problem proved this combination to be untenable. To avoid misunderstandings, I would, therefore, ask the reader to bear in mind the distinction here developed. In order to ensure the clarity which is essential in such complicated things, I have devoted the last chapter of this book to the definitions of my psychological conceptions. End of section 2Section 3 of Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines. Section 3. 
Chapter 1, The Problem of Types in the History of Classical and Medieval Thought. Part 1, Psychology in the Classical Age, the Gnostics, Tertullian, and Origen. So long as the historical world has existed, there has always been psychology. Objective psychology, however, is of only recent growth. We might affirm of the science of former times that the lack of objective psychology corresponds with the proportionate yield of the subjective element. Hence, the works of the ancients are full of psychology, but only little of it can be described as objective psychology. This may be conditioned in no small measure by the peculiarity of human relationship in classic and medieval times. The ancients had, if one may so express it, an almost exclusively biological appreciation of their fellow men. This is everywhere apparent in the habits of life and legal conditions of antiquity. Insofar as a judgment of value found any general expression, the medieval world had a metaphysical valuation of its fellow men. This had its source in the idea of the imperishable value of the human soul. This metaphysical valuation, which may be regarded as a compensation to the standpoint of antiquity, is just as unfavorable as the biological valuation, so far as that personal appraisement is concerned, which can alone be the groundwork of an objective psychology. There are indeed not a few who hold that a psychology can be written ex cathedra. Nowadays, however, most of us are convinced that an objective psychology must, above all, be grounded upon observation and experience. This foundation would be ideal, if only it were possible. But the ideal and the purpose of science do not consist in giving the most exact possible description of facts. Science cannot yet compete with kinematographic and phonographic records. It can fulfill its aim and purpose only in the establishment of law, which is merely an abbreviated expression for manifold and yet correlated processes. This purpose transcends the purely experimental by means of the concept which, in spite of general and proved validity, will always be a product of the subjective psychological constellation of the investigator. In the making of scientific theory and concept, much that is personal and incidental is involved. There is also a psychological personal equation, not merely a psychophysical. We can see colors, but not wavelengths. This well-known fact must nowhere be more seriously held in view than in psychology. The operation of the personal equation has already begun in the act of observation. One sees what one can best see from oneself. Thus, first and foremost, one sees the mote in one's brother's eye. No doubt the mote is there, but the beam sits in one's own and may somewhat hinder the act of seeing. I misdoubt the principle of pure observation in so-called objective psychology unless one confines oneself to the eyepieces of the chronoscope or the ergograph, and such like psychological apparatus. With such methods, one also ensures oneself against too great a yield of experimental psychological facts. But the personal psychological equation becomes even more important in the presentation or the communication of observations, to say nothing of the interpretation and abstraction of experimental material. Nowhere, as in psychology, is the basic requirement so indispensable that the observer and investigator should be adequate to his object in the sense that he should be able to see not the subject only, but also the object. The demand that he should see only objectively is quite out of the question, for it is impossible. We may well be satisfied if we do not see too subjectively. That the subjective observation and interpretation agrees with the objective facts of the psychological object is evidence for the interpretation only in so far as the latter makes no pretense to be universal, but intends to be valid only for that field of the object that is under consideration. To this extent, it is just the beam in one's own eye that enables one to detect the mote in the brother's eye. The beam in one's own eye, in this case, does not prove, as already said, that the brother has no mote in his, but the impairment of vision might easily give rise to a general theory that all motes are beams. The recognition and taking to heart of the subjective limitation of knowledge in general, and of psychological knowledge in particular, is a basic condition for the scientific and accurate estimation of a psyche differing from that of the observing subject. This condition is fulfilled only when the observer is adequately informed concerning the compass and nature of his own personality. He can, however, be sufficiently informed only when he has, in great measure, freed himself from the compromising influence of collective opinion and feeling, and has thereby reached a clear conception of his own individuality. The further we go back into history, the more we see personality disappearing beneath the wrappings of collectivity. And if we go right down to primitive psychology, we find absolutely no trace of the idea of the individual. In place of individuality, we find only collective relationship or participation mystique. 
but the collective attitude prevents the understanding and estimation of a psychology which differs from that of the subject, because the mind that is collectively orientated is quite incapable of thinking and feeling in any other way than by projection. What we understand by the concept individual is a relatively recent acquisition in the history of the human mind and human culture. It is no wonder, therefore, that the earlier all-powerful collective attitude almost entirely prevented an objective psychological estimation of individual differences and forbade any general scientific objectification of individual psychological processes. It was owing to this very lack of psychological thinking that knowledge became psychologized, that is, crowded with projected psychology. Striking instances of this are to be seen in the first attempts at philosophical explanation of the universe. The development of individuality, with the resulting psychological differentiation of man, goes hand in hand with a depsychologizing of objective science. These reflections may appear why the springs of objective psychology have such a niggardly flow in the material handed down to us from antiquity. The description of the four temperaments gathered from antiquity is hardly a psychological typification, since the temperaments are scarcely more than psychophysiological complexions. But this lack of information does not mean that we possess no trace in classical literature of the reality of the psychological antithesis in question. Thus, Gnostic philosophy established three types, corresponding perhaps with the three basic psychological functions, thinking, feeling, and sensation. The pneumatici might correspond with thinking, the psychici with feeling, and the hylici with sensation. The inferior estimation of the psychici accorded with the spirit of the gnosis, which, in contrast with Christianity, insisted upon the value of knowledge. But the Christian principle of love and faith did not favor knowledge. The pneumaticist would accordingly suffer a decline in value within the Christian sphere, insofar as he distinguished himself merely by the possession of the gnosis, that is, knowledge. Differences in type should also be remembered when we are considering the long and somewhat dangerous fight which, from the earliest beginnings, the Church conducted against the Gnosticism. In the practical tendency that undoubtedly prevailed in early Christianity, the intellectual, when in obedience to his fighting instinct, he did not lose himself in apologetic polemics, scarcely came into his own. The regula fide was too narrow and permitted no independent movement. Moreover, it was poor in positive intellectual content. It contained a few ideas which, although of enormous practical value, were a definite obstacle to thought. The intellectual was much more hardly hit by the sacrificium intellectus than the man of feeling. Hence, it is easy to understand that the vastly superior intellectual content of the gnosis, which, in the light of our present intellectual development, has not only lost, but has indeed considerably gained in value, must have made the greatest possible appeal to the intellectual within the church. For him it was in very sooth the enticement of the world. Desceticism, in particular, caused grave trouble to the church, with its contention that Christ possessed only an apparent body, and that his whole earthly existence and passion had been merely a semblance. In this contention, the purely intellectual was given too prominent a part at the expense of human feeling. Perhaps the battle with the Gnosis is most clearly presented to us in two figures who were extremely influential, not only as fathers of the church, but also as personalities. These are Tertullian, and Origen, who lived about the end of the second century. Schultz says of them, quote, One organism is able to take in nourishment well nigh omnivorously and to assimilate it to its own nature. Another, with equal persistence, rejects it again with every appearance of passionate refusal. Thus, essentially opposed, Origen identified himself with one side, Tertullian with the other. Their reaction to the gnosis is not only characteristic of the two personalities and their philosophy of life, it is also fundamentally significant of the position of the Gnosis in the mental life and religious tendencies of that time. End quote. Tertullian was born in Carthage somewhere about 160 A.D. He was a pagan and yielded himself to the lascivious life of his city until about his 35th year, when he became a Christian. He was the author of numerous writings wherein his character, which is our special interest, unmistakably shows itself. Clear and distinct are his unexampled, noble-hearted zeal, his fire, his passionate temperament, and the profound inwardness of his religious understanding. He is fanatical, ingeniously one-sided for the sake of an accepted truth, impatient, an incomparable fighting spirit, a merciless opponent, who sees victory only in the total annihilation of his adversary, and his speech is like a flashing steel, wielded with inhuman mastery. 
He is the creator of the Church Latin, which lasted for more than a thousand years. He it was who coined the terminology of the early Church. Quote, Had he seized upon a point of view, then he must follow it through to its every conclusion, as though lashed by legions from hell. Even when Wright had long since ceased to be on his side, and all reasonable order lay mutilated before him. End quote. The passion of his thinking was so inexorable that again and again he alienated himself from the very thing for which he would have given his heart's blood. Accordingly, his ethical code is bitter in its severity. Martyrdom he commanded to be sought and not shunned. He permitted no second marriage and required the permanent veiling of persons of the female sex. The gnosis, which in reality is a passion for thought and cognition, he attacked with unrelenting fanaticism, including both philosophy and science, which are so closely linked up with it. To him is ascribed the sublime confession, credo qua absurdum est, I believe because it is against reason. This, however, does not altogether accord with historical fact. He merely said, quote, et mortus est de filius, prorosis credibile est, qua ineptum est, et sepultus resurrexis certum est qua impossible est, close quote. That is, and the Son of God died. This is therefore credible just because it is absurd, and he rose again from the tomb. This is certain because it is impossible. By virtue of the acuteness of his mind, he saw through the poverty of philosophic and of Gnostic learning and contemptuously rejected it. He invoked against it the testimony of his own inner world, his own inner realities, which were one with his faith. In the shaping and development of these realities, he became the creator of those abstract conceptions which still underlie the Catholic system of today. The irrational inner reality had, for him, an essentially dynamic nature. It was his principle, his consolidated position in face of the world and the collectively valid or rational science and philosophy. I translate his own words. Quote, I summon new witnesses, or rather a witness more known than any written monument, more debated than any system of life, more published abroad than any promulgation, greater than the whole of man, yea, that which constitutes the whole man. Approach then, O my soul, shouldst thou be something divine and eternal, as many philosophers believe, the less wilt thou lie. Or not wholly divine, because mortal, as forsooth Epicurus alone contends, then so much the less canst thou lie, whether thou comest from heaven, or art born of earth, whether compounded of numbers or atoms, whether thou hast thy beginning with the body, or art later joined thereto, what matter indeed whence thou springest, or how thou makest man what he is, namely a reasonable being, capable of perception and knowledge. But I call thee not, O soul, as proclaiming wisdom, trained in the schools, conversant with libraries, fed and nourished in the academies and pillared hulls of Attica. No, I would speak with thee, O soul, as wondrous simple and uneducated, awkward and inexperienced, such as thou art for those who have nothing else but thee, even just as thou comest from the alleys, from the street corners, and from the workshops. It is just thy ignorance I need. End quote. The self-mutilation achieved by Tertullian in the Sacrificium Intellectus led him to the unreserved recognition of the irrational inner reality, the real ground of his faith. That necessity of the religious process which he sensed in himself he seized in the incomparable formula anima naturalititer Christiana, that is, the soul is naturally Christian. With the sacrificium intellectus, philosophy and science, hence the gnosis also, had no more meaning for him. In the further course of his life, the qualities I have depicted stood out in bolder relief. While the church was driven to compromise more and more with the masses, he revolted against it and became a follower of that Phrygian prophet Montanus, an ecstatic who represented the principle of absolute denial of the world and complete spiritualization. In violent pamphlets, he now began to assail the policy of Pope Calixtus I, and thus, together with Montanism, felt more or less extra ecclesium, according to a statement of St. Augustine. He must later even have rejected Montanism and founded a sect of his own. Tertullian is a classical representative of the introverted thinking type. His very considerable and keenly developed intellect is flanked by unmistakable sensuality. That psychological process of development, which we term the Christian, led him to the sacrifice, the amputation, of the most valuable function, a mythical idea which is also contained in the great and exemplary symbol of the sacrifice of the Son of God. His most valuable organ was the intellect, 
including that clear discernment of which it was the instrument. Through the sacrificium intellectus, the way of purely intellectual development was forbidden him. It forced him to recognize the irrational dynamis of his soul as the foundation of his being. The intellectuality of the gnosis, its specifically rational coinage of the dynamic phenomenon of the soul, must necessarily have been odious to him, for that was just the way he had to forsake in order to recognize the principle of feeling. In Origen, we may recognize the absolute opposite of Tertullian. Origen was born in Alexandria about 185 AD. His father was a Christian martyr. He himself grew up in that quite unique mental atmosphere wherein the ideas of East and West mingled. With an intense yearning for knowledge, he eagerly absorbed all that was worth knowing and accepted everything, whether Christian, Jewish, Grecian, or Egyptian, which at that time the teeming intellectual world of Alexandria offered him. He distinguished himself as a teacher in a school of catechists. The pagan philosopher Porphyrius, a pupil of Platonus, said of him, quote, His outer life was that of a Christian and against the law, but in his view of things, phenomenal and divine, he was a Hellenist and substituted the conception of the Greeks for the foreign myths. End quote. Already before A.D. 211, his self-castration had taken place. His inner motives for this may indeed be guessed, but historically they are not known to us. Personally, he was of great influence and had a winning speech. He was constantly surrounded by pupils and a whole host of stenographers who gathered up the precious words that fell from the revered master's lips. As an author, he was extraordinarily fertile, and he developed an amazing academic activity. In Antioch, he even delivered lectures on theology to the emperor's mother, Mamea. In Caesarea, he was the head of a school. His teaching activities were considerably interrupted by his extensive journeyings. He possessed extraordinary scholarship and had an astounding capacity for the investigation of things in general. He hunted up old Bible manuscripts and earned special merit for his textual criticism. Quote, he was a great scholar, indeed the only true scholar the ancient church possessed, end quote, says Harnack. In complete contrast to Tertullian, Origen did not bar the door against the influence of Gnosticism. In fact, he even transferred it, in attenuated form, into the bosom of the church. Such at least was his aim. Indeed, judging by his thought and fundamental views, he was himself almost a Christian Gnostic. His position in regard to faith and knowledge is portrayed by Harnack in the following psychologically significant words. Quote, the Bible, in likewise, is needful to both. The believers receive from it the realities and commandments which they need, while the scholars decipher thoughts therein and gather from it that power which guideth them to the contemplation and love of God, whereby all material things, through spiritual interpretation, allegorical exegesis, hermeneutics, seem to be recast into a cosmos of ideas until all is at last surmounted in the ascent and left behind as stepping stones, while only this remaineth, the blessed abiding relationship of the God-created creature soul to God. End quote. His theology, as distinguished from Tertullian's, was essentially philosophical. It was thoroughly pressed, so to speak, into the frame of a Neoplatonic philosophy. In origin, the two spheres of Grecian philosophy and the Gnosis on one hand, and the world of Christian ideas on the other, peacefully and harmoniously intermingle. But this daring, intelligent tolerance and sense of justice also led Origen to the fate of condemnation by the Church. The final condemnation, to be sure, only took place posthumously, when Origen as an old man had been tortured in the persecution of the Christians by Decius, and had died not long after from the effects of the torture. In 399, Pope Anastasius I pronounced the condemnation, and in 543 his heresy was anathematized by a synod convoked by Justinian, which judgment was upheld by later councils. Origen is a classical example of the extroverted type. His basic orientation is towards the object. This shows itself in his conscientious consideration of objective facts and their conditions. It is also revealed in the formulation of that supreme principle, Amor et Visio Dei. The Christian process of development encountered in Origen, a type whose bedrock foundation is the relation to the object, a type that has ever symbolically expressed itself in sexuality, which also accounts for the fact that there exist, even today, certain theories which reduce every essential function of the soul down to sexuality. 
Castration is therefore the adequate expression of the sacrifice of the most valuable function. It is entirely characteristic that Tertullian should perform the sacrificium intellectus, whereas Origen is led to the sacrificium phalli, since the Christian process demands a complete abolition of the sensual hold upon the object. In other words, it demands the sacrifice of the hitherto most valued function, the dearest possession, the strongest instinct. Considered biologically, the sacrifice is brought into the service of domestication, but psychologically it opens a door for new possibilities of development to be inaugurated through the liberation from old ties. Tertullian sacrificed the intellect because it was that which most strongly bound him to worldliness. He battled with the gnosis because for him it represented the sidetrack into the intellectual, which at the same time involves also sensuality. Parallel with this fact, we find that in reality, Gnosticism was also divided into two schools, one school striving after a spirituality that exceeded all bounds, the other losing itself in an ethical anarchism, an absolute libertinism that shrank from no lechery, however atrocious and perverse. One must definitely distinguish between the Encratites and the Antitacts, or antinomians, those opposed to order and law, who, in obedience to certain doctrines, sinned on principle and purposefully gave themselves to unbridled debauchery. To the latter school belong the Nicolaitans, the Archontici, and so forth, and the aptly named Borborites. How closely the apparent antithesis lay side by side is shown by the example of the Archontici, for this same sect divided into an Incratitic and an antinomian school both of which remained logical and consistent. If anyone wants to know what are the ethical results of a bold intellectualism carried out on a large scale, let him study the history of Gnostic morals. He will thoroughly understand the sacrificium intellectus. These people were also practically consistent and lived what they conceived even to absurd lengths. But Origen, in the mutilation of himself, sacrificed the sensual hold upon the world. For him, evidently, the intellectual was not so much a specific danger as feeling and sensation, with their enchainment to the object. Through castration, he freed himself from the sensuality that was coupled with Gnosticism. He could then yield himself unafraid to the riches of Gnostic thought, while Tertullian, through his sacrifice of intellect, turned away from the Gnosis, but thereby reached a depth of religious feeling that we miss in Origen. Quote, in one way he was superior to Origen, says Schultz, because in his deepest soul he lived every one of his words, it was not reason that carried him away, like the other, but the heart. But in another respect, he stands far behind him, inasmuch as he, the most passionate of all thinkers, was on the verge of rejecting knowledge altogether, for his battle against the Gnosis was tantamount to a complete denial of human thought. End quote. We see here how, in the Christian process, the original type has actually become reversed. Tertullian, the acute thinker, becomes the man of feeling, while Origen becomes a scholar and loses himself in the intellect. Logically, of course, it is quite easy to reverse the state of affairs and to say that Tertullian had always been the man of feeling and Origen the intellectual. Disregarding the fact that the difference of type is not done away with by this procedure, but exists as before, the reversed point of view still has to be explained. How comes it that Tertullian saw his most dangerous enemy in the intellect, while Origen in sexuality? One could say they were both deceived, and one could advance the fatal result of both lives by way of argument. One must assume, if that were the case, that both had sacrificed the less important thing, and thus, to a certain extent, both had made a bargain with fate. That is also a view which contains a principle of recognizable validity. Are there not just such sly boots among the primitives who approach their fetish with a black hen under the arm, saying, See, here is thy sacrifice, a beautiful black pig. I am, however, of the opinion that the depreciatory method of explanation, notwithstanding the unmistakable relief which the ordinary human being feels in dragging down something great, is not under all circumstances the correct one, even though it may appear to be very biological. But from what we can personally know of these two great ones in the realm of the mind, we must say that their whole nature and quality had such sincerity that their Christian conversion was neither a fraudulent enterprise nor mere deceit, but had both reality and truthfulness. We shall not lose ourselves upon a bypath if we take this opportunity of trying to grasp what is the psychological meaning of this breaking of the natural instinctive course, which is what the Christian process of sacrifice seems to be. From what has been said above, it follows that conversion signifies also a transition to another attitude. 
It is further clear whence the impelling motive towards conversion arises, and how far Tertullian was right in conceiving the soul as naturaliter Christiana. The natural instinct, of course, like everything in nature, follows the principle of least resistance. One man is rather gifted here, another there. Or again, adaptation to the early environment of childhood may demand either relatively more restraint and reflection, or relatively more sympathy and participation, according to the nature of the parents and other circumstances. Thereby, a certain preferential attitude is automatically molded, which results in different types. Insofar, then, as every man, as a relatively stable being, possesses all the basic psychological functions, it would be a psychological necessity with a view to perfect adaptation that he should also employ them in equal measure. For there must be a reason why there are different ways of psychological adaptation. Evidently one alone is not sufficient, since the object seems to be only partially comprehended when, for example, it is either merely thought or merely felt. Through a one-sided, typical, attitude, there remains a deficit in the resulting psychological adaptation which accumulates during the course of life. From this deficiency, a derangement of adaptation develops, which forces the subject towards a compensation. But the compensation can be obtained only by means of amputation, that is, sacrifice, of the hitherto one-sided attitude. Thereby, a temporary heaping up of energy results, and an overflow into channels hitherto not consciously used, though already existing unconsciously. The adaptation deficit, which is the causa efficiens of the process of conversion, becomes subjectively perceived as a vague sense of dissatisfaction. Such an atmosphere prevailed at the turning point of our era. A quite astonishing need of redemption came over mankind, and brought about that unheard of efflorescence of every sort of possible and impossible cult in ancient Rome. Moreover, representatives of living the full life theory were not wanting, who, albeit innocent of biology, operated with similar arguments founded on the science of that day. They, too, could never be done with speculations as to why it is that mankind is in such a poor way. Only the causalism of that day, as compared with the science of ours, was somewhat less restricted. Their harking back reached far beyond childhood to cosmogony, and many systems were devised that pointed to all sorts of events in remote antiquity as being the source of insufferable consequences for mankind. The sacrifice that Tertullian and Origen carried out is drastic, too drastic for our taste, but it corresponded with the spirit of that time, which was thoroughly concretistic. In harmony with this spirit, the Gnosis simply took its visions as real, or at least as bearing directly upon reality. Hence, for Tertullian, there was an objective validity in the realities of his feeling. Gnosticism projected the subjective, inner perception of the attitude-changing process into the form of a cosmogenic system, and believed in the reality of its psychological figures. In my book, Psychology of the Unconscious, I left the whole question open as to the origin of the libido course peculiar to the Christian process. I spoke of a splitting of the libido into halves, each directed against the other. The explanation for this is to be found in the one-sidedness of the psychological attitude growing so extreme that the need for compensation became urgent on the side of the unconscious. It is precisely the Gnostic movement in the early Christian centuries which most clearly demonstrates the outbreak of unconscious contents in the moment of compensation. Christianity itself signified the demolition and sacrifice of the cultural values of antiquity, that is, of the classical attitude. As regards the problem of the present, it need hardly be said that it is quite indifferent whether we speak of today or of that age 2,000 years ago. End of section 3 Recording by Olivia. Section 4 of Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines. Section 4. Chapter 1. Part 2. The Theological Disputes of the Ancient Church. It is more than probable that the contrast of types would also appear in the history of those schisms and heresies so frequent in the disputes of the early Christian Church. The Ebionites, or Jewish Christians, who in this respect were probably identical with the primitive Christians generally, believed in the exclusive humanity of Christ and held him to be the son of Mary and Joseph, only subsequently receiving his consecration through the Holy Ghost. 
The Ebionites are, therefore, upon this point, diametrically opposed to the Docetists. The effects of this opposition endured long after. The conflict came to light again in an altered form, which, though essentially attenuated, had in reality an even graver effect upon church politics. About the year 320, in the heresy of Arius, Arius denied the formula propounded by the Orthodox Church, topatri homoousius, that is, like unto the Father. When we examine more closely the history of the great Arian controversy concerning homoousia and homoousia, the complete identity against the essential similarity of Christ with God, it certainly seems to us that the formula of homoousia definitely lays the accent upon the sensuous and humanly perceptible in contrast to the purely conceptual and abstract standpoint of homoousia. In the same way, it would appear to us as though the revolt of the Monophysites who upheld the absolute oneness of the nature of Christ against the diophysitic formula of the Council of Chalcedon, which upheld the inseparable duality of Christ, namely his human and divine nature fashioned in one body, once more asserted the standpoint of the abstract and unimaginable as opposed to the sensuous and natural viewpoint of the diophysistic formula. At the same time, the fact becomes overwhelmingly clear to us that, alike in the Arian movement, as in the Monophysite dispute, the subtle dogmatic question, though indeed the main issue for those minds where it originally came to light, had no hold upon the vast majority who took part in the quarrel of dogmas. So subtle a question had, even at that time, no motive force with the mass, stirred as it was by problems and claims of political power that had nothing to do with differences of theological opinion. If the difference of types had any significance at all here, it was merely because it provided catchwords that gave a flattering label to the crude instincts of the mass. But in no way should this blind one to the fact that, for those who had kindled the quarrel, homoousia and homoousia were a very serious matter, for concealed therein, both historically and psychologically, lay the ebionitic creed of a purely human Christ with only a relative, that is, a parent, divinity, and the docetist creed of a purely divine Christ with only apparent corporeality. And beneath this level again lies the great psychological schism. The one position holds that supreme value and importance lie in the sensuously perceptible, where the subject, though indeed not always human and personal, is nevertheless always a projected human sensation while the other maintains that the chief value lies in the abstract and extra-human of which the subject is the function, in other words, in the objective process of nature that runs its course determined by impersonal law beyond human sensation of which it is the actual foundation. The former standpoint overlooks the function in favor of the function complex, if man can be so regarded. The latter standpoint overlooks the individual as the indispensable controlling vehicle in favor of the function. Both standpoints mutually deny each other their chief value. The more resolutely the representatives of either standpoint identify themselves with their own point of view, the more do they mutually strive, with the best of intentions perhaps, to obtrude their own standpoint and thereby violate the other's chief value. Another aspect of the type antithesis appears on the scene in the Pelagian controversy in the beginning of the 5th century. The experience so profoundly sensed by Tertullian that man cannot avoid sin even after baptism grew with St. Augustine, who in many respects is not unlike Tertullian, into that thoroughly characteristic pessimistical doctrine of original sin, whose essence consists in the concupiscentia inherited from Adam. Over against the fact of original sin, there stood, according to St. Augustine, the redeeming grace of God, with the institution of the Church ordained by His grace to administer the means of salvation. In this conception, the value of man stands very low. He is really nothing but a miserable, rejected creature who is delivered over to the devil under all circumstances, unless through the medium of the church, the sole means of salvation, he is made a participator of the divine grace. Therewith, to a greater or less degree, not only man's value, but also his moral freedom and self-government crumbled away. As a result, the value and importance of the church as an idea was so much the more enhanced, corresponding to the expressed program in the Augustinian Civitas Dei. Against such a stifling conception, springing ever anew, rises the feeling of the freedom and moral value of man. It is a feeling that will not long endure suppression, whether by inspection, however searching, or logic, however keen. The justice of the feeling of human value found its advocates in Pelagius, a monk, and Celestius, his pupil. Their teaching was grounded upon the moral freedom of man as a given fact. 
It is significant of the psychological kinship existing between the Pelagian standpoint and the diophysistic view that the persecuted Pelagians found asylum with Nestorius, the metropolitan of Constantinople. Nestorius emphasized the separation of the two natures of Christ, in contrast to the Cyrillian doctrine of the physike henosis, the physical oneness of Christ as God-man. Also, Nestorius definitely did not wish Mary to be understood as the Theotokos, that is, Mother of God, but only as Christotokos, that is, Mother of Christ. With some justification, he even called the idea that Mary was Mother of God heathenish. From him originated the Nestorian controversy, which finally ended with the secession of the Nestorian Church. End of section 4. Recording by Olivia. Section 5 of Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines. Section 5. Chapter 1.3 the problem of transubstantiation. With those immense political upheavals, the collapse of the Roman Empire, and the sinking of antique civilization, these controversies lapsed likewise into oblivion. But, as in the course of many centuries a certain stability was again reached, psychological differences also reappeared, tentatively at first, but becoming ever more intense with advancing civilization. No longer, indeed, was it those problems which had brought the ancient church into confusion. New forms had come to light, under which, however, the same psychology was concealed. About the middle of the ninth century, the abbot Pascansius Radbertus appeared with a writing upon the Holy Communion, in which he advanced the doctrine of transubstantiation, that is, the view that the wine and holy wafer became transformed in the communion into the actual blood and body of Christ. As is well known, this conception became a dogma, according to which the transformation is accomplished, vere, realiter, substantialiter, in truth, in reality, in substance. Although the accidentals preserve their outer aspect of bread and wine, they are substantially the flesh and the blood of Christ. Against this extreme concretization of a symbol, Retromnus, a monk in the same monastery in which Radbertus was abbot, dared to raise a certain opposition. Radbertus, however, found a more resolute adversary in Scotus Aragina, one of the great philosophers and daring thinkers of the early Middle Ages, who, as Hasse says in his History of the Church, stood so high and solitary above his time that the anathema of the Church reached him only after centuries. As abbot of Malmesbury, he was butchered by his own monks about the year 889. Scotus Aragina, to whom true philosophy was also true religion, was no blind follower of authority, and the once accepted, because, unlike the majority of his age, he could himself think. He set reason above authority, very unseasonably perhaps, but in a way that assured him of the recognition of the later centuries. Even the fathers of the church, who were considered to be above discussion, he held as authorities only in so far as their writings contained treasures of human reason. Thus he also held that the communion is merely a commemoration of that last supper which Jesus celebrated with his disciples, a view in which the reasonable man of every age will, moreover, participate. But Scotus Aragina, although clear and humanly simple in his thoughts, and little disposed to detract from the meaning and value of the sacred ceremony, was not at one with the spirit of his time and the desires of the world around him, a fact that might indeed be inferred from his betrayal and assassination by his own comrades of the cloister. Because he could think reasonably and consistently, success did not come to him. Instead, it fell to Redbertus, who assuredly could not think, but who transubstantiated the symbolical and meaningful, making it coarse and sensuous. In so doing, he clearly chimed in with the spirit of his time, which craved for the concretizing of religious occurrences. Again, in this controversy, one can easily recognize the basic elements which we have already met with in the disputes commented upon earlier, namely, the abstract standpoint that is averse from any intercourse with the concrete object and the concretistic that is tuned to the object. 
far be it from us to pronounce, from the intellectual viewpoint, a one-sided, depreciatory judgment upon Robertus and his achievement, although to the modern mind this dogma must appear simply absurd, we must not be misled on that account into regarding it as historically worthless. It is indeed a showpiece for every collection of human errors, but its worthlessness is not therefore eo ipsu established. Before passing judgment, we must minutely investigate what this dogma affected in the religious life of those centuries, and what our age still indirectly owes to its operation. It must, for instance, not be overlooked that it is precisely the belief in the reality of this miracle that demanded a release of the psychic processes from the purely sensuous, and this cannot remain without influence upon the nature of the psychic process. The process of directed thinking, for instance, becomes absolutely impossible when the sensuous holds too high a threshold value. By virtue of too high a value, it constantly invades the psyche, where it disintegrates and destroys the function of directed thinking, based as this is precisely upon the exclusion of the unsuitable. From this elementary consideration, there immediately follows the practical importance of those rites and dogmas which hold their ground both from this standpoint as well as from a purely opportunist, biological way of thinking, to say nothing of the direct, specific religious impressions which came to individuals from belief in this dogma. Highly as we esteem Scotus Erigena, the less it is permitted to despise the achievement of Radbertus. We may, however, learn from this example that the thought of the introvert is incommensurable with the thought of the extrovert, since the two thought forms, as regards their determinants, are wholly and fundamentally different. One might perhaps say the thinking of the introvert is rational, while that of the extrovert is programmatical. These arguments, and this I wish particularly to emphasize, do not pretend to be in any way decisive with regard to the individual psychology of the two authors. What we know of Scotus Erigena, personally, it is little enough, is not sufficient to enable us to make any sure diagnosis of his type. What we do know speaks in favor of the introversion type. Of Rodbertus we know next to nothing. We know only that he said something that ran counter to common human thought, but with surer feeling logic he divined what his age was prepared to accept as suitable. This fact would speak in favor of the extroversion type. We must, however, through our insufficient knowledge, suspend judgment on both personalities, since, especially with Rodbertus, the matter might quite well be decided differently. Equally, might he have been an introvert, but with a level of intelligence that altogether failed to rise above the conceptions of his milieu, and with a logic so lacking in originality that it merely sufficed to draw an obvious conclusion from already prepared premises in the writings of the fathers. And vice versa, Scotus Erigena might as well have been an extrovert, if it could be shown that he was carried by a milieu which in any case was distinguished by common sense and which felt a corresponding expression to be suitable and desirable. The latter is in no sort of way proved concerning Scotus Erigena. But, on the other hand, we do know how great was the yearning of that time for the reality of the religious miracle. To this character of that age, the view of Scotus Erigena must have seemed cold and deadening, whilst the assertion of Redbertus must have been alive with a sense of promise, since it concretized what every man desired. End of section 5. Recording by Olivia. Section 6 of Psychological Types or the Physiology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simona Perego. Physiological Types or the Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Young Translated by Helton Goodwin Baines Section 6 Type Problem in Psychiatry We now come to the work of a psychiatrist who from the bewildering multiplicity of so-called psychopathic states attempt to bring two definite types into relief. This very extensive group embraces all those psychopathic borderline states which can no longer be included under the heading of the psychosis proper 
Hence, all the neuroses and degenerative states, e.g. intellectual, moral, affective, and such like physical inferiorities. This attempt was made in 92 by Otto Gross, who published a theoretical study entitled Die Cerebral Secundar Function, and it was the basis hypothesis of this work that prompted him to the conception of two psychological types. Although the empirical material treated by Gross is taken from the domain of physical inferiority, this is no reason why the points of view thus obtained should not be transferred to the wider regions of normal psychology. Since the unbalanced physics states are for the investigator a very favorable opportunity of gaining an almost exaggeratedly distinct view of certain physical phenomena, which are often only dimly perceptible within the boundaries of the normal. Occasionally, the abnormal condition has the effect of a magnifying glass. As we shall soon see, Gross himself, in his final chapter, also extends his conclusions to the wider terrain. By secondary function, Gross understands a cerebral cell process that comes into action after the primary function has already taken place. The primary function would correspond to the actual performance of the cells, with the production of a positive physical process, let us say, a representation. This performance represents an energetic process, presumably the release of a chemical tension, i.e. a chemical decomposition. In the wake of this sudden discharge, turned by Gross the primary function, the secondary function begins. It represents, therefore, a restitution, a rebuilding by means of assimilation. This function will occupy a shorter or longer interval in proportion to the intensity of the preceding expenditure of energy. During this time, the cell, as compared with its former condition, is in an altered state, with the state of stimulation, which cannot be without influence upon the further physical process. Processes that are especially highly toned and loaded with affect must entail an increased expenditure of energy, in a definitely prolonged period of restitution or secondary function. The effect of the secondary function upon the physical process is considered by Gross to be a specific and demonstrable influencing of the subsequent association sequence, with the particular effect of restricting the choice of associations to the thema represented in the primary function, the so-called leading idea. Not long after, as a matter of fact, I was able to show in my own experimental work, as likewise several of my pupils in corresponding investigations, phenomena of perseveration, following ideas with a high feeling tone. These phenomena are accessible to mathematical proof. My pupil, Dr. Eberswelling, in an investigation of speech phenomena, has demonstrated that the same phenomenon in assonances and agglutinations. Furthermore, we know from pathological experience how frequently perseveration occurs in severe brain lesions, e.g. apoplexis, tumors, atrophing and other degenerative conditions. This may well be ascribed to this impeded restitution process. Thus, Gross's hypothesis has a good share of probability. It is only natural, therefore, to raise the question whether there may not be individuals or even types in whom the restitution period, the secondary function, persists longer than in others, and, if so, whether center peculiar psychologies may not eventually be traceable to this. A brief secondary function, clearly, influences fewer consecutive associations in a given length of time than a long one. Hence, in the former case, the primary function can occur much more frequently. The psychological picture in such a case would show a constant and rapidly renewed readiness for action and reaction, hence a kind of capacity for deviation, a tendency to a superficiality of associative connections, and a lack of the deeper, more integrated connections, a certain incoherence, therefore, insofar as significance is expected of the association. On the other hand, many new themata crawl up in the unit of time, though not all deeply engaged or clearly focused, so that the heterogeneous idea of varying values appear, as it were on the same niveau, thus giving an impression of a leveling of ideas. Wernicke. 
This rapid succession of ideas in the primary function excludes any real experience of the effective value of the thema per se. Hence, the effectivity cannot be anything but superficial. But, at the same time, rapid adaptations and changes of attitude and thereby render it possible. The real intellectual process, or better still, abstraction, naturally suffers from the abbreviation of the secondary function, since the process of abstraction demands a sustained contemplation of several initial ideas, plus their after efforts, and therefore a longer secondary function. Without this, no intensification and abstraction of an idea or a group of ideas can take place. The more rapid recovery of the primary function produces a higher rigidity, not of course in the intensive but in the extensive sense. Hence, it provides a prompt grasp of the immediate present, thought only of its surface, not of its deeper meaning. From this circumstance, we may easily gain the impression of an uncritical and open-minded disposition, as the case may be. We are struck by a certain complacency and understanding, or we might find an unintangible inconsiderateness, a crude tactlessness, or even brutality. The two facets gliding over the deeper meanings gives the impression of a certain blindness for everything not immediate and transparent or superficial. The quick regibility has also the appearance of so-called presence of mind, of audacity even to the point of full hardness. Thus, besides a lack of criticism, it also suggests an inability to realize danger. His rapidity of action looks like preciseness. It is more often blind impulse. This encroachment upon another's province is almost a matter of course. This is facilitated by this ignorance of emotional value, of an idea or action, and its effect upon its fellow men. As a result of the rapid restoration of the state of readiness, the elaboration of perceptions and experiences is disturbed. A country memory is seriously handicapped, since, as a rule, only those associations are accessible to immediate reproduction, with which abundant connections are engaged. Relatively isolated contents are quickly submerged, for which reason it is infinitely more difficult to retain a series of meaningless, incoherent words than a poem. Quick inflammability, rapidly fading enthusiasms are further characteristics of this type. There is also a certain want of taste, which arises from the too rapid succession of heterogeneous contents with a non-realization of their different emotional values. His thinking has a representative character. It tends more towards a quick representation and orderly arrangement of contents than toward abstraction and synthesis. In this outline of the type with the shorter secondary function, I have substantially followed Gross, with the addition of a few transcriptions into the normal. Gross called this type inferiority with shallow consciousness. But if the two unmitigated traits are turned down to a normal level, we get a general picture in which the reader will again easily recognize the less emotional type of Jordan, in other words, the extrovert. Full acknowledgement is due to Cross, since he was the first to establish a uniform and simple hypothesis for the production of this type. The type opposite to it is termed by Gross inferiority with contracted consciousness. In this type, the secondary function is particularly intensive and prolonged. By its prolongation, consecutive association is influenced to a greater extent than in the type mentioned above. Obviously, we may also assume an accentuated primary function in this case, and therefore a more extensive and complete self-performance that with the extrovert. A prolonged and reinforced secondary function would be the natural consequence of this. The prolonged secondary function causes a longer duration of the effect stimulated by the initial idea. From this, we get that Gross terms a contractive effect, namely a specially directive choice, in the sense of the initial idea, of consecutive association. An extensive realization or approfondissement of the theme is thereby obtained. The idea has an enduring effect, the impression goes deep. 
One disadvantage of this is a certain limitation within a, a narrow range, whereby thinking suffers both in variety and abundance. Synthesis, notwithstanding, is essentially assistance, since the elements to be composed remain constellated long enough to render their assumption possible. Moreover, this restriction to one team undoubtedly affects an enrichment of the relevant associations and the firm inner cohesion and integration of the complex. At the same time, however, the complex is shut off from all extraneous material and thus attains an associative isolation, a phenomenon which grows in support of Wernick's concept term C-junction. A result of the C-junction of the complex is an accumulation of groups of ideas or complexes which have no mutual connection or only quite a loose one. Outwardly, such a condition reveals itself as its harmonious or, as Gross called it, a C-junctive personality. The isolated complexes exist side by side without any reciprocal influence. Accordingly, they do not interpret mutually leveling and correcting each other. In the selfies, they are strictly and logically integrated, but they are deprived of the correcting influence of different orientated complexes. Hence, it may easily come about that an especially strong and therefore particularly shut off and uninfluenced complex becomes an excessively valued idea, i.e. it becomes a dominant, defining every criticism and enjoying complete autonomy, until finally it comes to be an uncontrollable factor, in other words, clean. In pathological cases, we find it as a compulsive or paranoic idea, i.e. it becomes an absolutely insurmountable factor, coercing the whole life of the individual into its service. As a result, the entire mentality becomes differently orientated, the standpoint becomes deranged. From this conception of the genesis of a paranoic idea, the fact may also be explained that, in certain incipient conditions, the paranoic idea can be corrected by means of an appropriate psychotherapeutic procedure. Namely, when the latter succeed in combining it with other broadening and therefore correcting complexes. There is also an undoubted variance, uh, even an anxiety connected with the reintegration of severed complexes. The things must remain clean and sundered. The bridges between the complexes must be, as far as possible, broken down by a strict and rigid formulation of the complex content. Gross calls these tendencies association fear. The strict inner seclusiveness of such a complex hampers every attempt at an external influence. Such an attempt has a prospect of success only when it succeeds in combining either the premises and or the conclusion of the complex, just as strictly and logically with another complex as they are themselves mutually bound. The accumulation of insufficiently connected complexes naturally affects a rigid seclusion from the outer world and, as we would say, a powerful heaping up of libido within. Hence, we regularly find an extraordinary concentration upon the inner processes, directed in accordance with the nature of the subject, either upon physical sensations in one preferentially oriented by sensation, or upon mental processes in the more intellectual subject. The personality seems arrested, absorbed, dispersed, sunk in thought, intellectually one-sided or hypochondriacal. In every case, there is only a meager participation in external life and the distinct inclination to an unsociable and solitary existence, which often finds compensation in a special love for plants or animals. The inner processes enjoy innate activity, because from time to time complexes which hitherto had only a slight connection, or even none at all, suddenly collide. This again gives rise to an intensive primary function which, in its turn, releases a long secondary function that amalgamates the two complexes. One might imagine that all the complexes would at some time or other collide in this way, thus producing a general uniformity and integration on physical content. Naturally, this wholesome result could take place only if, in the meantime, one were to arrest all change in the external life.
But, since this is impossible, fresh stimuli are continually arriving and making new secondary functions, which intersect and confuse the inner lines. Consequently, this type has a decided tendency to hold external stimuli at a distance, to keep out of the path of change, to maintain life when possible, in its constant daily stream, until every interior amalgamation shall have been affected. In a diseased subject, this tendency is also clearly in evidence. He gets away from people as far as possible and endeavors to lead the life of a recluse. All in slightest cases, however, will the remedy be found in this way. In all the more severe cases, there is nothing for it but to reduce the intensity of the primary function, which problem, however, in a chapter in itself, and one which we have already attacked in the discussion of the Schiller letters. It is now clear that this type is distinguished by quite a defined affect phenomena. We have already seen how the subject realizes the association belonging to the initial presentation. He carries out a full and coherent association of the material relevant to the thema, insofar, that is, as there is no question of material already linked up with another complex. When a stimulus hits upon such material, i.e. upon a complex, the result is either a violent reaction and an affective explosion, or uh, when the isolation of the complex precludes all contact uh, entirely the negative. But uh, when a realization takes place, uh, all the affective values uh, are released. A powerful emotional reaction occurs, uh, which leaves a long after effect. Frequently, this remains outwardly unobserved, but actually, it bores in uh, all the deeper. These reverberations of the affect engross the individual's attention incapacitating him from receiving new stimuli until the effect has faded away. An accumulation of stimuli becomes unbearable, when violent defense reactions appear. Wherever a strong complex accumulation occurs, a chronic attitude of defense usually develops, which may proceed to general distrust and, in pathological cases, to delusions of persecution. Sudden affective explosions alternating with taciturnity and defense often give such a bizarre appearance to the personality that these persons become quite enigmatic to their entourage. Their impaired realness due to inner absorption leaves them deficient whenever presence of mind or promptness of action is demanded. Accordingly, embarrassing situations frequently occur for which no remedy is at hand, one reason the more for the further seclusion from company. True, the occasional explosions confusion is created in one's relations to others, and the very presence of these perplexities and embarrassment incapacities one from restoring one's relations upon the right lines. This faulty adaptation leads to a series of untoward experiences, which unfairly beget a feeling of inferiority or bitterness, if not of actual animosity, that is really directed against those who were actually or ostensibly the originators of one's misfortune. The effective inner life is very intense, and the manifold emotional reverberations develop an extremely fine gradation and perception of feeling tones. There is a peculiar emotional sensibility, revealing in itself to the outer world in a peculiar timidity and uh, uneasiest in the presence of emotional stimuli, or before every situation where such impressions uh, might be possible. This touchness or irritation is specifically directed against the emotional conditions of the environment. Hence, uh, from uh, brusque expressions of opinion, assertions charged with affect, attempts to influence feeling, etc., there is an immediate and indistinctive defense proceeding, of course, from this very fear of the subject's own emotion, which might again release a reverberating impression whose force might overmaster him. From such sensitiveness, time may well develop a certain melancholy, due to a sense of being shut off from life. In another place, melancholy is mentioned by Gross as a special characteristic of this type. In the same passage, he also points out that the re realization of the affective value easily leads to excessive emotional valuation, or to taking things too seriously. The strong relief given in this picture to the inner processes and the emotional life at once reveals the introvert. The description given by Gross is much fuller than Jordan's outline 
of the impassionated type, which must, however, in its main characters, be identical with the type pictured by Gross. In chapter 5 of his work, Gross observes that, within normal limits, both the inferiority types he describes present physiological differences of individuality. The shell of extensive or the nerve of intense in consciousness is therefore distinctive of the whole character. According to Gross, the type of extensive consciousness is preferably practical because it is quick adaptation to the environment. The inner life does not predominate since it has no great part to play in the formation of great idea complexes. They are energetic propagandists of their own personality and, on a higher level, they also work for the great ideas already handed down. Gross asserts that the feeling life of this type is primitive. Taught in the higher representatives, it becomes organized through the taking over of ready-made ideals from without. His activity, therefore, with respect to the feeling life, can, as Gross says, become heroic. Yet, it is always banal. Heroic and banal scarcely seem compatible attributes. But Gross shows us at once what he means. In this type, there is not a sufficiently rich or developed connection between the erotic complex and the remaining caution content, i.e. with the remaining complexes, aesthetical, ethical, physiological and religious. At this point, Freud would speak of the repression of the erotic element. The distinct presence of this connection is regarded by Gross as a true sign of the superior nature. Page 61. For the sound formation of this connection, a prolonged secondary function is indispensable, since only through the approfondissement and prolonged consciousness of the necessary elements can such a synthesis be brought about. Sexuality can certainly be pressed into the paths of social utility, through the agency of accepted ideas, but it never mounts above the limits of triviality. These somewhat harsh judgments related to a circumstance rendered easily intelligible in the light of the extraverted characters. The extravert is exclusively orientated by external data, and it is always his preoccupation with this wherein the principal bias of his physical activity lies. Hence, he has nothing at his command for the ordering of his inner affairs. They have to be subordinated, as a matter of course, to determinants accepted from without. Under such inscrutancy, no true connection between the more hiding and the less developed function can take place. For this demands a great expense of time and trouble. It is a lengthy and difficult labor of self-education which cannot possibly be achieved without introversion. But for this, the extravert lacks both time and inclination. Moreover, where he is so inclined, he is hampered by that same avoid distrust with which he envisaged his inner world, or the introvert the outer world. One should not imagine, however, that the introvert, thanks to his greater synthetic capacity and his greater ability for the realization of affective values, is thereby immediately fitted to carry out the synthesis of his own individuality, i.e. to establish the once and for all a harmonious association between the higher and the lower functions. I prefer this formulation to gross conception, which holds that the sole question is one of sexuality, since, in my view, it's not purely a question of sexuality, but of other instincts as well. Sexuality is, of course, a very frequent form of expression for undomesticated raw instincts, but the struggle for power in all its manifold aspects is an equally crude instinctive expression. Gross has invented the expression Sejunctive personality for the introvert, by which he singles out the peculiar difficulty with which this type obtains any cohesion or connection between his several complexes. The synthetic capacity of the introvert merely serves to build complexes, as far as possible, isolated from each other. But such complexes are a direct hindrance of the development of the higher unity. Thus, in the introvert, also the complex of sexuality or the egotistic art striving for power, or the search for enjoyment, remains as far as possible isolated and sharply divorced from other complexes. For example, 
I remember an introverted and highly intellectual neurotic who wasted his time alternating between the loftiest flights of transcendental idealism and the most squalid suburban brothers, without any conscious admission of the existence of a moral or aesthetic conflict. The two things were utterly distinct as thought belonging to different spheres. The result, naturally, was an acute compulsion neurosis. We must bear this criticism in mind when following gross elaboration of the type with intensive consciousness. Deepened consciousness is, as Gross says, the basis for the deepening of, of individuality. As a consequence of the strong contractive effect, external stimuli are always regarded from the standpoint of an idea. In place of the instinct for practical life, in so-called reality, there is an impelling tendency to approfondisment. Things are not conceived as individual phenomena, but as a partial ideas or constituents of a great idea complex. This conception of gross accurately coincides with our former reflection, a proposed discussion of the nominalistic and realistic standpoints with their antecedent representatives in the Platonic, Megaric and Cynic schools. In the light of gross conception, one may easily discern wherein the difference between the two standpoints exists. The man with the short secondary function as in a unit of time many and only loses connected the primary functions. Hence, he is specially held by the individual phenomenon and the individual case. For such a man, the universalia are only nominal and are deprived of reality. Whereas for the man with a long secondary function, the inner facts, abstract ideas or universalia are always in the foreground. They are to him the real and actual, to which he must relate all individual phenomena. He is, therefore, by nature a realist, in the scholastic sense. Since, for the introvert, a manner of thinking always takes precedence over perception of externals, he is inclined to be a relativist. Gross, page 63. Harmony in his surroundings gives him a special pleasure. Page 64. It corresponds with his inner pressure towards the harmonizing of his isolated complexes. He shuns every sort of unrestrained demeanor, for it may easily lead to disturbing stimuli. Cases of affect explosion must, of course, be expected. Social consideration, as a result of his absorption by inner processes, irritates Miller. The strong predominance of his own ideas does not favor an acceptance of the ideas or ideas of others. The intense inner elaboration of the complexes gives them a pronounced individual character. The feeling life is frequently unserviceable socially, but is always individual. Page 65. This statement of the author must be submitted to search and criticism, for it contains a problem which, in my experience, always gives occasion for the greatest misunderstandings between the types. The introverted intellectual, whom Gross clearly has uh, here in mind, thought outwardly showing as little feeling as possible, manifests logically correct views and actions, not least because in the first place he has a natural distaste for any parade or feeling, and secondly because he is fearful lest, by incorrect behavior, he should excite disturbing stimuli i.e. the affects of his fellow men. He is fearful of disagreeable effects in others because he credits others with his own sensitiveness. Furthermore, he has always been distressed by the quickness and apparent fitfulness of the extrovert. He represses his feeling, hence in his inner depths it occasionally swells to passion when only too clearly he perceives it. His tormenting emotions are well known to him. He compares them with the feelings shown by others, principally, of course, with those of the extroverted feeling type, and he finds that his feelings are quite different from those of other men. Hence, he embraces the idea that his feelings, or more correctly, emotions, are unique, i.e. individual. It is natural that they should differ from the feelings of the extroverted feeling type, since the latter are a differentiated instrument of, of adaptation, and are wanting, therefore, in the genuine passionateness which characterizes the deeper feelings of the introverted thinking type. But passion, as an elemental, instinctive force, possesses little that is individual, rather it's common to all men. Only what is differentiated can be individual. 
Hence, in the deepest affects, the distinctions of type are at once obliterated in favor of the universal or to human. In my view, the extraverted feeling type is really the chief claim to individualized feeling, because these feelings are differentiated. But where his thinking is concerned, he falls into a similar delusion. He has thoughts which torment him. He compares them with the ideas expressed in the world about him, i.e. ideas largely derived in the first place from the introverted thinking type. He discovers his thoughts have little in common with his ideas. He may therefore regard them as individual and himself, perhaps as an original thinker, or might he repress his thoughts altogether, since no one else thinks the same. In reality, however, his thoughts are common to all the words, although but seldom uttered. In my view, therefore, gross statement mentioned at above springs from a subjective deception, which, however, is also the general rule. The increased contractive power enables an absorption in things to which an immediate vital interest is no longer attached. Gross, page 65. Here, Gross lights upon an essential trait of the introverted mentality. The introvert delights in developing ideas for their own own sake, quite apart from all external reality. Here he analyzes both the superiority and the danger. It is a great advantage to be able to develop an idea in an abstract sphere, where sense no longer intervenes. But there is a danger lest the train of thought should become removed for every practical application, and its value for life be proportionally diminished. Hence, the introvert is always somewhat in danger of getting too remote from life and of viewing things too much from their symbolical aspect. Gross also lays stress upon this character. The extrovert, however, is in no better plight, only for him matters are rather different. He has the capacity so to curtray his secondary function that he experiences almost nothing but the positive primary function, i.e. he no longer remains anchored to anything, but flies about reality in a sort of reasoning. Things are no longer seen and realized, but are merely used as stimulants. This capacity has a great advantage, for it enables one to maneuver oneself out of many difficult situations. Lost are told when thought thinkers of danger, Nietzsche. But it is also a great disadvantage, and catastrophe is its almost inevitable outcome, so often does it lead one into inextricable chaos. From the extraverted type, Gross produces the so-called civilizing genius and the so-called cultural genius from the introverted. The former corresponds with practical achievement, the latter with abstract invention. In conclusion, Gross expresses his conviction that our age stands in special need for the contracted, intensified consciousness, in contrast to former ages where consciousness was shallower and more extensive. Page 68. We delight in the ideal, the profound, the symbolical. Through simplicity to harmony, this is the art of the highest culture. Gross wrote this, to be sure, in the year 1902. And how is it now? If we were to express any opinion at all, we must confess that we manifestly need both civilization and culture, a shortening of the secondary function for the one and the prolongation for the other. For we cannot create the one without the other, and we are unhappily bound to admit that in humanity today there is a lack on either side. Or, let us say, where one is in excess, the other is deficient. Thus, to express ourselves more guardedly, for the continual harping upon progress has become untrustworthy and is under suspicious. In summing up, I would observe that the views of Gross coincide substantially with my own. Even my terms extraversion and introversion are justified from a standpoint of, of Gross conception. It only remains for us to make a critical examination of gross basis hypothesis, the concept of the secondary function. It is always a delicate matter. It is a framing of a physiological or organic hypothesis in connection with physiological processes. It will be familiar that, at the time of the great successes of brain research, a kind of mania prevailed for fabricating physiological hypotheses for psychological processes. 
Among gutties, the hypothesis that the cell processes withdrew during sleep is by no means the most absurd which received serious appreciation and scientific discussion. One was justified in speaking of a veritable brain mythology. But I have no desire to treat gross hypothesis as a brain myth. Its working value is too important for that. It is an excellent working hypothesis, which was received repeated and well-deserved acknowledgement from other quarters. The idea of the secondary function is as simple as it is ingenious. This simple concept enables one to bring a very large number of complex physics phenomena into a satisfying formula. It deals, however, with phenomena whose diverse nature would have successfully withstood a simple reduction and classification by any other single hypothesis. With such a fortunate hypothesis, one is always tempted to overestimate its range and application. Such a possibility may well apply in this case, although in fact this hypothesis has unfortunately but limited range. Let us entirely disregard the fact that in itself the hypothesis is only a postulate, since no one has ever seen the secondary function of the brain cells, and no one could ever demonstrate why, theoretically, the secondary function should qualitatively have the same contractive effect upon the next association as the primary function, which, according to its definition, is essentially different from the secondary function. There is a further circumstance which, in my opinion, carries even greater weight which in one and the same individual the habits of the psychological attitude can alter in a very short space of time. If the duration of the secondary function is of a physiological or organic character, it must surely be regarded as more or less permanent. It is not to be expected then that the duration of the secondary function should suddenly change. Such changes are never found in a physiological or organic character pathological changes, of course, accepted. But, as I have already emphasized more than once, introversion and extroversion are not characters at all, but mechanisms, which can, as it were, be inserted or disconnected at will. Only from their habitual predominance to the corresponding characters develop. There is an undoubted predilection depending upon a certain inborn disposition, which, however, is not always absolutely decisive for one or other mechanism. I have frequently found the milieu's influences to be almost equally important. On one occasion, a case actually came within my own experience, in which a man who had presented a marked extroverted demeanor while living in the closest proximity to an introvert changed his attitude and became quite introverted when subsequently closely involved with a pronounced extroverted personality. I have repeatedly observed in what a short space of time certain personal influences affect an essential alteration in the duration of the secondary function, even in a well-defined type, and how the former condition becomes re-established with the disappearance of the foreign influence. With such experiences in view, we should, I think, direct our interest more to the constitution of the primary function. Gross himself lays stress upon the special prolongation of the secondary function after strong effects, thus bringing the secondary function into a dependent relation upon the primary function. There exists, in fact, no sort of plausible ground where the theory of types should be based upon the duration of the secondary function. It might conceivably be grounded equally well upon the intensity of the primary function, since the duration of the secondary function is obviously dependent upon the intensity of energy consumption and cell performance. We might naturally rejoin that the duration of the secondary function depends upon the rapidity of restoration and that there may be individuals with a especially prompt cerebral assimilation, as opposite to others who are less favored. In this were the case, the brain of the extrovert must possess a higher restitution capacity than that, that on of the introvert. To such a very improbable assumption, very basis of proof is lacking. What is known to us of the actual causes of the prolonged secondary function is limited to the fact that, leaving pathological conditions on one side, the special intensity of the primary function affects, quite logically, a prolongation of the secondary function. Hence, in accordance with the fact, the real problem would lie with the primary function and may be resolved into the question, whence comes it that in one the primary function is uh, as rule intensive, uh, while in other it is weak. If we must shift the problem up on the primary function, 
we have undertaken to explain the varying intensity and uh, the manifestly rapid alteration of intensity of the primary function. It is my belief that this is an energetic phenomenon dependent upon the general attitude. The intensity of the primary function seems to be directly related to the degree of tension involved in the state of readiness. Where a large amount of physical tension is present, the primary function will also have a special intensity with corresponding results. When with increasing fatigue, tension diminishes, a tendency to deviation and the superficiality of association appear, proceeding to fly of ideas, a condition, in fact, which is characterized by a weak primary and short secondary function. The general physical tension, apart from physiological causes such as relaxation, etc., is dependent upon extremely complex factors, such as mood, attention, expectation, etc., i.e. upon judgments of value, which in turn are again results of all the antecedent physical processes. By this, of course, I do not understand logical judgments only, but also feeling judgments. Technically, we should express the general tension in the energetic sense as a libido, while in the physiological sense relating to consciousness, we should refer to it as value. The intensive process is a charge with libido. In other words, it is a manifestation of libido, a high tension and energetic process. The intensive process is a physiological value, hence the associative combinations proceeding from it are termed valuable as opposite to those which are the result of slightly contractive effect. This we described as worthless or superficial. The tense attitude is essentially characteristic only for the introvert, while the relaxed, easy attitude denotes the extrovert, apart, of course, from exceptional conditions. Exceptions, however, are frequent even in one and the same individual. Give the introvert a totally congenial, harmonious milieu, and he relaxes and expands to complete extraversion, until one begins to wonder whether one may not be dealing with an extrovert. But transfer the extrovert into a dark and silent chamber, where every repressed complex can know at him, and he will be reduced to a state of tension, in which the faintest stimulus becomes a poignant realization. The changing situations of life can have a similar effect momentarily reversing the type, but the preferential attitude is not, as a rule, permanently altered, i.e. in spite of occasional extraversion, the introvert remains what he was before, and the extrovert likewise. To sum up, the primary function is, in my view, more important than the secondary. The intensity of the primary function is the decisive factor. It depends upon the general physical tension, i.e. upon the sum of accumulated and disposable libido. The factor that is conditioned by this accumulation is a complex matter and is the resultant of all the antecedent physical states. It may be characterized as mood, attention, emotional state, expectation, etc. Introversion is distinguished by general tension, intensive primary function, and the corresponding long secondary function. Extraversion is characterized by general relaxation, weak primary function, and the corresponding short secondary function. End of section 6. Section 7 of Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines. Section 7. Chapter 1.4b. The Universalia Problem in Scholasticism. The problem of the two forms of judgment remained unsolved because tertium non detur. Porphyrius handed down the problem to the Middle Ages thus, quote, As regards the universal and generic concepts, the real question is whether they are substantial or merely intellectual, whether material or immaterial, whether apart from things perceived or in and around them. Close quotes. Somewhat in this form, the Middle Ages resumed the discussion. They distinguished the Platonic view, the universalia ante rem, the universal or the idea as a standard or example above all individual things, and altogether detached from them, existing in heronio toto, in a heavenly place, as the wise Diotima says to Socrates in the dialogue upon beauty. Quote, 
This beauty will not reveal itself to him as a face, or as hands, or whatever else belongeth to the body, nor yet as an abstract statement or knowledge, nor as anything at all that belongeth to another, whether it be an individual being on the earth, or in heaven, or in any other place, but it is in and for itself, and is itself eternally the same. For every other beauty only partly revealeth its beauty, so that itself, through the dawning and passing hence of other beauty, is neither increased, nor diminished, nor yet suffereth any ill. Close quote. From the Symposium, 211b. The Platonic form, as we saw, stood opposed to the critical assumption that generic concepts are merely words. In this case, the real is prius, the ideal posterius. To this view, the label was attached, universalia post rem. Between both conceptions stands the temperate realistic conception of Aristotle, which can be called the universalia in re, namely, that form, ideos, and matter coexist. The Aristotelian standpoint is a concretistic attempt at a settlement fully corresponding with Aristotle's nature, in contrast to the transcendentalism of his teacher Plato, whose school then relapsed into a Pythagorean mysticism, Aristotle was entirely a man of reality. Of his classical reality, one should add, which contained much in concrete form, which was subtracted by later epochs, and added to the inventory of the human mind. His solution corresponds to the concretism of classical common sense. These three forms also show the structure of medieval opinions in the great Universalia dispute, which was the real essence of the scholastic controversy. It cannot be my task, even were I competent, to probe deeply into the particular points of the great controversy. I must content myself with a mere survey of the orientating allusions. The dispute began with the views of Johannes Roschelinus, about the end of the 11th century, the universalia were for him nothing but nomina rerum, the names of things, or, as tradition says, flatus focus. For him there were only individual things. He was, as Taylor aptly observes, quote, strongly held by the reality of individuals, close quotes. To think of God also as only individual was the next obvious conclusion, thereby dissolving the Trinity into three persons, so that Rostellinius, actually arrived at tritheism, that, the prevailing realism of that time, could not stand. In 1092, the views of Rochelinius were anathematized by a synod at Soissons. Upon the other side stood Hualemy von Champeau, the teacher of Abelard, an extreme realist but of Aristotelian complexion. According to Abelard, he taught that one and the same thing existed, both in its totality and in different individual things at the same time. There were no essential differences at all between individual things, but merely a multiplicity of accidentals. In the latter concept, the actual differences of things are explained as fortuitous, just as in the dogma of transubstantiation, bread and wine, as such, are only accidentals. Upon the side of realism also stood Anselm of Canterbury, the father of the scholastics. A genuine Platonist, the universalia were for him part of the divine logos, from this position, the psychologically important proof of God, which Anselm established, and which is called the ontological proof, can also be understood. This proof demonstrates the existence of God as contingent upon the idea of God. Fitch formulated this proof concisely as follows, quote, The existence of the idea of an absolute in our consciousness proves the real existence of this absolute. Close quote. Anselm's view is, that the concept of a supreme being present in the intellect involves also the quality of existence. He continues thus, quote, In sooth, there exists something in which nothing greater can be thought, as also it cannot be thought that it exists not, and this, our God, art thou. Close quote. The logical weakness of the ontological argument is so obvious that it even requires psychological explanation to show how a mind like Anselm's could advance such an argument. The immediate ground can be sought in the general psychological disposition of realism, namely in the fact that there were not only a class of men, but in keeping with the current of the age, also certain groups of men who laid their accent of value upon the idea, so that the idea represented for them a higher reality or life value than the reality of individual things. Hence it seemed simply impossible to concede that what to them was most valuable and significant should not also really exist. 
Indeed, they had the most striking proof of its efficacy to their very hands, since it is evident that their lives, thoughts, and feelings were wholly orientated to this point of view. The invisibility of the idea matters little by the side of its extraordinary efficacy, which, in fact, is a reality. They had an idea, and not a sensational concept of reality. A contemporary opponent of Anselm, Guanilo, objected, it is true, that the oft-recurring idea of the islands of the blessed does not necessarily prove their actual existence. This objection is palpably reasonable. Not a few objections of this nature were raised in the course of the centuries, which, however, in no way hindered the survival of the ontological argument, even down to quite recent times, for it still found representatives in the 19th century in Hegel, Fitch, and Lotz, Contradictions of this kind are not to be ascribed to some peculiar deficit in logic or to an even greater infatuation for one side or the other. That would be absurd. Rather, it is a matter of deep-seated psychological differences, which must be recognized and upheld. The assumption that there exists only one psychology or only one fundamental psychological principle is an intolerable tyranny belonging to the pseudoscientific prejudice of the normal man. People are always speaking of the man and of his psychology, which is invariably traced back to the nothing else but. In the same way, one talks of the reality as though there were only one. Reality is that which works in a human soul and not that which certain people assume to be operative and about which prejudice generalizations are wont to be made. Moreover, however scientifically such generalizations may be advanced, it must not be forgotten that science is not the summa of life, that it is indeed only one of the psychological attitudes, only one of the forms of human thought. The ontological argument is neither argument nor proof, but merely the psychological verification of the fact that there is a class of men for whom a definite idea has efficacy and reality, a reality which practically rivals the world of perception. The sensationalist relies upon the certainty of his reality, and the man of the idea adheres to his psychological reality. Psychology has to recognize the existence of these two, or more, types, and must under all circumstances avoid thinking of one as a misconception of the other, and it should never seriously try to reduce one type to the other, as though everything essentially other were only a function of the one. This does not mean that the trustworthy scientific principle, principia explicandi praetir necessitatem non sunt multiplicanda, should be abrogated. But the necessity for a plurality of psychological principles still remains. But, quite apart from the foregoing arguments in favor of this assumption, our eyes should be opened by the remarkable fact that, notwithstanding the apparently final dispatch of the ontological argument by Kant, there are still not a few post-Kantian philosophers who have again resumed it, and we are today just as far, or perhaps even further, from an understanding of the pairs of opposites, idealism, realism, spiritualism, materialism, and all the subsidiary questions involved therein, than were the men of the early Middle Ages, who at least had a common world philosophy. In favor of the ontological proof, there is surely no logical argument that appeals to the modern intellect. The ontological argument, in itself, had really nothing to do with logic, but in the form in which Anselm bequeathed it to history, there arises a supplementary intellectualized or rationalized psychological fact, which, naturally, without petitio principi or other sophistries, could never have occurred. But it is just in this that the unassailable validity of the argument reveals itself, namely, that it exists, and that the consensus gentium proves it to be universally existing. It is the fact that it has to be reckoned with, not the sophistry of its proof, for the impotence of its ontological argument consists simply and solely in this, that it will argue logically, while in reality it is much more than a purely logical proof, for the real issue is a psychological fact whose occurrence and effectiveness are so overwhelmingly clear that no sort of argumentation is needed. The consensus gentium proves that, in the statement, quote, God is because he is thought. Close quote. Anselm is right. It is an obvious truth. Indeed, nothing but a statement of identity. The logical argument about it is quite superfluous, and is moreover wrong, inasmuch as Anselm wished to establish his idea of God as a concrete reality. He says, Beyond all doubt there exists something, 
than which nothing greater can be thought, and moreover, it exists as much in the intellect as in the thing. The concept of res was, however, to the scholastics, something that stood upon the same level as thought. Thus Dionysius the Aeropagite, whose writings exercised a considerable influence upon early medieval philosophy, distinguishes in neighboring categories rational, intellectual, perceptible, simply existing things. Thomas Aquinas calls that which is in the soul res as also that which is outside the soul. This noteworthy juxtaposition still enables us to discern the primitive objectivity of the idea in the thought of that time. From this mental attitude, the psychology of the ontological proof becomes easily intelligible. The hypostatizing of the idea was not at all an essential step, but rather, as an echo of the primitive concreteness of thought, it was taken for granted. The counter-argument of Guanilo is psychologically insufficient, for, although, as the consensus gentium proves, the idea of an island of the blessed frequently occurs, yet it is indubitably less effective than the idea of God, which consequently receives a higher reality value. Later writers who resumed the ontological argument all fell, at least in principle, into Anselm's error. Kant's reasoning should be final. We will therefore briefly outline it. He says, quote, The concept of an absolutely necessary being is a pure concept of reason, that is, an idea only, whose objective reality is not by any means proved because the reason has need of it. The unconditioned necessity of a judgment, however, is not an absolute necessity of the thing, for the absolute necessity of a judgment is only a conditioned necessity of the thing, or of the predicate in the judgment. Close quote. Immediately prior to this, Kant gives, as an example of a necessary judgment, that a triangle must have three angles. He is referring to this statement when he continues, quote, The proposition just cited does not say that three angles are absolutely necessary, but only that, if a triangle exists, it must contain three angles. But this mere logical necessity has given evidence of such a great power of illusion that people have framed a priori the conception of a thing that seems to include existence within its content, and have then assumed that because existence belongs necessarily to the object as conceived, it must also belong necessarily to the thing itself. Thus it is inferred that there is an absolutely necessary being, because the existence of that being is thought in a conception that has been arbitrarily assumed, and assumed under the supposition that there is an actual object corresponding to it. Close quote. The power of illusion to which Kant here alludes is nothing else but the primitive, magical power of the word, which likewise mysteriously inhabits the idea. It needed a long process of development before man once fundamentally realized that the word, the flatus focus, does not in every case also signify, or affect, a reality. But that certain men have understood this has not by any means sufficed to uproot from every mind that superstitious power which dwells within the formulated concept. There is evidently something in this instinctive superstition that will not be uprooted. It exhibits, therefore, some right to existence, which till now has not been sufficiently appreciated. The paralogism, false conclusion, is in like manner introduced into the ontological argument, namely through an illusion which Kant elucidates as follows. He is now speaking of the assertion of absolutely necessary subjects, the conception of which is simply inherent in the idea of existence, and therefore, without intrinsic contradiction, cannot be dismissed. This conception would be that of the most real being for all. Quote, this being, it is said, possesses all reality, and such a being, as I am willing to admit, we are justified in assuming to be possible. Now that which really comprehends all reality must comprehend also existence. Hence, Existence is involved in the conception of a thing as possible. If, therefore, the thing is denied existence, even its internal possibility is denied, and this is self-contradictory. Either the thought in you must itself be the thing, or you must have simply assumed existence to be implied in mere possibility, which is nothing but a wretched tautology. Being is evidently no real predicate. That is, the conception of something that is capable of being added to the conception of a thing. It is merely the ungrounded assertion of a thing, or of certain determinations as an object of thought. In logic, being is simply the copula of a judgment. The proposition, God is omnipotent, contains two conceptions, the objects of which are respectively God and omnipotence, and the word is adds no new predicate 
but is merely a sign that the predicate omnipotent is asserted in relation to the subject, God. If, then, I take the term God, which is the subject, to comprehend the whole of the predicates, including the predicate omnipotent, and say, God is, or there is a God, I do not enlarge the conception of God by a new predicate, but I merely bring the subject in itself with all its predicates, in other words, the object, into relation with my conception. The content of the object and of my conception must be exactly the same, and hence I add nothing to my conception, which expresses merely the possibility of the object by merely placing its object before me in thought and saying that it is. The real contains no more than the possible. A hundred real dollars do not contain a cent more than a hundred possible dollars. No doubt there are in my purse a hundred dollars more if I actually possess them than if I have merely the conception, that is, have merely the possibility of them. Our conception of an object may thus contain whatever and how much it will. Nevertheless, we must ourselves stand away from the conception in order to bestow existence upon it. This happens with sense objects through the connection with any one of our perceptions in accordance with empirical laws. But for objects of pure thought, there is no sort of means for perceiving their existence because it is wholly a priori that they can be known. Our consciousness of all existence, however, belongs altogether to a unity of experience, and an existence outside this field cannot absolutely be explained away as impossible, but it is a supposition that we have no means of justifying. Close quote. This detailed reminder of the fundamental exposition of Kant seems to be necessary, since it is precisely here that we find the sharpest division between the Essa in Intellectu and the Essa in Re. Hegel cast the reproach at Kant that one could not compare the idea of God with the fantasy of a hundred dollars, but, as Kant rightly pointed out, logic must be abstracted from all content. There would certainly be no more logic if content were to prevail. Seen from the standpoint of logic, there exists, as ever, no third between the logical either or, but between intellectus and res there is still anima. And this essa in anima makes the entire ontological argument superfluous. Kant himself, in his critique of practical reason, attempted on a large scale to make a philosophical estimate of the essa in anima. There he introduces God as a postulate of practical reasoning, proceeding from the a priori recognition of, quote, respect for moral law necessarily directed toward the highest good, and the supposition or inference therefrom of the objective reality of the same, close quote. The essay in anima, then, is a matter of psychological fact, concerning which it is only necessary to decide whether it appears once, often, or universally in human psychology. The fact which is called God, and is formulated as, quote, the highest good, close quote, signifies, as the term already reveals, the supreme psychic value, or in other words, the idea which either confirms or actually receives the highest and most general significance in respect of the determination of our action and thought. In the language of analytical psychology, the concept of God coincides with that complex which, in accordance with the foregoing definition, combines within itself the highest sum of libido, psychic energy. Accordingly, the actual God concept of the anima differs completely in different men, a fact which also corresponds with experience. Even in the idea, God is not one constant being. Still less is he so in reality. For, as we well know, the highest operative value of a human soul is variously located. There are men whose God is their belly. Similarly, there are men whose God is money, science, power, sexuality, and so forth. The whole psychology of the individual, at least in its principal tendencies, is displaced in accordance with the respective localization of the highest good, so that a psychological theory which is exclusively based on any one basic instinct, as, for example, power or sexuality, can adequately explain features of only secondary significance when applied to an individual of another orientation. End of Section 7. Recording by Olivia. Section 8 of Psychological Types or The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. 
Translated by Helton Godwin Baines. Section 8. Chapter 1.4. C. Abelard's Attempt at Conciliation. It is not without interest to investigate how scholasticism itself attempted to settle the universalia dispute, how it tried to create an equipoise between the typical opposites which the tertium non dator divided. This attempted settlement was the work of Abelard, that unhappy man who burned with love for Heloise and who paid for his passion with the loss of his manhood. Whoever is acquainted with the life of Abelard will know how intensely his own soul housed those severed opposites whose philosophical reconciliation was for him such a vital issue. De Remusson characterizes Abelard as an eclectic who criticized and rejected every accepted theory concerning the universalia, but who nonetheless freely borrowed from them what was true and tenable. Abelard's writings, so far as they relate to the universalia dispute, are confusing and difficult, because the author is constantly engaged in weighing every argument and aspect of the case. It is precisely because he acknowledged no truth in the avowed standpoint, but always sought to comprehend and reconcile the contrary view, which is responsible for the fact that he was never once thoroughly understood, even by his own pupils. Some understood him as a nominalist, others as a realist. This misunderstanding is characteristic. It is much easier to think from one definite type, for within it one can remain logical and consistent, than it is to remain consistent with both types, since the intermediate standpoint is lacking. Realism as well as nominalism, if pursued consistently, leads to finality, clarity, and uniformity. But the weighing and adjustment of the opposites leads to confusion and to an unsatisfactory issue for the types, since to neither is the solution completely satisfying. De Remusson has collected from Abelard's writings a whole series of almost contradictory assertions relating to our subject. He exclaims, Faut-il admettre en effet ce vaste et incohérent ensemble des doctrines dans la tête d'un seul homme et la philosophie d'Abelard est-elle le chaos? From nominalism, Abelard takes the truth that the universalia are words, in the sense that they are intellectual conventions expressed by language. Furthermore, he takes from it the truth that a thing in reality is not universal, but always something particular and that substance in reality is never a universal, but an individual fact. From realism, Abelard takes the truth that genera and species are combinations of individual facts and things on the ground of their indubitable similarity. Conceptualism is, for him, the mediatory standpoint. This is to be understood as a function which comprises the individual objects perceived, classifies them into genera and species upon the basis of their similarity, and thus reduces their absolute multiplicity to a relative unity. However unquestionable multiplicity and diversity may be, the existence of similarities, which by means of the concept makes fusion possible, is equally beyond dispute. For whoever is psychologically so adapted as to perceive mainly the similarity of things, the collective or constellating concept is, so to speak, taken for granted. That is, it frankly obtrudes itself with the undeniable actuality of the sense perception. But, for the man who is psychologically so adjusted as to perceive mainly the diversity of things, the similarity of things is not exclusively assumed. What he sees is their difference, which indeed forces itself upon him with just as much actuality as similarity does to the other. It seems as though feeling into the object were the psychological processes which brought the distinctiveness of the object into an especially bright light, and as though abstraction from the object were the process most calculated to blind one's eyes to the actual distinctiveness of individual things in favor of their general similarity, which is the very foundation of the idea. Feeling into and abstraction combined produce that function which underlies the idea of conceptualism. It is founded, therefore, upon the only psychological function which has any real possibility of uniting the divergence between nominalism and realism and bringing them upon a common way. Although the Middle Ages knew how to speak great words of the soul, psychology they had none, which is one of the youngest of all sciences. If at that time a psychology had existed, Abelard would have framed the essay in Anima as his mediatory formula. De Remusson clearly discerned this, for he says, quote, in pure logic, universalia are only terms of a language of convention. In physics, which is more transcendent than experimental, 
which is true ontology, genres and notions are based on the way in which beings are actually produced and constituted. Between pure logic and physics, there is a mediating region, which can be called a psychology. There, Abayard investigates how our concepts are formed and traces this intellectual genealogy of beings, depicted or symbolic, their hierarchy, and their real existence. Close quote. The universalia ante rem and post rem have remained a matter of dispute for every ensuing century, even though they cast aside their scholastic robe and appeared under a new disguise. Fundamentally, it was the old problem. At one time, the attempt at solution inclined towards the realistic side, at another, towards the nominalistic. The scientific character of the 19th century gave the problem a push once more toward the side of nominalism, after the philosophy of the beginning of the 19th century had at first done full justice to realism. But the opposites are no longer so widely sundered as in Abelard's time. We have a psychology, a mediatory science, which alone is capable of uniting idea and thing without doing violence either to the one or the other. This capacity abides in the very nature of psychology, but no one could contend that psychology has hitherto accomplished this task. One must, in this connection, acquiesce in the words of de Remusson, quote, Abelard triumphed, for, despite serious restrictions, that far-sighted critic discovered a region beyond nominalism or the conceptualism that is imputed to him. His mind is indeed where the modern spirit has its origin. He proclaims it, he advances it, he promises it. The light that glimmers on the morning horizon is that of the still unseen star that will illuminate the world. Close quote. If one overlooks the existence of psychological types, as also the contingent circumstance that the truth of the one is the error of the other, then Abelard's labor will mean nothing but one scholastic sophistry the more. But in so far as we recognize the existence of the two types, the effort of Abelard must appear to us as of the greatest importance. He seeks the mediatory standpoint in the sermo, by which he understood not so much a discourse as a formed sentence joined to a definite meaning, a definition, in fact, only requiring additional words for the consolidation of its meaning. He does not speak of verbum, for to nominalism this is nothing more than a vox, a flatus vocus. Indeed, it is the great psychological achievement of both the classical and medieval nominalism that it completely abolished the primitive, magical, or mystical identity of the word with the objective matter of fact. Too completely, indeed, for the type of man who has it in his foundation, not in the foothold offered by things, but in the abstraction of the idea from things. Abelard was too wide in his outlook to have been able to overlook this value of nominalism. For him, the word was indeed a vox, but the statement, or in his language, the sermo, was something more, for it carried with it a solid meaning. It described the common factor, the idea, what in fact has been thought and understood about things. In the sermo, the universal lived, and there alone. It is, therefore, intelligible that Abelard was also counted among the nominalists, incorrectly, however, for the universal was to him a greater reality than a vox. The expression of his conceptualism must have been difficult enough for Abelard, for he had necessarily to construct it out of contradictions. An epitaph contained in an Oxford manuscript gives us, I think, a searching insight into the paradox of his teaching. Hic docuit voces cum ribus significare, et docuit voces res significato notare, errores generum correxit ita specierum, hic genus et species in sola voce locavit et genus et species sermones esse notavit, sic animal nullumque animal genus esse probatur, sic et homo es nullis homo species vocitatur. In so far as an expression is striven for, that is based in principle upon one standpoint, that is, the intellectual in the case in point, the antagonism can hardly be bridged except by paradox. We must not forget that the radical difference between nominalism and realism is not purely a logical and intellectual distinction, but also a psychological one, which, in the last resort, amounts to a typical difference of psychological attitude to the object as well as to the idea. Whoever is orientated to the idea apprehends and reacts from the angle of vision governed by the idea, but the man who is orientated to the object apprehends and reacts from the standpoint of his sensation. For him, the abstract is of secondary importance, since what must be thought about things seems to him relatively inessential, while with the former it is just the reverse. The man who is orientated to the object is naturally nominalistic, 
The name is Sound and Smoke, insofar as he has not yet learnt to compensate his objective attitude. Should this latter event take place, he will become, if he has the necessary ability, an overnice logician, one who is constantly on the lookout for a meticulousness, a method, and a dullness that can equal his own. The man who is orientated to the idea is naturally logical. That is why, when all is said and done, he can neither understand nor appreciate textbook logic. The development towards the compensation of his type makes him, as we saw in Tertullian, a man of passionate feeling, whose feelings, however, remain within the magic circle of his ideas. But the man who is a logician by compensation remains with his world of ideas within the magic circle of his object. With these reflections, we come to the shaded side of Abelard's thought. His attempt at solution is one-sided. If, in the opposition between nominalism and realism, it were merely a question of logical intellectual arrangement, it would be incomprehensible why no terminal conclusion other than a paradox is possible. But since it is a question of a psychological opposition, a one-sided intellectual formulation must end in paradox. Sicet homo et nullis homo species vocitatur. Thus, both man and not man are called species. The logico-intellectual expression is absolutely incapable, even in the form of the sermo, of providing that mediatory formula which can do justice to the real natures of the two opposing psychological attitudes, for it is wholly derived from the side of the abstract and is completely lacking in the recognition of concrete reality. Every logico-intellectual formulation, however embracing it may be, divests the objective impression of its living and immediate quality. It must do this in order to reach any formulation whatsoever. But, in so doing, just that is lost which to the extroverted attitude seems absolutely essential, namely, the relationship to the real object. No possibility exists, therefore, that we shall find upon the line of either attitude any satisfactory and reconciling formula. And yet man cannot remain in this division, even if his mind could, for this discussion is not merely a matter of remote philosophy, it is the daily repeated problem of the relations of man to himself and to the world. And because this at bottom is the problem at issue, the division cannot be resolved by a discussion of nominalist and realist arguments. For its solution, a third intermediate standpoint is needed. To the essay in intellectu, tangible reality is lacking. To the essay in re, the mind. Idea and thing come together, however, in the psyche of man, which holds the balance between them. What would the idea amount to if the psyche did not provide its living value? What would the objective thing be worth if the psyche withheld from it the determining force of the sense impression? What, indeed, is reality if it is not a reality in ourselves, an essay in anima? Living reality is the exclusive product neither of the actual, objective behavior of things nor of the formulated idea. Rather does it come through the gathering up of both in the living psychological process, through the essay in anima. Only through the specific vital activity of the psyche does the sense perception attain that intensity and the idea that effective force, which are the two indispensable constituents of living reality. This peculiar activity of the psyche, which can be explained neither as a reflexive reaction to sense stimuli nor as an executive organ of eternal ideas, is, like every vital process, a perpetually creative act. Each new day reality is created by the psyche. The only expression I can use for this activity is fantasy. Fantasy is just as much feeling as thought. It is intuitive just as much as sensational. There are no psychic functions which in fantasy are not inextricably interrelated with the other psychic functions. At one time it appears primordial, at another as the latest and most daring product of gathered knowledge. Fantasy, therefore, appears to me as the clearest expression of the specific psychic activity. Before everything, it is the creative activity whence issue the solutions to all answerable questions. It is the mother of all possibilities, in which, too, the inner and the outer worlds, like all psychological antitheses, are joined in living union. Fantasy it was, and ever is, which fashions the bridge between the irreconcilable claims of object and subject, of extroversion and introversion. In fantasy alone are both mechanisms united. If Abelard had gone deep enough to recognize the psychological difference between the two standpoints, he would logically have had to enlist fantasy for the formulation of the reconciling expression. But in the world of science, fantasy is just as much taboo as is feeling. If, however, we appreciate the underlying opposition as a psychological one, it will be seen that psychology is not only obliged to recognize the standpoint of feeling, 
it must also acknowledge the intermediate standpoint of fantasy. Here, however, comes the great difficulty. Fantasy, for the most part, is a product of the unconscious. It doubtless includes conscious elements, but nonetheless, it is an especial characteristic of fantasy that it is essentially involuntary and stands inherently opposed to conscious contents. It has this quality in common with the dream, though the latter has, of course, strangeness and spontaneity in a much higher degree. The relation of the individual to his fantasy is very largely conditioned by his relation to the unconscious in general, and this, in its turn, is peculiarly influenced by the spirit of the age. In inverse ratio to the degree of prevailing rationalism will the individual be more or less disposed to have dealings with the unconscious and its products. The Christian sphere, like every completed religious form, undoubtedly tends to suppress the unconscious in the individual to the fullest limit, thus paralyzing his fantasy activity. In its stead, religion offers stereotyped symbolical ideas which replace the individual unconscious. The symbolical presentations of all religions are stages of unconscious processes in a typical and universally binding form. Religious teaching gives, as it were, conclusive information concerning the last things and the other world of human consciousness. Wherever we can observe a religion at its birth, we see how even the figures of his doctrine flow into the founder as revelations, that is, as concretizations of his unconscious fantasy. The forms arising out of his unconscious are interpreted as universally valid and thus, in a measure, replace the individual fantasies of others. The evangelist Matthew has preserved for us a fragment of this process from the life of Christ. In the story of the temptations, we see how the idea of kingship emerges from the founder's unconscious in the form of the devil, who offers him power over the kingdoms of the earth. Had Christ misunderstood the fantasy and taken it concretely, there would have been one madman the more in the world. But he refused the concretization of his fantasy and entered the world as a king, unto whom the kingdoms of heaven are subject. He was therefore no paranoiac, as indeed the result also proved. The views advanced from time to time from the psychiatric side concerning the morbidity of Christ's psychology are nothing but ludicrous rationalistic twaddle, altogether remote from any sort of comprehension of the meaning of such processes in the history of man. The forms in which Christ presented the content of his unconscious to the world became accepted and interpreted as universally binding. Therewith, all individual fantasy lapsed. It became not only invalid and worthless, but it was actually persecuted as heretical, as the fate of the Gnostic movement and of later heresies testifies. The prophet Jeremiah speaks in a similar sense when he says, from Jeremiah 23, 16-28, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you, they make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart, and not out of the mouth of the Lord. I have heard what the prophets said, that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name, by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name through Baal. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream, and let he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat? saith the Lord. Close quote. We see also in early Christianity how, for example, the bishops zealously strove to root out the efficacy of the individual unconscious among the monks. The archbishop Athenaeus of Alexandria, in his biography of St. Anthony, offers us a particularly valuable insight into this activity. In this document he describes, by way of instruction to his monks, the apparitions and visions, the perils of the soul, which befall those that pray and fast in solitude. He warns them how cleverly the devil disguises himself in order to bring saintly men to their fall. The devil is, of course, the voice of the anchorite's own unconscious, which revolts against the violent suppression of the individual nature. I give a group of exact quotations from this rather inaccessible book. Very clearly they show how the unconscious was systematically suppressed and depreciated. Quote, there is a time when we see no man, and yet the sound of the working of the devils is heard by us, and it is like the singing of a song in a loud voice. And there are times when the words of the scriptures are heard by us, just as if a living man were repeating them. And they are exactly like the words which we should hear if a man were reading the book. And it also happeneth that they, the devils, rouse us up to the night prayer, and incite us to stand upon our feet. 
and they make us to see also the similitudes of monks and the forms of those who mourn, that is, the anchorites, and they draw nigh to us as if they had come from a long journey, and they make lax the understanding of those who are feeble of the soul, and they begin to utter words like unto these, Are we condemned throughout all creation to love places of desolation? Were we not able, when we came to our houses, to fear God and to do fair deeds? And when they are unable to work their will by means of a scheme of this kind, they cease from this kind of deceit and turn into another and say, How is it possible for thee to live? For thou hast sinned and committed iniquity in many things. Thinkest thou that the Spirit hath not revealed to me what hath been done by thee, or that I know not that thou hast done such and such a thing? If, therefore, a simple brother hear these things, and feel within himself that he hath done evil, as the evil one hath said, and he be not acquainted with his craftiness, his mind will be troubled straight away, and he shall fall into despair and turn backwards. It is then, O my beloved, unnecessary for us to be terrified at these things, and we have need to fear only when the devils multiply the speaking of the things which are true, and then we must rebuke them severely. Therefore, let us be on our guard." We must not then even appear to incline our hearing to their words, even though they be words of truth which they utter. For it would be a disgrace unto us that those who have rebelled against God should become our teachers. And let us, O my brethren, arm ourselves with the armor of righteousness, and let us put on the helmet of redemption, and in the time of contending, let us shoot out from a believing mind spiritual arrows as from a bow which is stretched. For they, the devils, are nothing at all, and even if they were, their strength hath in it nothing which would enable it to resist the might of the cross. St. Anthony relates, quote, Once there appeared unto me a devil of an exceedingly haughty and insolent appearance, and he stood up before me with the tumultuous noise of many people, and he dared to say unto me, I, even I, am the power of God, and I, even I, am the Lord of the worlds. And he said unto me, What dost thou wish me to give thee? Ask, and thou shalt receive. Then I blew a puff of wind at him, and I rebuked him in the name of Christ. And on another occasion, when I was fasting, the crafty one appeared to me in the form of a brother monk, carrying bread, and he began to speak unto me words of counsel, saying, Rise up, and stay thy heart with bread and water, and rest a little from thine excessive labors, for thou art a man, and howsoever greatly thou mayest be exalted, thou art clothed with a mortal body, and thou shouldst fear sickness and tribulations." Then I regarded his words, and I held my peace, and refrained from giving an answer. And I bowed myself down in quietness, and I began to make supplications in prayer. And I said, O Lord, make thou an end of him, even as thou hast been wont to do away with him at all times. And as I concluded my words, he came to an end, and vanished like dust, and went forth from the door like smoke. Now on one occasion Satan approached the house one night, and knocked at the door, and I went out to see who was knocking. And I lifted up mine eyes, and saw the form of an exceedingly tall and strong man. And having asked him, Who art thou? He answered and said unto me, I am Satan. After this I said unto him, What seekest thou? And he answered unto me, Why do the monks and the anchorites and all the other Christians revile me? And why do they at all times heap curses upon me? And having clasped my head firmly in wonder at his mad folly, I said unto him, Wherefore dost thou give them trouble? Then he answered and said unto me, It is not I who trouble them, but it is they who trouble themselves. For there happened to me on a certain occasion that which did happen to me, and had I not cried out to them that I was the enemy, his slaughters would have come to an end for ever. I have therefore no place to dwell in, and not one glittering sword, and not even people who are really subject unto me, for those who are in service to me hold me wholly in contempt." And moreover, I have to keep them in fetters, for they do not cleave to me, because they esteem it right to do so, and they are ever ready to escape from me in every place. The Christians have filled the whole world, and behold, even the desert is filled full with their monasteries and habitations. Let them then take good heed to themselves when they heap abuse upon me. Then, wondering at the grace of our Lord, I said unto him, How does it happen that whilst thou hast been a liar on every other occasion, at this present the truth is spoken by thee? And how is it that thou speakest the truth now, when thou art wont to utter lies? It is indeed true that when Christ came unto this world, thou wast brought down to the lowest depths, and that the root of thine error was plucked up from the earth. And when Satan heard the name of Christ, his form vanished, and his words came to an end. 
These quotations show how, with the aid of the universal belief, the unconscious of the individual was rejected, notwithstanding the fact that it transparently spoke the truth. There are in the history of the mind a special reasons for this rejection. It does not behoove us at this point to elucidate these reasons further. We must content ourselves with the actual fact that it was suppressed. Speaking psychologically, this suppression consists in a withdrawal of libido, psychic energy. The libido thus acquired promotes the synthesis and development of the conscious attitude, whereby a new conception of the world is gradually built up. The undoubted advantages gained by this process naturally consolidate this attitude. It is, therefore, not surprising that the psychology of our time is characterized by a prevailingly unfavorable attitude toward the unconscious. It is not only intelligible, but absolutely necessary, that all sciences have excluded both the standpoints of feeling and of fantasy. There are sciences for that very reason. But how does it stand with psychology? If it is to be regarded as a science, it must do the same. But will it then do justice to its material? Every science ultimately seeks to formulate and express its material in abstractions. Thus psychology could, and indeed does, lay hold of the processes of feeling, sensation, and fantasy in the form of intellectual abstractions. This treatment certainly establishes the right of the intellectual abstract standpoint, but not the claims of other quite possible psychological points of view. The other possible standpoints can obtain only a bare mention in a scientific psychology. They cannot emerge as the independent principles of a science. Science, under all circumstances, is an affair of the intellect, and the other psychological functions are submitted to it in the form of objects. The intellect is sovereign of the scientific realm, but it is another matter when science steps across into the realm of practical application. The intellect, which was formerly king, is now merely a resource, a scientifically perfected instrument, it is true, but still only an implement, no more the aim itself, but merely a condition. The intellect, and with it science, is now placed at the service of creative power and purpose. Yet this is still psychology, although no longer science. It is a psychology in a wider meaning of the word, a psychological activity of a creative nature, in which creative fantasy is given priority. Instead of using the term creative fantasy, it would be just as true to say that in practical psychology of this kind, the leading role is given to life. For on the one hand, it is undoubtedly fantasy, procreating and productive, which uses science as a resource. But on the other, it is the manifold demands of external reality which prompt the activity of creative fantasy. Science, as an end in itself, is assuredly a high ideal, but its accomplishment brings about as many ends in themselves as there are sciences and arts. Naturally, this leads to a high differentiation and specialization of the particular functions concerned, but it also leads to their aloofness from the world and from life, and an inevitable multiplication of specialized terrains which gradually lose all connection with each other. The result of this is an impoverishment and stagnation that is not merely confined to the specialized terrains, but also invades the psyche of the man, who is thus differentiated up or reduced down to the specialist level. By this token must science prove her value to life. It is not enough that she be mistress, she must also be the maid. By so doing, she in no way dishonors herself. Although science has already led us to recognize the disproportions and disorders of the psyche, thus deserving our profound respect for her intrinsic intellectual gifts, it is nevertheless a grave mistake to concede her an absolute aim which would incapacitate her for her métier as an instrument of life. For when we approach the province of actual living with the intellect and its science, we realize at once that we are in a confined space that shuts us out from other, equally real provinces of life. We are, therefore, compelled to acknowledge the universality of our ideal as a limitation, and to look around us for a spiritus rector, which from the standpoint and claims of a complete life, can offer us a greater guarantee of psychological universality than the intellect alone can compass. When Faust exclaims, feeling is everything, he is expressing merely the antithesis to the intellect, and therefore only reaches the other extreme. He does not achieve that totality of life and of his own psyche in which feeling and thought are joined in a third and higher principle. This higher third, as I have already indicated, can be understood either as a practical goal or as the fantasy which creates the goal. This aim of totality can be recognized neither by the science, whose end is in itself, nor by feeling, which lacks the faculty of vision belonging to thought. 
the one must lend itself as auxiliary to the other yet the contrast between them is so great that we need a bridge this bridge is already given us in creative fantasy it is not born of either for it is the mother of both nay further it is pregnant with the child that final aim which reconciles the opposites if psychology remains only a science we do not reach life we merely serve the absolute aim of science it leads us certainly to a knowledge of the actual state of affairs but it always resists every other aim but its own the intellect remains imprisoned in itself just so long as it does not willingly sacrifice its supremacy through its recognition of the value of other aims it recoils from the step which takes it out of itself and which denies its universal validity since from the standpoint of intellect everything else is nothing but fantasy but what great thing ever came into existence that was not first fantasy just in so far as the intellect rigidly adheres to the absolute aim of science is it insulated from the springs of life it interprets fantasy as nothing but a wish dream wherein is expressed that depreciation of fantasy which for science is both welcome and necessary it is inevitable that science should be regarded as an absolute aim so long as the development of science is the sole question at issue but this at once becomes an evil when it is a question of life itself demanding development thus it was an historical necessity in the christian process of culture that unfettered fantasy activity should be kept under and similarly though for different reasons it was also a necessity that fantasy should be suppressed in our age of natural science it must not be forgotten that creative fantasy if not restrained within just bounds can also degenerate into a most pernicious luxuriance but these bounds are never those artificial limitations set by the intellect or by reasonable feeling they are boundaries governed by necessity and incontestable reality the tasks of every age differ and it is only in retrospect that we can discern with certainty what had to be and what should not have been in the momentary present the conflict of convictions always predominates for war is the father of all history alone decides truth is not eternal it is a program the more eternal a truth the more it is lifeless and worthless it tells us nothing more because it is self-evident how fantasy is assessed by psychology so long as this remains merely a science is beautifully exemplified in the well-known views of freud and of adler the freudian interpretation reduces it to causal primitive instinctive processes adler's conception reduces it to the final elementary aims of the self the former is an instinctive psychology the latter an ego psychology instinct is an impersonal biological phenomenon a psychology which is founded upon instinct must by its nature neglect the ego since the ego owes its existence to the principium individuatonis that is to individual differentiation whose sporadic and individual character at once removes it from the category of general biological phenomena although general biological instinct forces make the moulding of personality possible individuality is nevertheless essentially different from general instincts indeed it stands in the most direct opposition to them just as the individual is as a personality always distinct from the collective its essence consists precisely in this distinction what every ego psychology must therefore exclude and ignore is just the collective element that is essential to instinct psychology for it is describing the very ego process which is differentiated from collective instincts the characteristic animosity between the representatives of the two standpoints arises from the fact that either standpoint necessarily involves a depreciation and lowering of the other for so long as the radical difference between instinct and ego psychology is not realized either side must naturally hold its respective theory to be universally valid this does not mean to say that instinct psychology for example could not put up a theory of the ego process it can do so very ably but in a form and manner which to the ego psychologist looks too much like the negative of his theory hence we find that with freud the ego instincts do indeed occasionally emerge but in the main they support a very modest existence with adler on the other hand it would seem as though sexuality were the merest vehicle which in one way or another serves the elementary aims of power the adlerian principle is the safeguarding of personal power which is superimposed upon the general instincts with freud it is the instinct that makes the ego serve its purposes so that the ego appears as a mere function of instinct within both types the scientific tendency prevails to reduce everything to its own principle from which their deductions again proceed with fantasies this operation is accomplished with particular ease since these unlike the functions of conscience which are adapted to reality and have therefore an objectively oriented character express both instinctive as well as ego tendencies 
it is not difficult for the man who adopts the standpoint of instinct to discover in them the wish fulfillment and the infantile wish and repressed sexuality but the man who judges from the standpoint of the ego can just as easily discover those elementary aims concerned with the safeguarding and differentiation of the ego since fantasies are intermediary products between the ego and the general instinct they accordingly contain elements of both sides interpretation from either side is always therefore somewhat forced and arbitrary because one character is always suppressed nevertheless a demonstrable truth does on the whole appear but it is only a partial truth which can make no claim to general validity its validity extends just so far as the range of its principle but in the province of other principles it is invalid the freudian psychology is characterized by one central idea namely the repression of incomparable wish tendencies man appears as a bundle of wishes which are only partially adaptable to the object his neurotic difficulties consist in the fact that milieu influences educational and objective conditions are a considerable check upon a free expression of instinct influences are derived from father and mother either morally hindering or infantile which tend to produce fixations that compromise later life the original instinctive constitution is an unalterable quantity which suffers disturbing modifications mainly through objective influences hence the most untrammeled possible expression of instinct towards the suitably chosen object would appear to be the needful remedy conversely adler's psychology is characterized by the central idea of ego superiority the individual appears preeminently as an ego point which must under no circumstances be subjected to the object while with freud the craving for the object the fixation to the object and the impossible nature of certain desires toward the object play an important role with adler everything aims at the superiority of the subject freud's repression of instinct toward the object becomes with adler the safeguarding of the subject with him the healing remedy is the removal of the isolating safeguard with freud it is the removal of the repression that renders the object inaccessible hence with freud the basic formula is sexuality which expresses the strongest relation between subject and object with adler it is that power of the subject which most effectively ensures him against the object and gives to the subject an unassailable isolation which amputates every relation freud would vouchsafe the instincts an unfettered excursion toward their objects but adler would break through the inimicable spell of the object in order to deliver the ego from suffocation in its own defensive armor the former view must therefore be essentially extroverted while the latter is introverted the extroverted theory holds good for the extroverted type while the introverted theory is valid only for the introverted type in so far as the pure type is a quite one-sided product of development it is also necessarily unbalanced overemphasis upon the one function is synonymous with repression of the other psychoanalysis fails to resolve this repression just in so far as the particular method applied is oriented according to the theory of its own type thus the extrovert in accordance with his theory will reduce his fantasies as they emerge from the unconscious to their instinct content but the introvert will reduce them to his power tendency the gain accruing from such analysis goes to the already existing predominance this kind of analysis therefore merely intensifies the already existing type and by such means no mutual understanding or mediation between the types is made possible on the contrary the gap is widened both without and within an inner dissociation arises because fragments of other functions occasionally arising to the surface in unconscious fantasies dreams and so forth are depreciated and again repressed on these grounds a certain critic was in a measure justified when he described freud's as a neurotic theory but the truth of the statement cannot justify a certain malevolence in expression which only serves to absolve one from the duty of serious concentration upon the problems raised the standpoints both of freud and of adler are equally one-sided and are therefore characteristic of only one type both theories reject the principle of imagination since they reduce fantasies and treat them as merely semiotic expression but in reality fantasies mean more than that for they represent also the other mechanism thus with the introverted type they represent repressed extroversion and with the extroverted repressed introversion but the repressed function is unconscious hence undeveloped embryonic and archaic in this condition it is not to be reconciled with the higher nouveau of the conscious function the inacceptable nature of fantasy is principally derived from this peculiarity of the unrecognized function root 
imagination, for everyone to whom adaptation to external reality is the leading principle, is for these reasons something objectionable and useless. And yet we know that every good idea and all creative work is the offspring of the imagination, and has its source in what one is pleased to term infantile fantasy. It is not the artist alone, but every creative individual whatsoever, who owes all that is greatest in his life to fantasy. The dynamic principle of fantasy is play, which belongs also to the child, and as such it appears to be inconsistent with the principle of serious work. But without this playing with fantasy, no creative work has ever yet come to birth. The debt we owe to the play of imagination is incalculable. It is therefore short-sighted to treat fantasy, on account of its daring or inacceptable character, as of small account. It must not be forgotten that it is just in the imagination that the most valuable promise of a man may lie. I say may advisedly, because on the other hand fantasies are also valueless, since in the form of raw material they possess no sort of realizable worth. In order to unearth the valuable treasure they contain, a development is needed. But this development is not achieved by a simple analysis of the fantasy material. A synthetic treatment is also needed by means of a constructive method. It remains an open question whether the opposition between the two standpoints can ever be satisfactorily adjusted intellectually. Although in one sense Abelard's attempt must be profoundly respected, yet practically no consequences worth mentioning have matured from it for he was able to establish no mediatory psychological function beyond conceptualism or sermonism, which is merely a revised edition, altogether one-sided and intellectual, of the ancient Logos conception. The Logos, as a mediator, had this advantage over the sermo, inasmuch as in his human manifestation he also did justice to non-intellectual aspirations. I cannot, however, rid myself of the impression that Abelard's brilliant mind, which so fully grasped the great yea and nay, would never have remained satisfied with his paradoxical conceptualism, thus renouncing all claim to creative effort, if the impelling force of passion had not been lost to him through the tragedy of fate. In confirmation of this idea, we need only compare conceptualism with the way in which the great Chinese philosophers Lao Tse and Chong Tzu, as also the poet Schiller, confronted this problem. End of section 8. Recording by Olivia. Section 9 of Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines. Section 9, Chapter 1, Section 5. The Holy Communion Controversy Between Luther and Zwingli Of the latter antagonisms which stirred men's minds, Protestantism and the Reformation movement should really receive our first consideration. Only this phenomenon is of such complexity that it must first be resolved into many separate psychological processes before it can become an object for analytical elucidation. But that lies outside my province. I must therefore content myself by selecting a single case from that great arena namely the Holy Communion controversy between Luther and Zwingli. The transubstantiation dogma, already mentioned, was sanctioned by the Lateran Council of 1215, and from that time formed an established article of faith, in which form Luther himself grew up. Although the notion that a ceremony and its concrete practice can have an objective redeeming value is really quite unevangelical, since the evangelical movement was actually directed against Catholic institutions, Luther was nevertheless unable to free himself from the immediately effective sensuous impression in the taking of bread and wine. He perceived in it not merely a token, but the actual sensuous reality with its contingent and immediate experience. These were for him an indispensable religious necessity. He therefore claimed the actual presence of the body and blood of Christ in the communion. In and beneath bread and wine, he received the body and the blood of Christ, for him, the religious meaning of the immediate objective experience was so great that his imagination was spellbound by the concretism of the material presence of the sacred body. All his attempts at explanation are, therefore, under the spell of this fact, the body of Christ is present, albeit non-spatially. According to the so-called doctrine of consubstantiation, the actual substance of the sacred body was also really present beside the substance of the bread and wine. The ubiquity of Christ's body 
which this assumption postulated, an idea involving considerable distress to human intelligence, was indeed substituted by the concept of voli presence, which means that God is everywhere present where he wills to be. But Luther, untroubled by all these difficulties, held unflinchingly to the immediate experience of the sensuous impression, and preferred to assuage all the scruples of human reason with explanations which were either absurd or, at best, quite unsatisfying. It is hardly credible that it was merely the power of tradition which determined Luther to cling to this dogma, for he assuredly gave abundant proof of his ability to throw aside traditional forms of belief. Indeed, we should not go far wrong in assuming that it was rather the actual contact with the real and material in the communion, and the feeling significance of this contact for Luther himself that prevailed over the evangelical principle which maintained that the word was the sole vehicle of grace and not the ceremony. With Luther the word certainly had redeeming power, but the partaking of the communion was also a transmitter of grace. This, I repeat, must have been only an apparent concession to the institutions of the Catholic Church, for in reality it was the acknowledgment, demanded by Luther's psychology, of the fact of feeling grounded upon the immediate sense experience. As against the Lutheran standpoint, Zwingli represented the purely symbolic conception. What really concerned him was a spiritual partaking of the body and blood of Christ. This standpoint has the character of reason. It is a conceptual attitude to the ceremony. It has the merit that it offers no violence to the evangelical principle, and at the same time it avoids all hypotheses that run counter to reason. This conception, however, does little justice to the thing which Luther wished to preserve, namely, the reality of the sense impression and its peculiar feeling value. Zwingli, it is true, also administered the communion, and with Luther also partook of bread and wine. Nevertheless, his conception contained no formula which could have adequately rendered the unique sensational and feeling value of the object. Luther gave a formula for this, but it was opposed to reason and the evangelical principle. To the standpoint of sensation and feeling, this matters little, and indeed rightly, for the idea, the principle, is just as little concerned about the sensation of the object. Both points of view are, in the last resort, mutually exclusive. The Lutheran formation favors the extroverted conception of things, while Zwingli has the conceptual standpoint. Although Zwingli's formula does no violence to feeling and sensation, but merely gives a conceptual formulation, and appears furthermore to have left room for the efficacy of the object, yet it seems as though the extroverted standpoint is not content with an open space, but demands also a formulation in which the conceptual follows the sensuous value, exactly as the conceptual formulation requires the subservience of feeling and sensation. At this point, with the consciousness of having given merely a statement of the problem, I close this chapter on the principle of types in the history of classic and medieval thought. I am not sufficiently competent to be able to treat so difficult and voluminous a problem in any way exhaustively. If I have been successful in conveying to the reader an impression of the existence of typical differences of standpoint, my purpose has been achieved. I need scarcely add that I am aware that none of the material here touched upon has been conclusively dealt with. I must bequeath this task to those who command a fuller knowledge of this province than myself. End of section 9. Recording by Olivia. Section 10 of Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Hilton Godwin Baines. Section 10. Chapter 2. Schiller's Ideas Upon the Type Problem. Part 1. Letters on the Ascetic Education of Man A. The Superior and the Inferior Functions So far as my somewhat limited range extends, Frederick Schiller seems to have been the first to have made any considerable attempt at a conscious discrimination of typical attitudes, and to have developed a fairly complete presentation of their singularities. This important endeavor to represent the two mechanisms in question, and at the same time to discover a possibility of their reconciliation, is to be found in his treatise first published in 1795, Über die ascetische Erziehung des Menschen. The paper consists of a number of letters which Schiller addressed to the Duke of Holstein Augustenburg. Schiller's essay, by the depth of its thought, the psychological penetration of its material, 
and his wide vision of the possibility of a psychological solution of the conflict prompts me to a somewhat extensive presentation and appreciation of his ideas, for never yet has it fallen to their lot to be treated in such a connection. The merit due to Schiller from our psychological viewpoint, as will become clear in our further discussion, is by no means inconsiderable, for he gives us developed points of view which we, as psychologists, are just beginning to appreciate. My responsibility will, of course, not be light, for it may well happen that I shall be accused of giving a construction to Schiller's ideas which his actual words do not warrant. For, although I shall take considerable pains, at every essential point, to quote the actual words of the author, yet it may not be altogether possible to introduce his ideas in the connection I intend to establish here without giving them certain interpretations or constructions. I am obliged not to overlook this possibility, but, on the other hand, we must bear in mind the fact that Schiller himself belongs to a definite type, and is therefore constrained, even in spite of himself, to deliver a one-sided characterization. The limitation of our conceptions and cognition becomes nowhere so apparent as in psychological presentations, where it is almost impossible for us to trace any other picture than that whose main outlines are already marked out in our own psyche. From various characterizations, I conclude that Schiller belongs to the introverted type, while Goethe inclines more to the extroverted side. We can easily trace Schiller's own image in his description of the idealistic type. An inevitable limitation is imposed upon his formulation through this identification, a fact which must never be lost sight of in our effort to gain a fuller understanding. This limitation is to be ascribed to the fact that the one mechanism is presented by Schiller in richer outline than the other, for the latter is still imperfectly developed in the introvert, and just because of its imperfect development, it must necessarily have certain inferior characters clinging to it. In such cases, the presentation of the author demands our criticism and correction. It is clear, too, that this limitation of Schiller's has also prompted him to use a terminology which fails in general applicability. As an introvert, Schiller has a better relation to ideas than to things of the world. The relation to ideas can be relatively more emotional or reflective, according to whether the individual belongs more to the feeling or to the thinking type. At this point, I would request the reader, who perhaps may have been led by my earlier publications, to identify feeling with extroversion and thinking with introversion, would be good enough to bear in mind the definitions furnished in the last chapter. With the introverted and extroverted types, I have there distinguished two general classes of men, which can be further subdivided into function types, that is, thinking, feeling, sensational, and intuitive. Hence, an introvert can be a thinking or a feeling type, since feeling as well as thinking can come under the supremacy of the idea, just as both, in given cases, can be ruled by the object. If I then consider that Schiller, both in his nature and particularly in his characteristic opposition to Goethe, corresponds with the introvert, the question next arises as to which subdivision he belongs. This question is hard to answer. Without doubt, the factor of intuition plays a considerable role with him. We might, on this account, or if we were regarding him exclusively as a poet, count him as an intuitive type. But, in the Letters on Aesthetic Education, it is undoubtedly Schiller the thinker who confronts us. Not only from these, but also from his own repeated admissions, we know how strong the reflective element was in Schiller. Consequently, we must shift his intuitiveness over towards the side of thinking, so that we may also approach him from this other angle, that is, from our understanding of the psychological viewpoint of an introverted thinking type. It will, I hope, be sufficiently proved hereafter that this conception coincides with reality, for there are not a few passages in Schiller's writings that speak distinctly in its favor. I would, therefore, request the reader to bear in mind that the hypothesis I have just outlined underlies my whole argument. This is, in my opinion, necessary, because Schiller handles the problem from the angle of his own inner experience. In view of the fact that another psychology, that is, another type, would have apprehended the problem in quite another form, the highly general formulation which Schiller gives to it might be regarded in the nature of an encroachment or as an ill-considered generalization. But such a judgment would be incorrect, 
since there is actually a large class of men for whom the problem of the differentiated functions is precisely the same as it was for Schiller. If, therefore, in the ensuing argument, I occasionally emphasize Schiller's one-sidedness and subjectivity, I do not wish to detract from the importance and validity of the problem he has raised, but rather to make room for other formulations. Such criticisms as I may occasionally offer, therefore, are intended rather as a transcription into a form of expression which disembarrasses Schiller's formulation of its subjective limitations. My argument, nevertheless, clings very closely to Schiller's, since it is concerned much less with the general question of introversion and extroversion, which in Chapter 1 exclusively engaged our attention, than with the typical conflict of the introverted thinking type. Schiller concerns himself at the very outset with the question of the cause and origin of the bifurcation of the two mechanisms. With sure instinct, he hits upon the differentiation of the individual as the basic motive. Quote, it was culture itself which dealt this wound to the modern man. End quote. This one sentence at once shows Schiller's embracing understanding of our problem the breaking up of the harmonious cooperation of the psychic forces that exists in instinctive life is like an ever-open and never-healing wound, a veritable amfortus wound, since the differentiation of one function among several inevitably leads to overgrowth of the one and to neglect and crippling of the rest. Quote, I do not ignore the advantages, says Schiller, which the present generation, regarded as a whole and measured by reason, may boast over what was best in the bygone world, but it must enter the contest as a compact phalanx and measure itself as whole against whole. What individual modern could enter the lists, man against man, and contest the prize of manhood with an individual Athenian? Whence, then, arises this unfavorable individual comparison in the face of every advantage from the standpoint of the race? End quote. Schiller places the responsibility for this decline of the modern individual upon culture, that is, upon the differentiation of functions. He next points out how, in art and scholarship, the intuitive and the speculative minds have become estranged, and how each has zealously excluded the other from its respective field of application. Quote, and with the sphere into which man confines his operation, he has also made unto himself a ruler which fact not infrequently results in the suppression of his other faculties, whereas in the case of the former, the luxuriating power of imagination makes a wilderness of the laborious plantations of the mind, in the latter the spirit of abstraction consumes the fire that should have warmed the heart and kindled fantasy. End quote. And further, quote, when the commonwealth makes the office or function the measure of the man, when of its citizens it does homage only to the memory in one, to a tabulating intelligence in another, and to a mechanical capacity in a third, when here, regardless of character, it urges only towards knowledge, while there it encourages a spirit of order and law-abiding behavior with the profoundest intellectual obscurantism, when, at the same time, it wishes these single accomplishments of the subject to be carried to just as great an intensity as it absolves him of extensity, is it to be wondered at that the remaining faculties of the mind are neglected in order to bestow every care upon the special one which it honors and rewards? End quote. In these thoughts of Schiller, there lies much weight. It is understandable that Schiller's age, whose imperfect knowledge of the Grecian world appraised the man of Greece by the greatness of his bequeathed works, should thereby overestimate him beyond all bounds, inasmuch as the peculiar beauty of Grecian art owed its existence in no small measure to its contrast with the milieu from which it arose. The advantage of the Greek consisted in the fact that he was less differentiated than the modern, if indeed one is disposed to regard that as an advantage. For the disadvantage of such a condition must at least be equally obvious. The differentiation of functions is assuredly no product of human caprice. Its origin, like that of everything in nature, was necessity. Could one of these modern admirers of the Grecian heaven and Arcadian bliss have visited the earth as an Attic helot, he might well have surveyed the beauties of the land of Greece with rather different eyes. Even were it the fact that the primitive conditions of the 5th century before Christ yielded the individual a greater possibility for an all-round unfolding of his qualities and capacities, this nevertheless was possible 
only because thousands of his fellow men were admittedly cramped and crippled in wretched circumstances. A high level of individual culture was undoubtedly reached by certain figures, but a collective culture was quite unknown to the ancient world. This achievement was reserved for Christianity. Hence it comes about that, as a mass, the moderns can not only rival the Greeks, but by every standard of collective culture they easily surpass them. Schiller, on the other hand, is perfectly right in his contention that our individual has not kept pace with our collective culture, and it has certainly not improved during the 120 years that have passed since Schiller wrote. Rather, the reverse. For if we had not wandered even farther into the collective atmosphere to the prejudice of individual development, the violent reactions which took shape in the mind of a Stirner or a Nietzsche would scarcely have been required. Still today, therefore, Schiller's words must remain both timely and valid. Like the ancients, who, with a view to individual development, catered for the claims of an upper class by an almost total suppression of the great majority of the common people, helots and slaves, the subsequent Christian world reached a condition of collective culture through an identical process, albeit translated as far as possible into the individual sphere, or raised to the subjective level as we might prefer to express it. While the value of the individual was proclaimed to be an imperishable soul by the Christian dogma, it became no longer possible for the inferior majority of the people to be suppressed for the freedom of a superior minority. But now the superior function was preferred over the inferior functions in the individual. In this way, the chief importance was transferred to the one valued function, to the prejudice of all the rest. Psychologically, this meant that the external form of society in antique civilization was translated into the subject, whereby in individual psychology, an inner condition was produced which had been external in the older civilization, namely, a dominating preferred function which became developed and differentiated at the expense of an inferior majority. By means of this psychological process, a collective culture gradually came into existence in which the Trotz del Homme certainly had an immeasurably greater guarantee than with the ancients. But it had this disadvantage, that it depended upon a subjective slave culture, that is, upon a transfer of the antique majority enslavement into the psychological sphere, whereby collective culture was undoubtedly enhanced, while individual culture depreciated. Just as the enslavement of the mass was an open wound in the antique world, the enslavement of the inferior function is an ever-bleeding wound in the soul of man today. Quote, One-sidedness in the exercise of his powers leads in the individual infallibly to error, but in the race to truth, end quote, says Schiller. The favoritism of the superior function is just as serviceable to society as it is prejudicial to the individuality. This prejudicial effect has reached such a pitch that the great organizations of our present-day civilization actually strive for the complete disintegration of the individual, since their very existence depends upon a mechanical application of the preferred individual functions of men. It is not man that counts, but his one differentiated function. Man no longer appears as man in collective civilization. He is merely represented by a function. Nay, further, he is even exclusively identified with his function and denies any responsible membership to the other inferior functions. Thus, the modern individual sinks to the level of a mere function, because this it is that represents a collective value and alone affords a possibility of livelihood. But, as Schiller clearly discerns, differentiation of function could have come about in no other way. Quote, there was no other means to develop man's manifold capacities than to set them one against another. This antagonism of human qualities is the great instrument of culture. It is the only instrument, however, for so long as it endures, man is only upon the way to culture. End quote. According to this conception, the present state of warring capacities could not yet be a state of culture, but only a stage on the way. Opinion will, of course, be divided about this, for by culture one man will understand a state of collective culture, while another will merely regard this as civilization and will ascribe to culture the sterner demands of individual development. Schiller is, of course, mistaken when he exclusively allies himself with the second standpoint and contrasts our collective culture with that of the individual Greek, 
since he overlooks the defectiveness of the civilization of that time, which renders the absolute validity of that culture very questionable. Hence, no culture is ever really complete that swings toward a one-sided orientation. That is, when at one time the cultural ideal is extroverted, the chief value being given to the object, and the objective relation, while at another the ideal is introverted, when the supreme importance lies with the individual, or subject, and his relation to the idea. In the former case, culture takes on a collective character, while in the latter, an individual. One can easily understand, therefore, that it was through the operation of the Christian sphere, whose principle is Christian love, and also through contrast association with its counterpart, which is to say, the violation of the individuality, that a collective culture came about in which the individual threatens to be swallowed up and individual values are depreciated on principle. Hence there arose in the time of the German classics that extraordinary yearning for the antique, which was for them a symbol of individual culture, and on that account was, for the most part, very much overvalued and often grossly idealized. Not a few attempts were even made to imitate or recapture the spirit of Greece, attempts which nowadays appear to us somewhat silly, but which nonetheless must be valued as the forerunners of an individual culture. In the hundred and twenty years which have passed since Schiller's time, conditions in respect to individual culture have become not better, but worse, since individual interest is today engrossed to a far greater extent in collective preoccupations, and therefore much less leisure is available for the development of individual culture. Hence, we possess today a highly developed collective culture, which in organization far exceeds anything that ever existed, but which for that very reason has become increasingly injurious to individual culture. There exists a deep gulf between what a man is and what he represents, that is, between the man as an individual and his function capacity as a collective being. His function is developed at the expense of his individuality. Should he excel, he is merely identical with his collective function. But should he not, then, although certainly esteemed as a function in society, he is, as an individuality, wholly on the side of his inferior, undeveloped functions, and therefore simply barbarous. Whereas the former has more fortunately deceived himself concerning his actual existing barbarism, this one-sidedness has undoubtedly yielded not inconsiderable advantages to society, which has thereby gained acquisitions that could have been won in no other way. As Schiller finally observes, quote, Only by focusing the whole energy of our mind and knitting together our entire nature in one unique faculty do we, as it were, give wings to this individual gift and bring it by artifice far beyond the limits which nature seems to have laid down for it. End quote. But this one-sided development must inevitably lead to a reaction, since the repressed inferior functions cannot be indefinitely excluded from common life and development. The time will come when the cleavage in the inner man must again be resolved, that the undeveloped may be granted an opportunity to live. I have already alluded to the fact that the differentiation of function in civilized development ultimately affects a dissociation of the basic functions of the psyche, thus, in a certain measure, transcending the differentiation of capacity and even encroaching upon the provenance of psychological attitude in general, which governs the whole manner and character of the application of capacity. By this means, culture affects a differentiation of that function which already enjoys a better development through heredity. In one man, it is the function of thought. In another, feeling, which is especially accessible to further development. Thus it happens that the urge of cultural demands engages the individual's special concern with the development of that capacity which nature has already intended as his most favorable line. But this capacity for development does not mean that the function has an a priori claim to any particular fitness. It merely presupposes, one might almost say, on the contrary, a certain functional delicacy, lability, and plasticity. On this account, the highest individual value is not by any means always to be sought or found in this function, but just insofar as it is developed for a collective end, it may possibly yield the highest collective value. But it may well be the case, as already observed, that far higher individual values lie hidden among the neglected functions, which, although of small importance for the collective life, 
are of the very greatest value to individual development. These, therefore, represent a living value which can endow the life of the individual with an intensity and beauty that he will vainly seek in his collective function. The differentiated function certainly procures for him the possibility of collective existence, but not that satisfaction and joy of life which the development of individual values alone can give. Their absence is often sensed as something deeply lacking, and the severance from them is like an inner division which, with Schiller, one might compare with a painful wound. Quote, Thus, however much may be gained for the world at large by the separate development of human capacities, it cannot be denied that the individuals affected by it suffer under the curse of this general aim. Athletic bodies are certainly built up by means of gymnastic exercises, but beauty is won only through the free and uniform play of the limbs. In the same way, the tension of individual mental powers can produce extraordinary men, but it is only the uniform temperature of the same that can give man happiness and fulfillment. And in what sort of relation should we stand to past and coming ages if the development of human nature compelled us to such a sacrifice? We would become the thralls of mankind. Thousands of years long for humanity's sake, we would be doing slave labor and have imprinted upon our crippled nature the shameful brand of this servitude, only that some later generation might nurse its moral health in blissful leisure and unfold the ample spread of its humanity. But can it be that man is destined for any aim whatsoever to neglect himself? Can nature with her aims rob us of that perfection which the aims of reason prescribe for us? It must therefore be false that the development of individual capacities necessitates the sacrifice of their totality, or, even if the law of nature still pressed towards such a goal, we must never relinquish that totality of our nature which cunning art has demolished, but which a still higher art may reestablish. End quote. It is evident that Schiller in his personal life had a profound sense of this conflict, and that it was just this antagonism in himself which begat a longing to seek that coherence and uniformity which should bring deliverance to the wasting and enslaved functions and a restoration of harmonious life. This is also the impelling motive in Wagner's Parsifal, where it receives symbolical expression in the restitution of the missing spear and the healing of the wound. What Wagner attempted to say in artistic, symbolic expression, Schiller labored to formulate in philosophical thought. Although it is nowhere frankly stated, the implication is clear enough that his problem revolves around the possibility of resuming the classical manner and conception of life, from which one is obliged to conclude that he either overlooks the Christian solution of his problem or deliberately ignores it. In any case, his mind is more focused upon classical beauty than upon the Christian doctrine of redemption, which, nevertheless, has no other aim but the solution of that self-same problem in which Schiller himself travailed, that is to say, the deliverance from evil. The heart of man is filled with raging battle, says Julian the Apostate in his discourse upon King Helios, and these words significantly mark his insight not only into his own problems, but into that of his whole time, namely, that inner laceration of the latter classical epoch which found its outward expression in an unexampled chaotic confusion of hearts and minds and from which the Christian doctrine promised deliverance. What Christianity gave was, of course, not a solution, but a redemption, a detachment of one valuable function from all the other functions which, at that time, made an equally peremptory claim for its share in government. Christianity gave one definite direction, to the exclusion of every other possible direction. This may have been the essential reason why the possibility of salvation that Christianity offered was passed by Schiller in silence. The pagans' near contact with nature seemed to promise just that possibility which Christianity did not offer. Quoting Schiller again, Nature, in her physical creation, shows us the way which man has to travel in the moral world. Not until the battle of elemental forces is spent in the lower organizations does she mount to the noble form of physical man. In the same way, this elemental strife in the ethical man, this conflict of blind instincts, must first be assuaged. Man must end the crude antagonism in himself before he can venture to unfold his own diversity. Upon the other hand, the independence of his character must be assured, and submissiveness to strange despotic forms have given place to a decent freedom before man may subject the diversity in himself to the unity of the ideal. End quote. Thus, it is not to be a detachment or redemption of the inferior function, 
but an acknowledgement of it, a coming to terms with it, as it were, which reconciles the opposites upon the natural way. But Schiller feels that the acceptance of the inferior function might lead to a conflict of blind instincts, just as, only vice versa, the unity of the ideal might reestablish that priority of the superior over the inferior function, and thereby, once again, precipitate the original state of affairs. The inferior functions are opposed to the superior, not so much in their essential nature, but as a result of their actual, momentary form. They were originally neglected and repressed because they hindered civilized man in the attainment of his aims. But these correspond with one-sided interests and are by no means synonymous with the consummation of human individuality. If this were the aim, these unacknowledged functions would be indispensable. And, as a matter of fact, their nature does not contradict such an end. But, so long as the goal of culture does not coincide with the ideal of individuality, these functions are also subjected to a depreciation, which means a decline into relative repression. The conscious acceptance of the repressed functions is synonymous with civil war, or with the unlocking of previously coupled antitheses, whereby independence of character is immediately abolished. This independence can be reached only by a settlement of this conflict, which appears to be impossible without despotic jurisdiction over the antagonizing forces, but thereby freedom is compromised, without which the constitution of a morally free personality is inconceivable. But if one preserves freedom, one is delivered over to the conflict of instincts. Quoting Schiller again, Upon the one hand, in his recoil from liberty, who in her first essays ever wears the semblance of an enemy, man will throw himself into the arms of a comfortable servitude, while upon the other, reduced to despair by a pedantic tutelage, he will escape into the wild unrestraint of the state of nature. Usurpation will evoke the weakness of human nature, while insurrection its dignity, until finally blind force, the great sovereign of all human affairs, will intervene and, like a common pugilist, decide the ostensible battle of principles. End quote. The contemporary revolution in France gave to this statement a living, albeit a bloody, background. Begun in the name of philosophy and reason, with loftily soaring idealism, it ended in a bloodthirsty chaos from which arose the despotic genius of Napoleon. The goddess of reason proved herself powerless against the might of the unchained beast. Schiller feels the defeat of reason and truth, and therefore has to postulate that truth itself shall become a force. Quote, if she has hitherto evinced so little of her conquering power, the fault lies not so much with the intellect that knew not how to unveil her, as with the heart that shut her out, and with the instinct that did not work for her. Then whence this still prevailing prejudice, this intellectual darkness, beside all the light enthroned by philosophy and experience? The age is enlightened, knowledge has been found, and is publicly accessible. This should at least suffice to correct our practical principles. The spirit of free research has destroyed the illusions which so long barred the approach to truth. It has undermined the ground upon which fanaticism and fraud had built their thrones. Reason has purged herself of sense delusion and false sophistries. Even philosophy, which at first made us desert her, calls us with loud insistence back to the bosom of nature. Whence comes it, then, that we are still barbarians? End quote. In these words of Schiller, we can feel the nearness of the French Enlightenment and the fantastic intellectualism of the Revolution. The age is enlightened. What a strange overvaluation of the intellect. The spirit of free research has destroyed the illusions. What rationalism! One is vividly reminded of the words of the procto fantasmists Vanish! We have enlightened! If, on the one hand, men of that time were too fain to overestimate the importance and efficacy of reason— quite forgetting that if reason really possessed such a power, she had long had the amplest opportunity to manifest it. On the other hand, the fact must not be overlooked that not all of the authoritative minds of that time held this view. Consequently, this soaring of a rationalistic intellectualism may well have sprung from an especially strong subjective development of this element in Schiller himself. In him we have to reckon with a predominance of the intellect, not at the expense of his poetic intuition, but at the cost of feeling. To Schiller himself, it seemed as though there were a perpetual conflict between imagination and abstraction, that is, between intuition and intellect. Thus he writes to Goethe, on the 31st of August, 1794, quote, This it is which gave me, especially in early years, 
a certain awkwardness both in speculation and in the realm of poetry. As a rule, the poet would overtake me when I would be the philosopher, and the philosophic spirit would hold me when I would be the poet. Even yet it happens often enough that imaginative power disturbs my abstraction, and cold reasoning my poetry. End quote. His extraordinary admiration of Goethe's mind, and his almost feminine appreciation of his friend's intuition, to which he often gives expression in his letters, rests upon a penetrating perception of this conflict, which must have seemed redoubled in himself in contrast to the almost completely synthetic nature of Goethe. This conflict was due to the psychological circumstance that the energy of feeling gave itself in equal measure both to the intellect and to the creative imagination. Schiller seems to have appreciated this fact, for in the same letter to Goethe, he makes the observation that no sooner has he begun to know and to use his moral forces, which should apportion reasonable limits to the rival claims of imagination and intellect, than a physical illness threatens to shatter them, for it is the characteristic, already frequently alluded to, of an imperfectly developed function, that it withdraws itself from conscious disposition, and with its own impetus, that is, with a certain autonomy, becomes unconsciously implicated with other functions, whereby, without any sort of differentiated choice, it behaves as a purely dynamic factor. It might well be described as an impetus or reinforcement which lends the conscious differentiated function the character of being carried away or coerced so that, in one case, the conscious function is seduced beyond the limits set by purpose and decision. In another, it is held up before the attainment of its goal and led away upon a bypath, while, in a third case, it is brought into conflict with the other conscious functions, a conflict which remains unresolved so long as the unconsciously implicated and disturbing instinctive force is not differentiated in its own right and subjected as such to a certain conscious disposition. Thus one is almost driven to assume that the cry, whence comes it then that we are still barbarians, is no mere reflection of the spirit of that age, but also springs from Schiller's subjective psychology. Like other men of his time, he too sought the root of the evil in the wrong place, for at no time did barbarism consist in a state where reason or truth have an insufficient effect. It appears only when man expects such an effect from them, or, we might even say, it is because man provides reason with too much efficacy from a superstitious overvaluation of truth. Barbarism is one-sidedness, lack of moderation, bad proportion generally. In the impressive example of the French Revolution, which had just then reached the culminating point of terror, Schiller could see to what extent the goddess of reason held sway in man, and how far the unreasoning beast was triumphant. It was doubtless these events of Schiller's epoch which urged the problem upon him with a special force, for it frequently happens that, when a problem that is at bottom personal, and therefore apparently subjective, impinges upon outer events which contain the same psychological element as the personal conflict, it is suddenly transformed into a general question that embraces the whole of society. In this way, the personal problem gains a dignity that was hitherto wanting, since a state of inner discord has an almost mortifying and degrading quality so that one sinks into a humiliated condition both without and within, like a state dishonored by civil war. It is this that makes one shrink from displaying before a larger public a purely personal conflict, provided, of course, that one does not suffer from an overdaring self-esteem. But when it happens that the connection between the personal problem and the larger contemporary events is discerned and understood, a relativity is established that promises release from the isolation of the purely personal. In other words, the subjective problem is amplified to the dimensions of a general question of our society. This is no small gain as regards the possibility of a solution. For, whereas the rather meager energy of conscious interest in one's own person was hitherto the only source available for the personal problem, there is now assembled the combined forces of collective instinct, which flow in and unite with the interests of the ego. Thus, a new situation is brought about which offers new possibilities of a solution. For what would never have been possible to personal will or courage is made possible by the force of collective instinct. It bears a man over obstacles which his own personal energy could never overcome. We are therefore prompted to conjecture that it was largely the impressions of contemporary events that gave Schiller the courage to undertake this attempt to solve the conflict between the individual and the social function. The same antagonism was also deeply sensed by Rousseau. Indeed, it was the starting point of his work, Emile de l'Education, of 1762. 
Several passages are to be found in it which have interest for our problem, given in translation. Quote, man as a citizen is only a fractional unity dependent upon a denominator, and his value lies in his relation with the whole, which is society. Those institutions are good which best understand how to change the nature of man, how to take from him his absolute existence unto himself and give him a relative one, how, in short, to translate the ego to a common unity. He who wishes to preserve in his life as a citizen the supremacy of natural feelings knows not what he wants ever in contradiction with himself, ever hovering between his inclinations and his duties, he will become neither man nor citizen. He will be useless both to himself and others. End quote. Rousseau opens his work with the famous sentence, again in translation, Everything as it leaves the hands of the author of things is good. Everything degenerates under the hands of man. End quote. This statement is characteristic, not for Rousseau alone, but for that whole epoch, End of section 10. Section 11 of Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Hilton Godwin Baines. Section 11. Chapter 2. Schiller's Ideas Upon the Type Problem. Part 2. Letters on the Ascetic Education of Man. A. The Superior and the Inferior Functions. Schiller also turns back, not of course to Rousseau's natural man, and here lies an essential difference, but to the man who lived under a Grecian heaven. But the retrospective orientation that is common to both is inextricably bound up with an idealization and overvaluation of the past. Schiller, in the wonder of pagan art, forgets the actual everyday Greek. Rousseau mounts to dizzying heights, losing himself in such phrases as, again in translation, Natural man is holy himself. He is an integral unity, an absolute whole. End quote. Whereby he overlooks the fact that the natural man is wholly collective, that is, just as much in others as in himself, and is everything else besides a mere unity. In another passage, Rousseau says, quote, We cling to everything. We clutch on to all times, places, men, things. All that is and all that will be matters to each of us. Our individual self is only the least part of ourselves. Each extends, as it were, over the whole earth, and become sensitive to this whole vast surface. Is it nature which thus bears men so far from themselves? End quote. Rousseau deceives himself. He believes this state to be a recent development. But this is not so. Granted, it has only recently become conscious to us. It nonetheless always existed, and it reveals itself all the more vividly the further we descend into the origins. For what Rousseau depicts is nothing but that primitive collective mentality which Levi Brühl has aptly termed participation mystique. This state of suppression of the individuality is no new acquisition, but a residue of that archaic time when there was no individuality whatsoever. What we are dealing with is not, therefore, a recent suppression, but merely a new sense and awareness of the overwhelming power of the collective. One naturally projects this power into political and ecclesiastical institutions, as though there were not already ways and means enough for the evasion of even moral commands when occasion suited. In no way have these institutions that presumed omnipotence, for which they are from time to time assailed by innovators of every sort, the suppressing power lies unconsciously in ourselves, namely, in our own barbarian element with its primitive collective mentality, to the collective psyche, every individual development is obnoxious, which does not directly serve the ends of collectivity. Hence, the differentiation of the one function mentioned above, although certainly a development of an individual value, is still so largely conditioned by the viewpoint of collectivity that the individual himself, as we have already seen, actually suffers from this development. Both authors have to thank their imperfect acquaintance with earlier conditions of human psychology for their lapse into false judgments upon the values of the past. 
The result of this false judgment is a belief in the illusory picture of an earlier, more perfect type of man who somehow fell from his high estate. Backward orientation is in itself a relic of pagan thinking, for it is a well-known characteristic of the whole classic and barbaric mentality that it imagined a paradisiacal age as a golden forerunner of the present evil time. It was the great social and educational act of Christianity which first gave man a future hope, assuring him of a future possibility for the realization of his ideals. The stronger note of this retro-orientation in the more recent intellectual movements may be connected with the appearance of that general regression towards the pagan, which with the Renaissance made itself increasingly manifest. It seems to me certain that this retrogressive orientation must also have a definite influence upon the means selected for human education. For a mind thus oriented is ever seeking support in some phasmagoria in the past. We could make light of this if the knowledge of the conflict between the types and the typical mechanisms were not constantly urging us to seek for that which could re-establish their unity. As we may see in the following passages, this goal had also a profound interest for Schiller. His fundamental idea about it is expressed in the following words, which indeed actually sum up what has just been said. Quote, Let a benevolent deity snatch in time the suckling from his mother's breast, nourish him with the milk of a better age, and let him ripen to maturity under that far Grecian heaven. Then, when he is become a man... Let him return, a strange figure, into his own century, but not that he may delight it with his appearance, but terrible, like Agamemnon's son, to purify it. End quote. The leaning towards the Grecian model could scarcely be more clearly expressed, but in this narrow formulation one can also glimpse a limitation, which in the following paragraph urges him to a very essential amplification, for he continues, quote, His material will he indeed take from the present, but his form he will borrow from an older age, yea, from beyond all ages, from the absolute, unchangeable unity of his being. End quote. Schiller clearly felt that he must go back still further into some primeval, heroic age where men were still half divine. He therefore continues quote, Here, from the pure ether of his demonic nature, wells forth the source of beauty, untainted by the depravity of the generations and epochs, which whirl in troubled eddies far below. End quote. Here is ushered in the lovely phantom of a golden age when men were still gods and were constantly refreshed with the vision of eternal beauty. But here, too, the poet has overtaken the thinker in Schiller. A few pages further on, the thinker again gets the upper hand. Quote, the fact, says Schiller, must cause one to reflect that in almost every epoch of history, when the arts blossomed and taste ruled, one finds that humanity declined. Furthermore, not one single example can be shown of a people where a high level and a wide universality of ascetic culture went hand in hand with political freedom and civic virtue, or where beautiful manners went with good morals, or polished behavior with truth. End quote. According to this familiar and in every way undeniable experience, those heroes of olden days must have pursued a none too scrupulous conduct of life, which, moreover, no single myth either Grecian or otherwise, maintains. Beauty could still delight in her existence, for as yet there was neither penal code nor guardian of public morals. With the recognition of the psychological fact that living beauty unfolds her golden splendor only when soaring above a reality of gloom, torment, and squalor, Schiller's particular aim is undermined, for he had undertaken to prove that what was separated would be reconciled by the vision, enjoyment, and creation of the beautiful beauty was to be the mediator which should restore the primal unity of human nature. But, nevertheless, all experience goes to show that beauty needs her opposite as a necessary condition of her existence. As before it was the poet, it is now the thinker that possesses Schiller. He mistrusts beauty. He even holds it possible, arguing from experience, that she may exercise an unfavorable influence. Quote, Wherever we turn our eyes into the world of the past, we find taste and freedom fleeing one another, and beauty establishing her sovereignty only upon the ruins of the heroic virtues. End quote. This insight, which is the product of experience, can hardly sustain the claim that Schiller makes for beauty. In the further pursuit of his theme, he even reaches a point where he abstracts the reverse of beauty with an all too enviable clarity. Quote, Thus, if one's view about the effect of beauty is entirely influenced by what one learns from all bygone experience, 
one cannot be greatly encouraged in the work of educating feelings, which proved to be so dangerous to the true culture of man. And, in spite of the danger of crudity and hardness, man is wiser to forego the softening power of beauty than, with every advantage of refinement, to be delivered over to her enervating influence. End quote. The matter between the poet and the thinker would surely allow of adjustment if the thinker took the words of the poet not literally but symbolically, which is how the tongue of the poet desires to be understood. Can Schiller have misunderstood himself? It would almost seem so. Otherwise he could not argue thus against himself. The poet sings of a spring of unsullied beauty which flows beneath every age and generation and is constantly swelling in every human heart. It is not the man of ancient Greece the poet means but the old pagan in ourselves. That piece of eternal, unspoiled nature and natural beauty which lies unconscious but living within us, whose reflected splendor transfigures the shapes of former days, and for whose sake we even embrace the error that those distant men actually possess the beauty which we are seeking. It is the archaic man in ourselves who, rejected by our collectively orientated consciousness, appears to us as hideous and inacceptable, but who is nevertheless the bearer of that beauty which, which we elsewhere unavailingly seek. This is the man the poet Schiller means, but the thinker Schiller mistakes him for his Grecian prototype. But what the thinker cannot logically deduce from all his massed material, and at which he labors in vain, the poet, in symbolical language, reveals to him as a promised land. It is now sufficiently clear from all that has been said that every attempt at an adjustment of the one-sided differentiation of the human being of our times has to reckon with the serious acceptance of the inferior, because undifferentiated, functions. No attempt at mediation will succeed which does not understand how to release the energies of the inferior functions and to lead them over into differentiation. This process can take place only in accordance with the laws of energetics. That is, a potential must be created which offers the latent energies a possibility of coming into play. It would be a hopeless task, which nevertheless has been often undertaken, and as often foundered, to transform an inferior function directly into a superior one. It would be as easy to make a perpetual mobile. No inferior form of energy can be simply converted into a superior form unless at the same time a source of higher value lends its support. That is, the conversion can be accomplished only at the expense of the superior function, but under no circumstances can the initial value of the superior energy form be attained by the inferior function or resumed once more by the superior function. A leveling at some intermediate temperature must inevitably result. But for every individual who identifies himself with his one differentiated function, this entails a descent to a condition that is certainly balanced, but of a definitely lower value, as compared with the apparent initial value. This conclusion is unavoidable. Every education of man, which aspires after the unity and harmony of his nature, has to deal with this fact. After his own manner, Schiller also draws this conclusion, but he struggles against accepting his results, even to the point where he has to renounce beauty. But when the thinker has uttered his ruthless judgment, the poet speaks again. Quote, but it may be that experience is no tribunal before which a question like this shall be decided. And before we give weight to its testimony, let all doubt be set at rest that the beauty we speak of, and that against which these examples testify, is one and the same. End quote. One sees that Schiller here attempts to take his stand above experience. In other words, he bestows upon beauty a quality which experience does not grant her. He believes that, quote, beauty must be proven a necessary condition of mankind, end quote. That is, a necessary, compelling category. He even speaks of a purely intellectual concept of beauty, and a transcendental way, quote, which shall take us out of the round of appearances and away from the living presence of things, who durst not go beyond reality will never vanquish truth, unquote. A subjective resistance to the experimental, inevitable, downward way prompts Schiller to suborn the logical intellect in the service of feeling, thus forcing it to construct a formula which would ultimately make possible the attainment of the original aim, notwithstanding the fact that its impossibility is already sufficiently exposed. A similar violence is committed by Rousseau in his assumption that, whereas dependence upon nature does not involve depravity, it does if one is dependent upon man, from which he arrives at the following conclusion. 
again in translation, quote, if the laws of nations, like those of nature, could have an inflexibility that no human force could ever vanquish, the dependence of men would become at once more like that of things. One could combine, in the Republic, all the advantages of the natural state with those of citizenship. One could add to the liberty, which exempts man from vice, the morality which raises him to virtue. End quote. Arising out of these reflections, he gives the following advice. Quote, Keep the child dependent solely upon things. You will have followed the order of nature in the progress of his education. Do not force a child to stay when it wants to go, or to go when it wants to stay quiet. When the will of our children is not spoiled by our own fault, they desire nothing that is useless. End quote. But the misfortune lies in this, that never, under any circumstances, do the laws of nations possess that admirable accord with the laws of nature which could enable the civilized to be at the same time a natural state. If such a settlement could be regarded as at all possible, it could be conceived only as a compromise wherein neither of the two conditions could attain its own ideal, but both would remain far below it. Whoever wishes to attain the ideal of either state will have to rest with a statement that Rousseau himself formulated. Quote, one must choose whether to make a man or a citizen, for at the same time one cannot make both. End quote. Both these necessities exist in ourselves, nature and culture. We cannot only be ourselves, we must also be related to others. Hence, a way must be found that is not a mere rational compromise. It must also be a state or process that wholly corresponds with the living being. It must be a semita et via sancta, as the prophet says a via directa it et stulti non errant per arm, that is, a highway, and the way of holiness, a straight way, so that fools shall not err therein. Isaiah 35, 8. I am therefore disposed to give the poet in Schiller his just due, although in this case he has encroached somewhat outrageously upon the province of the thinker. Since rational truths are not the last word, there are also irrational truths. In human affairs, what appears impossible upon the way of the intellect has very often become true upon the way of the irrational. Indeed, all the greatest changes that have ever affected mankind have come not by the way of intellectual calculation, but by ways which contemporary minds either ignored or rejected as absurd, and which only long afterwards became fully recognized through their intrinsic necessity. More often than not, they are never perceived at all for the all-important laws of mental development are still to us a seven-sealed book. I am, however, little disposed to grant any considerable value to the philosophical demeanor of the poet, for the intellect is a deceptive instrument in his hands. What the intellect can achieve, it has in this case already done, for it disclosed the contradiction between desire and experience. To persist, then, in demanding a solution of this contradiction from philosophical thinking would be quite useless and, even if a solution could finally be thought out, the real obstacle would still confront us, for the solution does not lie in the possibility of thinking it, or in the discovery of a rational truth, but in the revealing of a way which real life can accept. Propositions and wise precepts have indeed never been wanting. If it were only a question of these, even in the remote days of Pythagoras, man had the finest opportunity of reaching the heights from every direction. Therefore, what Schiller proposes must not be taken in a literal sense, but rather as a symbol, which, in harmony with Schiller's philosophical temperament, assumes the character of a philosophical concept. Similarly, the transcendent way, which Schiller sets out to tread, must not be understood as a cognitional raisonnement, but symbolically as that way which a man always follows when he encounters an obstacle immediately inaccessible to his reason, in a word, an insoluble task. But, before he is able to discover and follow this way, he must first abide a long time with the opposites into which his former way divided. The obstacle dams up the river of his life. Whenever such a damming up of libido occurs, the opposites, formerly united in the steady flow of life, fall apart, and henceforth oppose one another like antagonists eager for battle. In a prolonged conflict, the opposites become exhausted and, from the energy which goes out of them, is that third element created, which is the beginning of the new way. In accordance with this law, Schiller now devotes himself to a profound research of the actual opposites at work. Whatever the nature of the obstacle we may strike, provided only it be difficult, 
the cleavage between our own purpose and the contending object at once becomes a conflict in ourselves. For, inasmuch as I am striving to subordinate the contending object to my will, my whole being is gradually placed into relationship with it, corresponding, in fact, with the strong libido application, which, as it were, transveys a part of my being into the object. The result of this is a partial identification between certain portions of my personality and similar qualities in the nature of the object. As soon as this identification has taken place, the conflict is transferred into my own psyche. This introjection into myself of the conflict with the object creates an inner discord which gives rise to a certain impotence vis-à-vis -vis the object and also releases affects, which are always symptomatic of inner disharmony. But the affects prove that I am perceiving myself and am therefore in a situation, if I am not blind, to apply my own observation upon myself and to follow up the play of opposites in my own psyche. This is the way that Schiller takes. The division that he finds is not between the state and the individual, but in the beginning of the eleventh letter, he conceives it as the duality of person and condition, namely as the self or ego and its changing affectedness. Whereas the ego has a relative consistency, its relatedness, or affectedness, is variable. Schiller thus intends to seize the discord at the root. Actually, the one side is also the conscious ego function, while the other is the collective relationship. Both determinants belong to human psychology, but the various types will respectively see these basic facts in quite a different light. For the introvert, the idea of the self is doubtless the abiding and dominant note of consciousness and its antithesis for him is relatedness or affectedness. For the extrovert, on the contrary, much more stress is laid upon the continuity of the relation with the object, and less upon the idea of the self. Hence, for him, the problem is differently situated. We must hold this point in view and consider it more fully as we follow Schiller's further reflections. When, for instance, he says that the person reveals itself, quote, in the eternally constant self, and in this alone, end quote, this is viewed from the standpoint of the introvert. From the standpoint of the extrovert, on the other hand, we should say that the person reveals itself simply and solely in its relationship, that is, in the function of relation to the object, for only with the introvert is the person exclusively the ego. With the extrovert, the person lies in his affectedness and not in the affected self. His self is, as it were, of less importance than his affection, that is, his relation. The extrovert finds himself in the fluctuating and changeable, the introvert in the constant. The self is not eternally constant, least of all with the extrovert, for whom, as an object, it is a matter of small moment. To the introvert, on the other hand, it has too much importance. He therefore shrinks from every change that is at all liable to affect his ego. For him, affectedness can mean something directly painful, while to the extrovert it must on no account be missed. The following formulation immediately reveals the introvert. Quote, in every change to remain himself constant, referring every perception to experience, that is, to the unity of knowledge, and relating each of its varying aspects in his own time, to the law of all times, this is the command given him by his reasoning nature. End quote. The abstracting, self-contained attitude is evident. It is even made a supreme rule of conduct. Every occurrence must at once be raised to the level of experience and from the sum of experience a law for the future must also immediately emerge, whereas the other attitude, in which no experience shall be made from the occurrence lest laws might transpire which would hamper the future, is equally human. It is altogether in keeping with this attitude that Schiller cannot think of God as becoming, but only as eternally being. Hence, with unerring intuition, he also recognized the God-likeness of the introverted attitude towards the idea, quote, Man, presenting in his perfection, would be the constant unit, remaining eternally the same amid the floods of change. And man carries the divine disposition incontestably within his personality. End quote. This view of the nature of God agrees ill with his Christian incarnation and with those similar Neoplatonic views of the mother of the gods and of her son, who descends into creation as demiurgos. But it is clear from this view, to which function Schiller attributes the highest value, the divinity, that is to say, the constancy of the idea of the self. The self that is abstracted from affectedness is for him the most important thing, and hence, as the case with every introvert, this is the idea which he has chiefly developed. 
his God, his highest value, is the abstraction and conservation of the self. To the extrovert, on the contrary, God is the experience of the object, the fullest expansion into reality. Hence, a God who became human is to him more sympathetic than an eternal, immutable lawgiver. Here I must observe, in anticipation that these points of view should be regarded only as valid for the conscious psychology of the types. In the unconscious, the relations are reversed. Schiller seems to have had an inkling of this, although indeed his consciousness believes in an unchangingly existing God, yet the way to Godhood is revealed to him by the senses, hence in effectiveness, in the changing and living process. But this is, for him, the function of secondary importance, and, to the extent that he identifies himself with his ego and abstracts it from the changing process, his conscious attitude also becomes quite abstracted whereby the function of effectiveness or relatedness to the object perforce relapses into the unconscious. From this state of affairs, noteworthy consequences ensue. 1. From the conscious attitude of abstraction, which, in pursuit of its ideal, makes an experience from every occurrence, and from the sum of experience, a law, a certain constriction and poverty results, which is indeed characteristic of the introvert. Schiller clearly feels this in his relationship with Goethe, for he sensed Goethe's more extroverted nature as something objectively opposed to himself. Significantly, Goethe says of himself, quote, As a contemplative man, I am an errant realist. I find that among all the things which confront me, I am in the position of desiring nothing from them or added to them, and I make no sort of discrimination among objects beyond their interest for myself. End quote. Concerning Schiller's effect upon him, Goethe very characteristically says, quote, if I have served you as the representative of many objects, you have led me to a too intense observation of outer things and their relationships back into myself. You have taught me to view the many-sidedness of the inner man with finer equity, end quote, and so forth. Whereas in Goethe, Schiller finds an oft-times accentuated compliment or fulfillment of his own nature, at the same time sensing his difference, which he indicates in the following way, quote, Expect of me no great material wealth of ideas, for that is what I find in you. My need and endeavor is to make much out of little, and if ever you should realize my poverty in all that men call acquired knowledge, you will perhaps find that in many ways my aspiration has succeeded. Because my circle of ideas is smaller, I traverse it more quickly and oftener. I may, therefore, even make a better use of what small ready cash I own, creating a diversity through form which the contents lack. You strive to simplify your great world of ideas, while I seek variety for my small possessions. You have a kingdom to rule, and I only a somewhat numerous family of ideas, which I would fain to expand to a small universe." End quote. His letter to Goethe, August 31, 1794. If we abstract from this utterance a certain feeling of inferiority, characteristic of the introvert, and add to it the fact that the extrovert's great world of ideas is not so much under his rule as he himself is subject to it. Then Schiller's presentation gives a striking picture of the poverty which tends to develop as a result of an essentially abstract attitude. Number two, a further result of the abstracting, conscious attitude, and one whose significance will become more apparent in the further course of our investigation, is that the unconscious develops a compensating attitude. For the more the relation to the object is restricted by the abstraction of consciousness, because too many experiences and laws are made, all the more insistently does a craving for the object develop in the unconscious. This finally declares itself in consciousness as a compulsive, sensuous hold upon the object, whereupon the sensuous tie takes the place of a feeling relation to the object, which is lacking, or rather suppressed, through abstraction. Characteristically, therefore, Schiller regards the senses, and not the feelings, as the way to godhood. His ego lies with thinking, but his effectiveness, his feelings, with sensation. Thus with him, the schism is between spirituality as thinking and sensuousness as effectiveness or feeling. With the extrovert, however, matters are reversed. His relation to the object is developed, but his world of ideas is sensational and concrete. Sensuous feeling, or to put it better, the feeling that exists in the state of sensation, is collective. That is, it begets a state of relation or effectiveness which at the same time translates the individual into the condition of participation mystique, hence into a state of partial identity with the sensed object. This identity declares itself in a compulsory dependence upon the sensed object, and it is this which again prompts the introvert, after the manner of the circulus vitiosus, 
to an intensification of that abstraction which shall abolish both the burdensome relation and the compulsion it evokes. Schiller recognized this peculiarity of the sensuous feeling. Quote, so long as he merely senses, craves, and works from desire, man is still nothing more than the world. End quote. But since, in order to escape affectedness, the introvert cannot abstract indefinitely, he ultimately sees himself forced to shape the external world. Quote, that he may not be merely world, he must impart form to matter, says Schiller, and goes on, he shall externalize all within and shape everything without. End quote. Both tasks, in their highest achievement, lead back to the idea of divinity from which I started out. This connection is important. Let us suppose the sensuously felt object to be a man. Will he accept this prescription? Will he, in fact, permit himself to take shape as though the man to whom he is related were his creator? To play the god on a small scale is certainly man's vocation. But ultimately, even inanimate things have a divine right to their own existence, and the world long ago ceased to be chaos when the first man-apes began to sharpen stones. It would indeed be a serious business if every introvert wished to externalize his narrow world of ideas and to shape the external world accordingly. Such experiments happen daily, but the individual ego suffers, and very justly, for this godlikeness. For the extrovert, this formula should run to internalize all that is without and shape everything within. This reaction, as we saw just now, Schiller evoked in Goethe. Goethe gives a telling parallel to this. He writes to Schiller, quote, In every sort of activity I, on the other hand, am, one might almost say, completely idealistic. I ask nothing at all from objects, but instead I demand that everything shall conform to my conceptions, end quote. This means that when the extrovert thinks, things go just as autocratically as when the introvert operates externally. This formula, therefore, can hold good only where an almost complete stage has already been reached, when, in fact, the introvert has attained a world of ideas so rich and flexible and capable of expression that the object no longer forces him upon a procrustean bed, and the extrovert such an ample knowledge of, and consideration for, the object, that a caricature of it can no longer arise when he operates with it in his thinking. Thus we see that Schiller bases his formula upon the highest possible, and therefore makes an almost prohibitive demand upon the psychological development of the individual, assuming also that he is thoroughly clear in his own mind what his formula involves in every particular. Be that as it may, it is at least fairly clear that this formula, quote, to externalize all that is within and shape everything without, end quote, is the ideal of the conscious attitude of the introvert. It is based, on the one hand, upon the hypothesis of an ideal range of his inner world of concepts and formal principles, and, on the other, upon the possibility of an ideal application of the sensuous principle, which, in that case, no longer appears as effectiveness, but rather as an active power. So long as man is sensuous, he is nothing but world. That he may be not merely world, he must impart form to matter. Herein lies a reversal of the passive, enduring, sensuous principle. Yet how can such a reversal come to pass? That is the whole question. It can scarcely be assumed that a man can give to his world of ideas that extraordinary range which would be necessary in order to impose a congenial form upon the material world and, at the same time, convert his affectedness, his sensuous nature, from a passive to an active condition, thus bringing it to the heights of his world of ideas. Somewhere or other, man must be related, subjected, as it were, else would he be really godlike. One is forced to conclude that Schiller would let it reach a point at which violence was done to the object. But in so doing, he would concede to the archaic inferior function an unlimited right to existence, which, as we know, Nietzsche has actually done, at least theoretically. This assumption, however, is by no means conclusive with regard to Schiller, since, so far as I am aware, he has nowhere consciously expressed himself to this effect. His formula has instead a thoroughly naive and idealistic character a character withal quite consistent with the spirit of his time, which was not yet infected by that deep mistrust of human nature and human truth which haunted the epoch of psychological criticism inaugurated by Nietzsche. The Schiller formula could be carried out only by a power standpoint, applied without ruth or consideration, a standpoint with never a scruple about equity and reasonableness towards the object, nor any conscious examination of its own competence. Only under such conditions, which Schiller certainly never contemplated, could the inferior function also win a share in life. In this way, 
archaic, naive, and unconscious elements, though decked out in a glamour of mighty words and lovely gestures, ever came crowding through and assisted in the molding of our present civilization, concerning the nature of which humanity is at this point in some measure of disagreement. The archaic power instinct, which hitherto had hidden itself behind the gesture of culture, finally came to the surface in its true colors and proved beyond question that we are still barbarians. For it should not be forgotten that, in the same measure as the conscious attitude has a real claim to a certain god-likeness, by reason of its lofty and absolute standpoint, an unconscious attitude also develops, whose godlikeness is orientated downwards toward an archaic god whose nature is sensual and brutal. The Inantiodromia of Heraclitus forebodes the time when this Deus Absconticus shall also rise to the surface and press the god of our ideals to the wall. It was as though the men at the close of the 18th century had not really seen what that was which was taking place in Paris, but persisted in a certain aesthetical, enthusiastic, or trifling attitude that they might perchance delude themselves concerning the real meaning of that glimpse into the abysses of human nature. Quote, but in that netherworld is terror, and man tempteth not the gods, craving only that he may never, never see what they in pity veil with night and horror. End quote. Frau Schiller's Der Tach. When Schiller lived, the time for dealing with the underworld was not yet come. Nietzsche, at heart, was much nearer to it, for to him it was certain that we were approaching an epoch of great struggle. He it was, the only true pupil of Schopenhauer, who tore through the veil of naivete, and in his Zarathustra conjured up from that lower region ideas that were destined to be the most vital content of the coming age. End of section 11《Section 12 of Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation》by Carl Gustav Jung Translated by Heldon Godwin Baines Section 12 Chapter 2.2 a discussion of naive and sentimental poetry. For a long time it seemed to me as though Schiller's division of poets into naive and sentimental were a classification that harmonized with the points of view here expounded. After mature reflection, however, I have come to the conclusion that this is not so. Schiller's definition is very simple. The naive poet is nature, the sentimental poet seeks her. This easy formula is enticing, since it affirms two different kinds of relation to the object. It might also be put like this. He who seeks or desires nature as an object does not possess her. Such a man would be the introvert, and vice versa, he who already is nature herself, standing therefore in the most intimate relation with the object, would be the extrovert. But a rather arbitrary interpretation such as this would have little in common with Schiller's point of view. His division into naive and sentimental is one which, in contrast to our type division, is not merely concerned with the individual mentality of the poet, but rather with the character of his creative activity, that is, with its product. The same poet can be sentimental in one poem, naive in another. Homer certainly is naive throughout, but how many of the moderns are not, for the most part, sentimental? Evidently, Schiller feels this difficulty, and therefore asserts that the poet is conditioned by his time, not as an individual, but as a poet. Thus, he says, all poets who are really such will respectively belong to the naive or sentimental to the degree in which the quality of the age in which they flower or mere accidental circumstances exert an influence upon their general makeup and upon their passing emotional mood. Consequently, it is not a question of fundamental types for Schiller, but rather of certain characteristics or qualities of the individual product. Hence, it is at once obvious that an introverted poet on occasion can be just as naive as he is sentimental. It therefore follows that to identify respectively naive and sentimental with extrovert and introvert would be quite beside the point, 
insofar as the problem of types is concerned. Not so, however, insofar as it is a question of typical mechanisms. A. The naive attitude. I will first present the definitions which Schiller gives of this attitude. It has already been mentioned that the naive poet is nature. He simply follows nature and sensation and confines himself to the mere copying of reality. LC page 248. With naive representations we delight in the living presence of objects in our imagination. Page 250. Naive poetry is a boon of nature. It is a happy throw, needing no bettering when it succeeds, but fit for nothing when it has failed. Page 303. The naive genius must do everything through his nature. He can do little through his freedom. He will accomplish his idea only when nature works in him as an inner necessity. Page 304. Naive poetry is the child of life, and unto life it returns. Page 303. The naive genius depends wholly upon experience, upon the world with which he is in direct touch. He needs succor from without. Page 305. To the naive poet, the common nature of his surroundings can become dangerous, since sensibility is always more or less dependent upon the external impression and only a constant activity of the productive faculty, which is not to be expected of human nature, would be able to prevent mere material from committing him at times to a blind receptivity. But whenever this is the case, the poetic feeling will be commonplace. Page 307, FF. The naive genius allows nature unlimited sway in him. Page 314. From this definition, the dependence of the naive poet upon the object is especially clear. His relation to the object has a compelling character, because he interjects the object, i.e. unconsciously identifies himself with it, or has, as it were, a priori identity with it. Lévi Brühl describes this relation to the object as participation mystique. This identity is always derived from an analogy between the object and an unconscious content. One could also say that the identity comes about through the projection of an unconscious analogy association upon the object. An identity of this nature has always a compelling character, because it is concerned with a certain libido sum, which like every libido discharge working from the unconscious, has a compelling character in relation to the conscious, i.e. it is not disposable to consciousness. The naive attitude is therefore in a high degree conditioned by the object. The object operates independently in him as it were. It fulfills itself in him because he himself is identical with it. To a certain extent therefore he gives his function of expression to the object and presents it in a certain way, not in the least actively or intentionally, but because it is represented in him. He is himself nature. Nature creates in him the product. He allows nature to hold absolute sway in him. Supremacy is given to the object. To this extent is the naive attitude extroverted. B. The sentimental attitude. We mentioned above that the sentimental poet seeks nature. He reflects upon the impression objects make upon him. And upon that reflection alone is the emotion based with which he himself is exalted, and which likewise affects us. Here the object is related to an idea, and from this relation alone his poetic power is derived. L.C. page 249. He is always involved with two opposing presentations and sensations, with reality as a finite boundary and with his idea as an infinite. The mixed feelings that he provokes will always bear witness to this dual origin. Page 250 The sentimental mood is the result of the effort to reproduce the naive sensation in accordance with its content under the conditions of reflection. Page 301 Sentimental poetry is the product of abstraction. Page 303. 
As a result of his effort to remove every limitation from human nature, the sentimental genius is exposed to the danger of abolishing human nature altogether, not merely mounting, as he must and should, above every sort of defined and restricted reality to the farthest possibility, to idealize, in short, but even transcending possibility itself, in other words, to become fantastical. The sentimental genius forsakes reality in order to rise to the world of ideas and command his material with greater freedom. Page 314. It is easy to see that the sentimental poet, in contrast with the naive, is characterized by a reflective and abstract attitude towards the object. He reflects about the object because he is abstracted from it. Thus he is, as it were, severed from the object a priori, as soon as his production begins. It is not the object that works in him, but he himself is operative. He does not, however, work inwardly into himself, but outwardly beyond the object. He is distinct from the object, not identical with it. He seeks to establish his relation to it, to command his material. Proceeding from this, his separateness from the object, there comes that impression of duality which Schiller refers to. For the sentimental poet creates from two sources, namely from the object or from his perception of it and from himself. The external impression of the object is for him not something unconditioned but material which he handles in accordance with his own contents. Hence he stands above the object and yet has a relation to it, it is not, however, the relation of impressionability, but of his own free choice he bestows a value or quality upon the object. His is, therefore, an introverted attitude. With the designation of these two attitudes as introverted and extroverted, we have not, however, exhausted Schiller's idea. Our two mechanisms are basic phenomena of a rather general nature, which only vaguely outline the specific. For the understanding of the naive and sentimental types, we must call two further principles to our aid, namely the elements sensation and intuition. I shall discuss these functions in greater detail at a later stage. I only wish to say at this point that the naive is characterized by a preponderance of the sensational element, the sentimental by the intuitive. Sensation fastens to the object. It even draws the subject into the object. Hence, for the naive type, the danger consists in his subjection to the object. Intuition, being a perception of one's own unconscious processes, withdraws from the object. It mounts above it, ever seeking to command its material, and to shape it even violently in accordance with the subjective viewpoint, though without awareness of the fact. The danger for the sentimental type, therefore, is a complete severance from reality, and a going under into the fluid fantasy world of the unconscious. C. The Idealist and the Realist In the same essay, Schiller's reflections lead him to a conception of two psychological human types. He says, This brings me to a very remarkable psychological antagonism, among men in an age of progressive civilization. An antagonism which, because it is radical and rooted in the innate emotional constitution, is the cause of a sharper cleavage among men than the accidental quarrel of interest could ever bring about. An antagonism which robs the poet and artist of all hope of making a universal appeal, although this is his task, which makes it impossible for the philosopher in spite of every effort to be universally convincing, yet nonetheless this is involved in the very idea of a philosophy, and which finally will never permit a man in practical life to see his mode of action universally applauded. In short, an opposition which is responsible for the fact that no work of the mind and no deed of the heart can make a decisive success with one class without thereby drawing upon it a condemnation from the other. This opposition is, without doubt, as old as the beginning of culture, and to the end it can hardly be otherwise, 
save in rare individual subjects, such as have always existed and it is to be hoped will always exist. But although this lies in the very nature of its operation, that it frustrates every attempt at an adjustment, because no section can be brought to see either a deficiency upon its own side or a reality upon the other, it is nevertheless always a sufficient gain to follow up such an important division to its final source, and thus at least to bring the actual point at issue to a simpler formulation. End of quote. It follows conclusively from this passage that through the observation of antagonistic mechanisms, Schiller arrived at the conception of two psychological types which claim the same significance in his presentation as I ascribe to the introvert and extrovert. With regard to the mutual relation between the two types established by myself, I can endorse almost word for word what Schiller says of his. Schiller, in harmony with what I pointed out earlier, reaches the type from the mechanism, since he, quote, severs alike from the naive and sentimental character a poetic quality that is common to both, end quote. If we carry out this operation, we shall have to subtract the gifted creative character. Then, to the naive poet, there remains the hold to the object and its autonomy in the subject, while to the sentimental there remains the superiority over the object, which is expressed in a more or less arbitrary judgment or treatment of the object. Schiller says, After this there remains of the former, the naive, nothing else, theoretically, but a dispassionate spirit of observation, and a solid dependence upon the equable testimony of the senses, and, practically, a resigned submission to the necessity of nature. Of the sentimental character there remains nothing but a restless spirit of speculation which insists upon the unconditioned in all cognitions, and in practice a moral severity which insists upon the absolute in every act of will. Whoever counts himself among the former class can be called a realist, and whoever numbers himself with the latter an idealist." End quote. Schiller's further elaborations concerning his two types refer almost exclusively to the familiar phenomena of the realistic and idealistic attitudes, and are therefore without interest for our investigation. End of section 12. Section 13 of Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Jung Translated by Helton Godwin Baines Section 13, Chapter 3 The Apollonian and the Dionysian The problem discerned and indeed partially worked out by Schiller was resumed in a fresh and original way by Nietzsche in his work Die Geburt der Tragödie, dating from 1871. This early work is more nearly related to Schopenhauer and Goethe than to Schiller. But it at least appears to share aesthetism and Hellenism with Schiller, pessimism and the motive of deliverance with Schopenhauer, and unlimited points of contact with Goethe's Faust. Among these connections, those with Schiller are naturally the most significant for our purpose. Yet we cannot leave Schopenhauer without paying tribute to the way in which he achieved reality for those dawning rays of Eastern knowledge which in Schiller only emerge as insubstantial wraiths. If we disregard the pessimism that springs from a contrast with the Christian joy in faith, and certainty of redemption, Schopenhauer's doctrine of deliverance is seen to be essentially Buddhistic. He was captured by the East. This step was undoubtedly a contrast reaction to our Occidental atmosphere. It is, as we know, a reaction that still persists to a very considerable extent in various movements more or less completely orientated towards India. This pull towards the East caused Nietzsche to halt in Greece. 
he too felt Greece to be the middle point between East and West. To this extent he is in touch with Schiller, but how utterly different is his conception of the Grecian character. He sees the dark foil upon which the serene and golden world of Olympus is painted. Quote, in order to make life possible, the Greeks from sheer necessity had to make these gods. The Greek knew and felt the terror and awfulness of existence. To be able to live at all, he had to interpose the shining, dream-born Olympian world between himself and that dread. That monstrous mistrust of the titanic powers of nature, the Moira pitilessly enthroned above all knowledge, the vulture of Prometheus, the great lover of man, the awful fate of the white Oedipus, the family curse of the Atrida, which drove Orestes to matricide, this dread was ever being conquered anew through that artist's middle world of Olympus, or was at least veiled and withdrawn from sight. End quote. The Greek serenity, that smiling heaven of Hellas, seen as a glamorous illusion hiding a forbidding background. This discernment was reserved for the moderns, a weighty argument against moral aestheticism. Nietzsche here takes up a standpoint differing significantly from Schiller's. What one might have guessed in Schiller, namely that his letters on aesthetic education were also an attempt to deal with his own problems, becomes a complete certainty in this work of Nietzsche. It is a quote-unquote profoundly personal book. Whereas Schiller, almost timidly and with faint colors, begins to paint light and shade, apprehending the opposition in his own psyche as naive versus sentimental, whilst excluding everything that belongs to the background and abysmal profundities of human nature, Nietzsche's apprehension takes a deeper grasp and spans an opposition whose one aspect yields in nothing to the dazzling beauty of the Schiller vision, while its other side reveals infinitely darker tones, which certainly enhance the effect of the light, but allow still blacker depth to be divined. Nietzsche calls his fundamental pair of opposites the Apollonian Dionysian. We must first try to picture to ourselves the nature of this opposite pair. To this end, I shall select a group of citations by means of which the reader, even though unacquainted with Nietzsche's work, will be in a position to form his own judgment about it and at the same time to criticize mine. 1. We shall have gained much for the science of aesthetics when the view is once finally reached not merely the logical insight, but the immediate certainty that the continuous development of art is bound up with the duality of the Apollonian and the Dionysian, in much the same way as generation depends upon the duality of the sexes, involving perpetual conflicts with only periodically intervening reconciliation. Page 21. 2. From their two art deities, Apollo and Dionysus, we derive our knowledge that an immense opposition existed in the Grecian world, both as to origin and aim, between the art of the shaper, the Apollonian, and the Dionysian non-plastic art of music. These two so different tendencies run side by side, for the most part in open conflict with each other, ever mutually rousing the other to new and mightier births in which to perpetuate the warring antagonism that is only seemingly bridged by their common term art, until finally, by a metaphysical miracle of the Hellenic will, they appear paired one with the other, and in this mating the equally Dionysian and Apollonian creation of Attic tragedy is at last brought to birth. Page 22. For the purpose of fuller characterization, Nietzsche compares the two tendencies by means of the peculiar psychological states they give rise to, namely dreaming and frenzy. The Apollonian impulse, 
produces a state that may be compared with the dream, while the Dionysian creates a condition that is akin to frenzy. By dreaming, as Nietzsche himself explains, he essentially understands the inner vision, the lovely semblance of the dream world. Apollo governs the beauteous illusion of the inner world of fantasy. He is the god of all shaping faculties. He is measure, number, limitation, the mastery of everything savage and untamed. One might almost describe Apollo as the splendid divine image of the Principi Individuationis, page 26. The Dionysian other country is the freeing of unmeasured instinct, the breaking loose of the unbridled dynamis of the animal and the divine nature. Hence, in the Dionysian choir, man appears as satyr, god above and goat below. It represents horror at the annihilation of the principle of individuation, and at the same time rapturous delight at its destruction. The Dionysian is therefore comparable to frenzy, which dissolves the individual into collective instincts and contents, a disruption of the secluded ego by the world. In the Dionysian, therefore, man again finds man, estranged, hostile, subjugated nature celebrates once more her feast of reconciliation with her lost son, man. Page 26. Every man feels himself one with his neighbor, not merely united, reconciled, and merged. His individuality must therefore be entirely suspended. Man is no longer the artist, he has become the work of art. All the artistry of nature, he reveals itself in the ecstasies of frenzy. Page 27. Which means that the creative dynamis, the libido in instinctive form, takes possession of the individual as an object and uses him as a tool or expression of itself. If one might conceive the natural being as a product of art, then of course a man in the Dionysian state has become a natural work of art. But inasmuch as the natural being is also emphatically not a work of art in the ordinary meaning of the word, he is nothing but sheer nature, unbridled, a raging torrent, not even an animal that is restricted to itself and its own laws. I must emphasize this point both in the interest of clarity and of subsequent discussion, since for some reason Nietzsche has omitted to make this clear, and has thereby shed over the problem a deceptive aesthetic veiling, which at certain places he himself has instinctively to draw aside. Thus, for instance, where he speaks of the Dionysian orgies, quote, In almost every case the essence of these festivals lay in an exuberant sexual license, whose waves inundated every family hearth with its venerable traditions. The most savage beasts of nature were here unchained, even to the point of that disgusting alloy of lust and cruelty, end quote, etc., page 30. Nietzsche considers the reconciliation of the Delphic Apollo with Dionysius as a symbol of the reconciliation of this antagonism within the breast of the civilized Greek. But here he forgets his own compensatory formula, according to which the gods of Olympus owe their splendor to the darkness of the Grecian soul. The reconciliation of Apollo with Dionysus would, according to this, be a beauteous illusion, a desideratum evoked by the need of the civilized half of the Greek in the war with his barbaric side, that very element which broke out unchecked in the Dionysian state. Between the religion of a people and its actual mode of life, there always exists a compensatory relation. If this were not so, religion would have no practical significance at all. Beginning with the sublime moral religion of the Persians coexisting with the notorious dubiousness, even in antiquity, of the Persian manner of life, right down to our quote-unquote Christian epoch, where the religion of love assisted in the greatest butchery of the world's history, wherever we turn we find evidence of this rule. 
We may therefore conclude from this very symbol of the Delphic reconciliation an especially violent cleavage in the Grecian character. This would also explain that craving for deliverance which gave the mysteries their immense meaning for the social life of Greece, and which moreover was completely overlooked by earlier admirers of the Grecian world. They contented themselves with naively attributing to the Greeks what they themselves lacked. Thus, in the Dionysian state, the Greek was anything but a work of art. On the contrary, he was gripped by his own barbaric nature, robbed of his individuality, dissolved into all his collective constituents, made one with the collective unconscious, through the surrender of his individual goal, identified with the genius of the race, even with nature herself. To the Apollonian side, which had already achieved a substantial domestication of nature, this frenzied state that made a man forget both himself and his manhood and turned him into a mere creature of instinct must have been altogether despicable. For this reason, a violent conflict between the two instincts was inevitable. Supposing the instincts of civilized men were let loose, the culture enthusiast imagines that only beauty would stream forth. Such a notion proceeds from a profound lack of psychological knowledge. The damned-up instinct forces in civilized men are immensely more destructive and hence more dangerous than the instincts of the primitive, who in a modest degree is constantly living his negative instincts. Consequently, no war of the historical past can rival a war between civilized nations in its colossal scale of horror. It will not have been otherwise with the Greeks. It was precisely from a living sense of the gruesome that the Dionysian-Apollonian reconciliation gradually came to them, through a metaphysical miracle, as Nietzsche says at the beginning. This utterance, as well as that other where he says that the opposition in question is only seemingly bridged by their common term art, must be kept clearly in mind. It is well to remember this sentence in particular, because Nietzsche, like Schiller, has a pronounced inclination to ascribe to art the mediating and redeeming role. The result is that the problem remains stuck in the aesthetic. The ugly is also quote-unquote beautiful. Even the evil and atrocious may wear a desirable brilliance in the false glamour of the aesthetically beautiful. Both in Schiller and Nietzsche, the artist nature, with its specific faculty for creation and expression, is claiming the redeeming significance for itself. And so Nietzsche quite forgets that in this battle between Apollo and Dionysus, in their ultimate reconciliation, the problem for the Greeks was never an aesthetic but a religious question. The Dionysian satyr feasts, according to every analogy, were a sort of totem feast with an identification backward to mystical ancestry or directly to the totem animal. The cult of Dionysus had in many ways a mystical and speculative tendency, and in any case exercised a very strong religious influence. The fact that Greek tragedy arose out of the original religious ceremony is at least as significant as the connection of our modern theater with the medieval passion play, with its exclusively religious roots. Such a consideration, therefore, scarcely permits the problem to be judged on its purely aesthetic aspect. Aesthetism is a modern glass, through which the psychological mysteries of the cult of Dionysus are seen in a light in which they were certainly never seen or experienced by the ancients. With Nietzsche, as with Schiller, the religious point of view is entirely overlooked, and its place is taken by the aesthetic. These things have their obvious aesthetic side, which one cannot neglect. Footnote. Aesthetism can, of course, replace the religious function. But how many things are there which could not do the same? What have we not all come across at one time or another as a surrogate for a lacking religion? Even though aesthetism may be a very noble surrogate, it is nonetheless only a compensatory structure in place of the real thing that is wanting. 
Moreover, Nietzsche's later quote-unquote conversion to Dionysus shows very clearly that the aesthetic surrogate did not stand the test of time. And a footnote. Yet, if one gives medieval Christianity a purely aesthetic appreciation, its true character is debased and falsified, just as much indeed as if it were viewed exclusively from the historical standpoint. A true understanding can emerge only when equal weight is given to all sides. No one would wish to maintain that the nature of a railway bridge is adequately comprehended from a purely aesthetic angle. In adopting the view, therefore, that the conflict between Apollo and Dionysus is purely a question of antagonistic art tendencies, the problem is shifted into aesthetic grounds in a way that is both historically and materially unjustifiable, whereby it is submitted to partial consideration which can never do justice to its real content. This shifting of the problem must doubtless have its psychological cause and purpose. One need not seek far for the advantages of this procedure. The aesthetic estimation immediately converts the problem into a picture which the spectator considers at his ease, admiring both its beauty and its ugliness, merely reflecting the passion of the picture and safely removed from any actual participation in its feeling and life. The aesthetic attitude shields one from being really concerned, from being personally implicated, which the religious understanding of the problem would entail. The same advantage is ensured to the historical manner of approach which Nietzsche himself criticizes in a series of unique passages. The possibility of taking such a prodigious problem, a problem with horns, as he calls it, merely aesthetically, is of course very tempting, since its religious understanding, which in this case is the only adequate one, presupposes an experience either now or in the past to which the modern man can indeed rarely pretend. Dionysius, however, seems to have taken vengeance upon Nietzsche. Let us compare his attempt at a self-criticism, which bears the date 1886 and prefaces the birth of tragedy. Quote, what indeed is Dionysian? In this book there lies the answer. A knowing one speaks there, the initiate and disciple of his God. End quote. But that was not the Nietzsche who wrote The Birth of Tragedy. At that time he was moved aesthetically, while he became Dionysian only at the time of writing Zarathustra, not forgetting that memorable passage with which he concludes his attempt at a self criticism. Quote, Lift up your hearts, my brother, high, higher, and neither forget the legs. Lift up also your legs, ye good dancers, and better still, let ye also stand on your heads. End quote. In spite of his aesthetic self protection, the singular depth with which Nietzsche grasped the problem was already so close to the reality that his later Dionysian experience seems an almost inevitable consequence. His attack upon Socrates in The Birth of Tragedy is aimed at the rationalist who proves himself impervious to Dionysian orgiastics. This reaction corresponds with the analogous error into which the aesthetic standpoint always falls, i.e. it holds itself aloof from the problem. But even at that time, in spite of the aesthetic viewpoint, Nietzsche had an intuition of the real solution of the problem, as for instance when he wrote that the antagonism was not bridged by art, but by a metaphysical miracle of the Hellenic will. He writes will in inverted commas, which, considering how strongly he was at that time influenced by Schopenhauer, we might well interpret as referring to the concept of the metaphysical will. Metaphysical has for us the psychological significance of unconscious. If then we replace metaphysical in Nietzsche's formula by unconscious, the desired key to this problem would be an unconscious miracle. A miracle is irrational. The act itself, therefore, is an unconscious, irrational happening, a shaping out of itself without the intervention of reason and conscious purpose. 
It just happens, it grows, like a phenomenon of creative nature, and not as a result of the deep probing of human wits. It is the fruit of yearning expectation, faith, and hope. At this point I will leave this problem for the time being, as we shall have occasion to discuss it in fuller detail in the further course of our inquiry. Let us proceed instead to a closer examination of the Apollonian and Dionysian conceptions with regard to their psychological attributes. First we will consider the Dionysian. The presentation of Nietzsche at once reveals it as an unfolding, a streaming upward and outward, a diastole, as Goethe called it. It is a motion embracing the world, as Schiller also presents it in his Ode an die Freude. Sei umschlungen Millionen, diesen Kuss der ganzen Welt. Footnote. Be embraced, O ye millions. Be this kiss for all the world. And a footnote. And further. Freude trinken alle Wesen an den Brüsten der Natur. Alle Guten, alle Bösen folgen ihrer Rosenspur. Küsse gab sie uns und Reben, einen Freund geprüft im Tod. Wollust war dem Wurm gegeben, und der Kerub steht vor Gott. Footnote. Joy doth every creature drink at nature's flowing bosom. Neither good nor evil shrink to tread her path of blossom. Kisses and the wine she gave, a friend when death commandeth. Lust was for the worm to have, for God the cherub standeth. End of footnote. That is Dionysian expansion. It is a flood of mightiest universal feeling, which bursts forth irresistibly, intoxicating the senses like strong wine. It is a drunkenness in the highest sense. In this state, the psychological element, sensation, whether it be sensation of sense or of effect, participates in the highest degree. It is a question, therefore, of an extraversion of those feelings which are inextricably bound up with the element of sensation. For this reason we define it as feeling sensation. What breaks forth in this state has more the character of pure effect, something instinctive and blindly compelling, finding specific expression in an affection of the bodily sphere. In contrast to this, the Apollonian is a perception of the inner image of beauty, of measure, of controlled and proportioned feelings. The comparison with the dream clearly indicates the character of the Apollonian attitude. It is a state of introspection, of inner contemplation towards the dream world of eternal ideas. It is therefore a state of introversion. So far the analogy with our mechanisms is indeed unarguable. But, if we were to content ourselves with the analogy, we should acquiesce in a limitation of outlook that does violence to Nietzsche's ideas. We should have laid them in a Procrustean bed. We shall, in the course of our investigation, see that the state of introversion, in so far as it becomes habitual, always involves a differentiated relation to the world of ideas, while habitual extroversion entails a similar relation to the object. We see nothing of this differentiation in Nietzsche's ideas. The Dionysian feeling has the thoroughly archaic character of affective sensation. It is not therefore pure feeling, abstracted and differentiated from the instinctive into that mobile element which in the extroverted type is obedient to the commands of reason lending itself as her willing instrument. Similarly, Nietzsche's conception of introversion is not concerned with that pure, differentiated relation to ideas which is abstracted from perception, whether sensuously determined or creatively achieved, into abstract and pure form. The Apollonian is an inner perception, an intuition of the world of ideas. The parallel with the dream clearly shows that Nietzsche regarded this state as a merely perceptive condition on the one hand and as a merely pictorial one on the other. These characteristics are individual peculiarities, 
which we must not include in our concept of the introverted or extroverted attitude. In a man whose prevailing attitude is reflective, this Apollonian state of perception of inner images produces an elaboration of the material perceived in accordance with the character of the individual thought. Hence proceed ideas. In a man of a predominantly feeling attitude, a similar process results. A searching feeling into the images and an elaboration of a feeling idea, which may essentially correspond with the idea produced by thinking. Ideas, therefore, are just as much feeling as thought. For example, the idea of the fatherland, of freedom, of God, of immortality, etc. In both elaborations, the principle is rational and logical. But there is also a quite different standpoint, from which the logical rational elaboration is not valid. This other standpoint is the aesthetic. In introversion, it stays with the perception of ideas. It develops intuition, the inner perception. In extroversion, it stays with sensation and develops the senses, instinct, affectedness. Thinking, for such a standpoint, is in no case the principle of inner perception of ideas, and feeling just as little. Instead, thinking and feeling are mere derivatives of inner perception or outer sensation. Nietzsche's ideas, therefore, lead us on to the principles of a third and a fourth psychological type, which one might term the aesthetic, as opposed to the rational types, thinking and feeling. These are the intuitive and the sensation types. Both these types have the mechanisms of introversion and extroversion in common with the rational types, but they do not, like the thinking type on the one hand, differentiate the perception and contemplation of the inner images into thought, nor, like the feeling type on the other, differentiate the affective experience of instinct and sensation into feeling. On the contrary, the intuitive raises unconscious perception to the level of a differentiated function, by which he also becomes adapted to the world. He adapts himself by means of unconscious indications, which he receives through an especially fine and sharpened perception and interpretation of faintly conscious stimuli. How such a function appears is naturally hard to describe, an account of its irrational and, so to speak, unconscious character. In a sense, one might compare it with the demon of Socrates, with this qualification, however, that the strongly rationalistic attitude of Socrates repressed the intuitive function to the fullest limit. It had then to become effective in concrete hallucination, since it had no direct psychological access to consciousness. But with the intuitive type, this latter is precisely the case. The sensation type is in all respects a converse of the intuitive. He bases himself almost exclusively upon the element of external sensation. His psychology is orientated in respect to instinct and sensation. Hence, he is wholly dependent upon actual stimulation. The fact that it is just the psychological functions of intuition on the one hand and of sensation and instinct on the other that Nietzsche brings into relief must be characteristic of his own personal psychology. He must truly be reckoned as an intuitive type with an inclination towards the site of introversion. As evidence of the former, we have his preeminently intuitive artistic manner of production, of which this very work, The Birth of Tragedy, is highly characteristic, while his masterwork, Thus Spake Zarathustra, is even more so. His aphoristic writings are expressive of his introverted intellectual side. These, in spite of a strong admixture of feeling, exhibit a pronounced critical intellectualism in the manner of the French intellectuals of the 18th century. His lack of rational moderation and conciseness argues for the intuitive type in general. Under these circumstances, it is not surprising that in his initial work he unwittingly sets the facts of his own personal psychology in the foreground. This is all quite in harmony with the intuitive attitude, which characteristically perceives the outer through the medium of the inner, 
sometimes even at the expense of reality. By means of this attitude, he also gained deep insight into the Dionysian qualities of his unconscious, the crude forms of which, so far as we know, reached the surface of consciousness only at the outbreak of his illness, although they had already revealed their presence in various erotic illusions. It is therefore extremely regrettable, from the standpoint of psychology, that the fragments, so significant in this respect, which were found in Turin after the onset of his malady, should have met with destruction at the hands of moral and aesthetic scruples. End of section 13. Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Penny Witt, voiceoverwithp.com. Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Hilton Goodwin Baines, 1882 to 1943. Section 14. In my chronological survey of previous contributions to this interesting problem of psychological types, I now come to a small and rather odd work, my acquaintance with which I owe to my esteemed colleague Dr. Constant Long of London. Character as Seen in Body and Parentage by Ferno Jordan, F.R.C.S., 3rd edition, London, 1896. In this little book of 126 pages, Jordan's main description refers to two types or characters whose definition interests us in more than one respect. Although, to anticipate slightly, the author is really concerned with only one half of our types, the point of view of the other half, namely the intuitive and sensation types, is nonetheless included and confused with the types he describes. I will first let the author speak for himself, presenting his introductory definition on page 5. He says, quote, There are two generic fundamental biases in character, two conspicuous types of character, with a third and intermediate one. One in which the tendency to action is extreme and the tendency to reflection slight, and another in which the proneness to reflection greatly predominates and the impulse for action is feebler. Between the two extremes are innumerable gradations. It is sufficient to point only to a third type in which the powers of reflection and action tend to meet in more or less equal degree. In an intermediate class may also be placed the characters which tend to eccentricity, or in which other possible abnormal tendencies predominate over the emotional and non-emotional. End quote. It can be clearly seen from this definition that Jordan contrasts reflection or thinking with activity. It is thoroughly understandable that an observer of men not probing too deeply would first be struck by the contrast between the reflective and the active natures, and would therefore be inclined to define the observed antithesis from this angle. The simple reflection, however, that the active nature does not necessarily proceed from impulse, but can also originate in thought, would make it seem necessary to carry the definition somewhat deeper. Jordan himself reaches this conclusion, for on page 6 he introduces a further element into his survey, which has for us a particular value, namely the element of feeling. He states here that the active type is less passionate, while the reflective temperament is distinguished by its passionate feelings. Hence, Jordan calls his types the less impassioned and 
the more impassioned. Thus, the element which he overlooked in his introductory definition he subsequently raises to the constant factor. But what mainly distinguishes his conception from ours is the fact that he also makes the less impassioned type active and the other inactive. This combination seems to me unfortunate, since highly passionate and profound natures exist which are also energetic and active, and conversely there are less impassioned and superficial natures which are in no way distinguished by activity, not even by the low form of activity that consists in being busy. In my view, his otherwise valuable conception would have gained much in clarity if he had left the factors of activity and inactivity altogether out of account, as belonging to a quite different point of view, although in themselves important characterological determinants. It will be seen from the arguments which follow that with the less impassioned and more active type, Jordan is describing the extrovert, and that his more impassioned and less active type corresponds with the introvert. Either can be active or inactive without thereby changing its type. For this reason, the factor of activity should, in my opinion, be ruled out as an index character. As a determinant of secondary importance, however, it still plays a role, since the whole nature of the extrovert appears more mobile, more full of life and activity than that of the introvert. But this quality depends upon the phase which the individual temporarily occupies vis-a-vis -vis the outer world. An introvert in an extroverted phase appears active, while an extrovert in an introverted phase appears passive. Activity itself as a fundamental trait of character can sometimes be introverted. It is then wholly directed within, developing a lively activity of thought or feeling behind an outer mask of profound repose. Or at times it can be extroverted, showing itself in vigorous and lively action whilst behind the scenes there stands a firm, dispassionate thought or untroubled feeling. Before we make a more narrow examination of Jordan's train of ideas, I must, for greater clarity, stress yet another point which, if not borne in mind, might give rise to confusion. I remarked at the beginning that in earlier publications I had identified the introvert with the thinking, and the extrovert with the feeling type. As I said before, it became clear to me only later that introversion and extroversion are to be distinguished from the function types as general basic attitudes. These two attitudes may be recognized with the greatest ease while a sound discrimination of the function types requires a very wide experience. At times, it is uncommonly difficult to discover which function holds the premier place. The fact that the introvert naturally has a reflective and contemplative air as a result of his abstracting attitude has a misleading effect. This leads us to assume in him a priority of thinking. The extrovert, on the contrary, naturally displays many immediate reactions which easily allow us to conclude a predominance of the feeling element. But these suppositions are deceptive, since the extrovert may well be a thinking and the introvert a feeling type. Jordan merely describes the introvert and the extrovert in general. But where he goes into individual qualities, his description becomes misleading because traits of different function types are confused together, which a more adequate examination of the material would have kept apart. In general outlines, however, 
the picture of the introverted and extroverted attitude is unmistakable, so that the nature of the two basic attitudes can be plainly discerned. The characterization of the types from the standpoint of affectivity appears to me as the really important aspect of Jordan's work. We have already seen that the reflective and contemplative nature of the introvert finds compensation in an unconscious, archaic life with regard to instinct and sensation. We might even say that that is why he is introverted, since he has to rise above an archaic, impulsive, passionate nature to the safer heights of abstraction in order to dominate his insubordinate and turbulent effects. This statement of the case is, in many instances, not at all beside the mark. Conversely, we might say of the extrovert that his less deeply rooted emotional life is more readily adapted to differentiation and domestication than his unconscious, archaic thought and feeling. And it is this deep fantasy activity which may have such a dangerous influence upon his personality. Hence, he is always the one who seeks life and experience as busily and abundantly as possible, that he may never come to himself and confront his evil thoughts and feelings. From observations such as these, which are very easily verified, we may explain an otherwise paradoxical passage in Jordan where he says, page 6, that in the less impassioned, extroverted temperament, the intellect predominates with an unusually large share in the shaping of life, whereas the affects claim the greater importance with the reflective or introverted temperament. At first glance, this interpretation would seem to contradict my assertion that the less impassioned corresponds with my extroverted type. But a nearer scrutiny proves that this is not the case, since the reflective character, though certainly trying to deal with his unruly affects, is in reality more influenced by passion than the man who takes for the conscious guidance of his life those desires which are oriented to objects. The latter, namely the extrovert, attempts to make his principle all-inclusive, but he has nonetheless to experience the fact that it is his subjective thoughts and feelings which everywhere harass him on his way. He is influenced by his inner psychic world to a far greater extent than he is aware of. He cannot see it himself, but an observant entourage always discerns the personal purposiveness of his striving. Hence, his golden rule should always be to ask himself, what is my actual wish and secret purpose? The other, the introvert, with his conscious, thought-out aims, always tends to overlook what his circle perceives only too clearly, namely that his aims are really in the service of powerful impulses to whose influence, though lacking both purpose and object, they are very largely subject. The observer and critic of the extrovert is liable to take the parade of feeling and thought as a thin covering that only partially conceals a cold and calculated personal aim, whereas the man who tries to understand the introvert might readily conclude that the vehement passion is only with difficulty held in check by apparent sophosceries. Either judgment is both true and false. The conclusion is false when the conscious standpoint, i.e. consciousness in general, is strong enough to offer resistance to the unconscious. But it is true when a weaker conscious standpoint encounters a strong unconscious, to which it eventually has to give way. In this latter case, the motive that was kept in the background now breaks forth. The egotistical aim in the one case 
and the unsubdued passion, the elemental affect that throws aside every consideration in the other. These observations allow us to see how Jordan observes. He is evidently preoccupied with the effectivity of the observed type, hence his nomenclature, less emotional and more impassioned. If, therefore, from the emotional aspect he conceives the introvert as the passionate, and from the same standpoint he sees the extrovert as the less impassioned and even as the intellectual type, he thereby reveals a peculiar kind of discernment which one must describe as intuitive. This is why I previously drew attention to the fact that Jordan confuses the rational with the perceptional point of view. When he characterizes the introvert as the passionate and the extrovert as the intellectual, he is clearly seeing the two types from the side of the unconscious, i.e., he perceives them through the medium of his unconscious. He observes and recognizes intuitively. This must always be more or less the case with the practical observer of men. However true and profound such an apprehension may sometimes be, it is subject to a most essential limitation. It overlooks the living reality of the observed man, since it always judges him from his unconscious reflection instead of his actual presence. This error of judgment is inseparable from intuition, and reason has always been at loggerheads with it on this account, only grudgingly acknowledging its right to existence in spite of the fact that it must often be convinced of the objective accuracy of the intuitive finding. On the whole, then, Jordan's formulations accord with reality, though not with reality as it is understood by the rational types, but with the reality which is for them unconscious. Naturally, this is a circumstance than which nothing is more calculated to confuse all judgment upon the observed persons and to enhance the difficulty of interpretation of the facts observed. In these questions, therefore, one ought never to quarrel over nomenclature, but should hold exclusively to the actual facts of observable contrasting differences. Although my own manner of expression is altogether different from that of Jordan, we are nevertheless at one with certain divergences upon the classification of the observed phenomena. Before going on to comment upon the way Jordan reduces his observed material into types, I should like to briefly return to his postulated third or intermediate type. Jordan, as we saw, ranged under this heading the wholly balanced on one side and the unbalanced on the other. It will not be superfluous at this point to call to mind the classification of the Venetian school, in which the hydelic man is subordinate to the psychic and pneumatic. Footnote. The name given to the adherents of Venetius, an Egyptian theologian who flourished circa A.D. 150 and founded a Gnostic sect. The Hydaulics suffered themselves to be so captivated by the inferior world as to live only a Hydaulic or material life. New English Dictionary. End footnote. The Hydaulic man, according to his definition, corresponds with the sensation type, i.e., with the man whose prevailing determinants are supplied in and through the senses. The sensation type has neither a differentiated thinking nor a differentiated feeling, but his sensuousness is well developed. This, as we know, is also the case with the primitive. But the instinctive sensuality of the primitive has a counterweight in the spontaneity of the psychic processes. His mental product, his thoughts, 
practically confront him. He does not make or devise them. He is not capable of that. They make themselves. They happen to him, even confronting him like hallucinations. Such a mentality must be termed intuitive, since intuition is the instinctive perception of an emerging psychic content. Although the principal psychological function of the primitive is, as a rule, sensation, the less prominent compensating function is intuition. Upon the higher levels of civilization, where one man has thinking more or less differentiated and another feeling, there are also quite a number of individuals who have developed intuition to a high level and employ it as the essentially determining function. From these, we get the intuitive type. It is my belief, therefore, that Jordan's middle group may be resolved into the sensation and intuitive types. End of section 14. Recording by Penny Witt, voiceoverwithp.com. Section 15 of Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Penny Witt, voiceover with P.com. Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Hilton Goodwin Barnes, 1882 to 1943. Section 15. With regard to the general appearance of the two types, Jordan emphasizes the fact that the less emotional yields far more prominent and striking personalities than the emotional type. This notion springs from the fact that Jordan identifies the active type of man with the less emotional, which in my opinion is inadmissible. Leaving this mistake on one side, it is certainly true that the behavior of the less emotional, or let us say the extrovert, makes him more conspicuous than the emotional or introvert. The first character that Jordan discusses is that of the introverted woman. Let me summarize the chief points of his description. She has quiet manners and a character not easy to read. She is occasionally critical, even sarcastic. But though bad temper is sometimes noticeable, she is neither fitful, nor restless, nor captious, nor censorious. Nor is she a nagging woman. She diffuses an atmosphere of repose, and unconsciously she comforts and heals, but under the surface emotions and passions lie dormant. Her emotional nature matures slowly. As she grows older, the charm of her character increases. She is sympathetic, i.e. she brings insight and experience to bear on the problems of others. The very worst characters are found among the more impassioned women. They are the cruelest stepmothers. They make the most affectionate wives and mothers, but their passions and emotions are so strong that these frequently hold reason in subjection or carry it away with them. They love too much, but they also hate too much. Jealousy can make wild beasts of them. Stepchildren, if hated by them, may even be done to death. If evil is not in the ascendant, morality itself is associated with deep feeling and may take a profoundly reasoned and independent course which will not always fit itself to conventional standards. It will not be an imitation or a submission, not a bid for a reward here or hereafter. It is only in intimate relations that the excellence and drawbacks of the impassioned woman are seen. 
Here she unfolds herself. Here are her joys and sorrows. Here her faults and weaknesses are seen, perhaps slowness to forgive, implacability, sullenness, anger, jealousy, or even uncontrolled passions. She is charmed with the moment and less apt to think of the comfort and welfare of the absent. She is disposed to forget others and to forget time. If she is affected, her affection is less an imitation than a pronounced change of manners and speech with changing shades of thought and especially of feeling. In social life, she tends to be the same in all circles. In both domestic and social life, she is, as a rule, not difficult to please. She spontaneously appreciates, congratulates, and praises. She can soothe the mentally bruised and encourage the unsuccessful. In her, there is compassion for all weak things, two-footed or four. She raises to the high and stoops to the low. She is a sister and the playmate of all nature. Her judgment is mild and lenient. When she reads, she tries to grasp the innermost thought and deepest feelings of the book. She reads and rereads the book, marks it freely, and turns down its corners. From this description, it is not difficult to recognize the introverted character. But the description is, in a certain sense, one-sided, because the chief stress is laid upon the side of feeling, without emphasizing the one characteristic to which I give special value, viz. the conscious inner life. He mentions, it is true, that the introverted woman is contemplative, but he does not pursue the matter further. His description, however, seems to me a confirmation of my comments upon the manner of his observation. In the main, it is the outward demeanor constellated by feeling and the manifestations of passion which strike him. He does not probe into the nature of the conscious life of this type. Hence, he never mentions that the inner life plays an altogether decisive role in the introvert's conscious psychology. Why, for example, does the introverted woman read so attentively? Because, above everything, she loves to understand and comprehend ideas. Why is she restful and soothing? Because she usually keeps her feelings to herself, living them inwardly, instead of unloading them upon others. Her unconventional morality is based upon deep reflection and convincing inner feelings. The charm of her calm and intelligent character depends not merely upon the peaceful attitude, but derives from the fact that one can talk with her reasonably and coherently, and because she is able to estimate the value of her companion's argument. She does not interrupt him with impulsive demonstrations, but accompanies his meaning with her thoughts and feelings, which nonetheless remain steadfast, never yielding to opposing arguments. This compact and well-developed ordering of conscious psychic contents is a stout defense against a chaotic and passionate emotional life, of which the introvert is very often aware, at least in its personal aspect. She fears it because it is present to her. She meditates about herself. She is, therefore, outwardly equitable and can recognize and appreciate another without loading him with either blame or approbation. But because her emotional life would devastate these good qualities, she, as far as possible, rejects her instincts and effects, but without thereby mastering them. In contrast, therefore, to her logical and consolidated consciousness, her affect is proportionally elemental, confused, and ungovernable. It lacks a true human note. It is disproportionate and irrational. It is a phenomenon of nature which breaks through the human order. It lacks any tangible arrière-pensée or purpose.
At times, therefore, it is quite destructive. A wild torrent that neither contemplates destruction nor avoids it, profoundly indifferent and necessary, obedient only to its own laws, a process that accomplishes itself. Her good qualities depend upon her thinking, which by a tolerant or benevolent comprehension has succeeded in influencing or restraining one element of her instinctive life, though lacking the power to embrace and transform the whole. Her affectivity is far less clearly conscious to the introverted woman in its whole range than are her rational thoughts and feelings. She is incapable of comprehending her whole affectivity, although her way of looking at life is well adapted. Her affectivity is much less mobile than her intellectual contents. It is, as it were, tough and curiously inert, therefore hard to change. It is perseverant, hence also her self-will and her occasional unreasonable inflexibility in things that touch her emotions. These considerations may explain why a judgment of the introverted woman, taken exclusively from the angle of affectivity, is incomplete and unfair in whatever sense it is taken. If Jordan finds the vilest feminine characteristics among the introverts, this, in my opinion, is due to the fact that he lays too great a stress upon affectivity, as if passion alone were the mother of all evil. We can torture children to death in other ways than the merely physical. And from the other point of view, that wondrous wealth of love of the introverted woman is not always by any means her own possession. She is more often possessed by it and cannot choose but love until one day a favorable opportunity occurs when suddenly, to the amazement of her partner, she displays an inexplicable coldness. The emotional life of the introvert is generally his weak side, it is not absolutely trustworthy. He deceives himself about it. Others also are deceived and disappointed in him when they rely too exclusively upon his affectivity. His mind is more reliable because more adapted. His affect is too close to sheer, untamed nature. Let us now turn to Jordan's delineation of the less impassioned woman. Here, too, I must reject everything which the author has confused by the introduction of activity, since the admixture is only calculated to render the typical character less recognizable. Thus, when we speak of a certain quickness of the extrovert, this does not mean the element of energy and activity, but merely the mobility of active processes. Of the extroverted woman, Jordan says, She is marked by a certain quickness and opportuneness rather than by persistence or consistency. Her life is almost wholly occupied with little things. She goes even further than Lord Baconsfield in the belief that unimportant things are not very unimportant and important things are not very important. She likes to dwell on the way her grandmother did things and how her grandchildren will do them and on the universal degeneracy of human beings and affairs. Her daily wonder is how things would go on if she were not there to look after them. She is frequently invaluable in social movements. She expends her energies in household cleanliness, which is the end and aim of existence to not a few women. Frequently, she is idea-less, emotionless, restless, and spotless. Her emotional development is usually precarious, and at 18, she is little less wise than at 28 or 48. Her mental outlook usually lacks range and depth, but it is clear from the first. When intelligent, she is capable of taking a leading position. In society, she is kindly, generous, and hospitable. She judges her neighbors and friends, forgetful that she is herself being judged, 
but she is active in helping them in misfortune. Deep passion is absent in her. Love is simply preference, hatred merely dislike, and jealousy only injured pride. Her enthusiasm is not sustained, and she is more alive to the beauty of poetry than she is to its passion and pathos. Her beliefs and disbeliefs are complete rather than strong. She has no convictions, but she has no misgivings. She does not believe, she adopts. She does not disbelieve, she ignores. She never inquires and never doubts. In large affairs, she defers to authority. In small affairs, she jumps to conclusions. In the detail of her own little world, whatever is, is wrong. In the larger world outside, whatever is, is right. She instinctively rebels against carrying the conclusions of reason into practice. At home, she shows quite a different character from the one seen in society. With her, marriage is influenced by ambition, love of change or obedience to well-recognized custom, and a desire to be settled in life or from a sincere wish to enter a greater sphere of usefulness. If her husband belongs to the impassioned type, he will love children more than she does. In the domestic circle, her least pleasing characteristics are evident. Here, she indulges in disconnected, disapproving comment, and none can foresee when there will be a gleam of sunshine through the cloud. The unemotional woman has little or no self-analysis. If she is plainly accused of habitual disapproval, she is surprised and offended and intimates that she only desires the general good, but some people don't know what is good for them. She has one way of doing good to her family and quite another way where society is concerned. The household must always be ready for social inspection. Society must be encouraged and propitiated. Its upper section must be impressed and its lower section kept in order. Home is her winter, society is her summer. If the door but opens and a visitor is announced, the transformation is instant. The less emotional woman is by no means given to asceticism. Respectability does not demand it of her. She is fond of movement, recreation, change. Her busy day may open with a religious service and close with a comic opera. She delights to entertain her friends and to be entertained by them. In society, she finds not only her work and her happiness, but her rewards and her consolations. She believes in society, and society believes in her. Her feelings are little influenced by prejudice, and as a rule, she is reasonable. She is very imitative and usually selects good models, but is only dimly conscious of her imitations. The book she reads must deal with life and action. This familiar type of woman, which Jordan terms the less impassioned, is extroverted beyond a doubt. The whole demeanor sets forth that character which, from its very nature, must be called extroverted. The continual criticizing that is never founded upon real reflection is an extroversion of a fleeting impression which has nothing to do with true thinking. I remember a witty aphorism I once read somewhere or other. Thinking is so difficult, therefore most of us prefer to pass judgments. Reflection demands time above everything. Therefore, the man who reflects has no opportunity for continual criticism. Incoherent and inconsequential criticism, with its dependence upon tradition and authority, reveals the absence of any independent reflection. Similarly, the lack of self-criticism and the depth of independent ideas betrays a deficit of the function of judgment. 
The absence of inner mental life in this type is expressed much more distinctly than is its presence in the introverted type depicted above. From this sketch, one might readily conclude that there is here just as great or even a greater defect of affectivity, for it is obviously superficial, shallow, almost superior. Because the aim always involved in it, or discernible behind it, makes the emotional effort practically worthless. I am, however, inclined to assume that the author is here undervaluing just as much as he overvalued in the former case. Notwithstanding, an occasional recognition of good qualities, the type on the whole comes out of it very indifferently. I must assume in this case a certain bias on the part of the author. It is usually enough to have tasted a bitter experience, either with one or more representatives of a certain type, for one's taste to be spoiled for every similar case. One must not forget that, just as the good sense of the introverted woman depends upon a scrupulous accommodation of her mental contents to the general thought, the affectivity of the extroverted woman possesses a certain mobility and lack of depth on account of her adaptation to the general life of human society. In this case, it is a question of a socially differentiated affectivity of incontestable general validity, which compares more than favorably with the heavy, sticky, passionate effect of the introvert. The differentiated affectivity has cut away the chaotic effect and has become a disposable function of the adaption, though at the expense of the inner mental life, which is remarkable by its absence. It nonetheless exists in the unconscious and, moreover, in a form which corresponds with the passion of the introvert, i.e., in an undeveloped state. The character of this state is infantile and archaic. The undeveloped mind, working from the unconscious, provides the effect of struggle with the contents and hidden motives, which cannot fail to make a bad impression upon the critical observer, although unperceived by the uncritical eye. The disagreeable impression that the constant perception of thinly veiled egoistic motives has upon the beholder makes one only too prone to forget the actual reality and adapted usefulness of the efforts thus displayed. All that is easy, unforced, moderate, unconcerned, and superficial in life would disappear if there were no differentiated effects. One would either be stifled in continuously manifested pathos or be engulfed in the yawning void of repressed passion. If the social function of the introvert mainly perceives individuals, the extrovert certainly promotes the life of the community, which also has a claim to existence. That is why he needs extroversion, because first and foremost, it is the bridge to one's neighbor. As we all know, the expression of emotion works suggestively, while the mind can only unfold its effectiveness indirectly by arduous translation. The effects required by the social function must not be at all deep, or they beget passion in others, and passion disturbs the life and prosperity of society. Similarly, the adapted, differentiated mind of the introvert has extensity rather than depth. Hence, it is not disturbing and provocative, but reasonable and sedative. But just as the introvert is troublesome through the violence of his passions, the extrovert is irritating through an incoherent and abrupt application of his half-unconscious thoughts and feelings in the form of tactless and unsparing judgments upon his fellow men. If we were to make a collection of such judgments and were to try synthetically to construct a psychology out of them, we should arrive at an utterly brutal conception, which in cheerless savagery, crudity, and stupidity 
would be a fitting rival to the murderous effect nature of the introvert. Hence, I cannot subscribe to Jordan's view that the worst characters are to be found among the passionate introverted natures. Among the extroverts, there is just as much and just as basic wickedness, whereas introverted passionateness reveals itself in coarse actions, the vulgarity of the extrovert's unconscious thinking and feeling commits infamous deeds upon the soul of the victim. I know not which is worse. The drawback in the former case is that the deed is visible, while the latter's vulgarity of mind is concealed behind the veil of an acceptable demeanor. I would like to lay stress upon the social thoughtfulness of this type. His active concern for the general welfare, as well as a most definite tendency to provide pleasure for others. The introvert, as a rule, has these qualities only in fantasy. Differentiated effects have the further advantage of charm and beautiful form. They diffuse an aesthetic, beneficent atmosphere. There are a surprising number of extroverts who practice an art, chiefly music, not so much because they are specially qualified in that direction as from a desire to be generally serviceable in social life. Extroverted fault-finding, moreover, is not always unpleasant or wholly worthless in character. It very often confines itself to an adapted educational tendency which does a great deal of good. Similarly, his dependence of judgment is not necessarily evil under all circumstances, for it often conduces the suppression of extravagant and pernicious outgrowths, which in no way further the life and welfare of society. It would be altogether unjustifiable to try to maintain that one type is, in any respect, more valuable than the other. The types are mutually complementary and from their distinctiveness there proceeds just that measure of tension which both the individual and society need for the maintenance of life. End of section 15. Recording by Penny Witt, voiceoverwithp.com. Section 16 of Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Penny Witt, voiceover with P dot com. Psychological Types or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung, translated by Helton Goodwin Baines, 1882-1943. Section 16. Of the extroverted man, Jordan says, quote, He is fitful and uncertain in temper and behavior, given to petulance, fuss, discontent, and censoriousness. He makes depreciatory judgments on all and sundry, but is ever well satisfied with himself. His judgment is often at fault and his projects often fail, but he never ceases to place unbounded confidence in both. Sidney Smith, speaking of a conspicuous statesman of his time, said he was ready at any moment to command the Channel Fleet or amputate a limb. He has an incisive formula for everything that is put before him. Either the thing is not true, or everybody knows it already. In his sky there is no room for two suns. If the other suns insist on shining, he has a curious sense of martyrdom. He matures early. He is fond of administration and is often an admirable public servant. 
at the committee of his charity, he is as much interested in the selection of his washerwoman as in the selection of his chairman. In company, he is usually alert, to the point, witty, and apt at retort. He resolutely, confidently, and constantly shows himself. Experience helps him, and he insists on getting experience. He would rather be the known chairman of a committee of three than the unknown benefactor of a nation. When he is less gifted, he is probably no less self-important. Is he busy? He believes himself to be energetic. Is he loquacious? He believes himself to be eloquent. He rarely puts forth new ideas or opens new paths. But he is quick to follow, to seize, to apply, to carry out. His natural tendency is to ancient, or at least accepted forms of belief and policy. Special circumstances may sometimes lead him to contemplate with admiration the audacity of his own heresy. Not rarely the less emotional intellect is so lofty and commanding that no disturbing influence can hinder the formation of broad and just views in all the provinces of life. His life is usually characterized by morality, truthfulness, and high principle. But sometimes his desire for immediate effect leads him into difficulties. If in public assembly, adverse fates have given him nothing to do, nothing to propose, or second, or support, or amend, or oppose, he will rise and ask for some window to be closed to keep out the draft, or, which is more likely, that one be open to let in more air. For physiologically, he commonly needs much air as well as much notice. He is especially prone to do what he is not asked to do. He constantly believes that the public sees him as he wishes it to see him, a sleepless seeker of the public good. He puts others in his debt, and he cannot go unrewarded. He may, by well-chosen language, move his audience although he is not moved himself. He is probably quick to understand his time, or at least his party. He warns it of impending evil, organizes its forces, deals smartly with its opponents. He is full of projects and bustling activity. Society must be pleased if possible. If it will not be pleased, it must be astonished. If it will neither be pleased nor astonished, it must be pestered and shocked. He is a savior by profession, and as an acknowledged savior is not ill-pleased with himself. We can ourselves do nothing right, but we can believe in him, dream in him, thank God for him, and ask him to address us. He is unhappy in repose and rests nowhere long. After a busy day, he must have a pungent evening. He is found in the theater or concert or church or bazaar, at the dinner or conversation or club or all these, turn and turn about. If he misses a meeting, a telegram announces a more ostentatious call. End quote. From this description, the type is easily recognized. But even more, perhaps, than in the description of the extroverted woman, there emerges, notwithstanding individual evidences of appreciation, an element of caricaturing depreciation. This is partly due to the fact that this method of description cannot be just to the extroverted nature in general, but with the intellectual medium, it is well nigh impossible to set the specific value of the extrovert in a fair light. While with the introvert, this is much more possible, since his conscious motivation and good sense permit of expression through the intellectual medium as readily as do the facts of his passion and its inevitable consequences. With the extrovert, on the other hand, the chief value lies in his relation to the object. To me, it seems that only life itself can concede the extrovert that justice which intellectual criticism fails to give him. 
Life alone reveals and appreciates his values. We can, of course, state the fact that the extrovert is socially useful, that he deserves great merit for the progress of human society, and so on. But an analysis of his means and motivations will always give a negative result, since the chief value of the extrovert lies not in himself, but in the reciprocal relation to the object. The relation to the object belongs to those imponderabilia which the intellectual formulation can never seize. Intellectual criticism cannot abstain from proceeding analytically. It must constantly seek evidence concerning motivation and aims in order to bring the observed type to complete definition. But from this process, a picture emerges which is no better than a caricature for the psychology of the extrovert. And the man is fain to believe he has found the extrovert's real attitude upon the basis of such a description will be astonished to find the actual personality turning his description to ridicule. Such a one-sided conception entirely prevents any adaptation to the extrovert. In order to do him justice, thinking about him must be altogether excluded. Similarly, the extrovert can adjust himself correctly to the introvert only when he is prepared to accept his mental contents in themselves quite apart from their possible practical application. Intellectual analysis cannot help charging the extrovert with every possible design, subtle aim, mental reservation, and so forth, which have no actual existence, but at the most are only shadowy effects leaking in from the unconscious background. It is certainly true that the extrovert, if he has nothing else to say, may find it necessary for a window to be opened or shut, but who has remarked it? Who is essentially struck by it? Only the man who is trying to give an account of the possible grounds and intentions of such an action. One, therefore, who reflects, dissects, and reconstructs, while for everyone else this little stir is altogether dissolved in the general bustle of life without offering an invitation to any ulterior deduction. But it is just in this way that the psychology of the extrovert reveals itself. It belongs to the occurrences of daily human life, and it signifies nothing more, either above or below. But the man who reflects, sees further, and, as far as the actual life is concerned, sees crooked although his vision is sound enough as regards the unconscious background. He does not see the positive man, but only his shadow, and the shadow admits the justice of the criticism to the prejudice of the conscious, positive human being. For the sake of understanding, it is, I think, a good thing to detach the man from his shadow, the unconscious. Otherwise, the discussion is threatened with an unparalleled confusion of ideas. One sees much in another man which does not belong to his conscious psychology, but which gleams out from his unconscious, and one is rather tempted to regard the observed quality as belonging to the conscious ego. Life and fate may do this, but the psychologist to whom the knowledge and structure of the psyche and the dawning possibility of a better understanding of man is the deepest concern, must not. A clean discrimination of the conscious man from his unconscious is imperative, since only by the assimilation of the conscious standpoints will clarity and understanding be gained, and never through a process of reduction to the unconscious backgrounds, sidelights, and quarter tones. Of the character of the introverted man, the more impassioned and reflective man, Jordan says, quote, His pleasures do not change from hour to hour. His love of pleasure is of a more genuine nature. 
He does not seek it from mere restlessness. If he takes part in public work, he is probably invited to do so from some special fitness. Or it may be that he has at heart some movement which he wishes to promote. When his work is done, he willingly retires. He is able to see what others can do better than he, and he would rather that his cause should prosper in other hands than fail in his own. He has a hearty word of praise for his fellow workers. Probably he errs in estimating too generously the merits of those around him. He is never, and indeed cannot be, an habitual scold. Such men develop slowly, are liable to hesitate, never become leaders of religious movements, are never so supremely confident as to what is air that they burn their neighbors for it, never so confident that they possess infallible truth that, although not wanting in courage, they are prepared to be burnt in its behalf. If they are especially endowed, they will be thrust into the front ranks by their environment, while men of other type place themselves there. End quote. To me, it seems significant that the author in his chapter on the introverted man, with whom we are now concerned, actually says no more than I have substantially given above, a description of the passion on which account he is termed the impassioned type is for the most part omitted. One must, of course, be cautious in making diagnostic conjectures, but this case seems to invite the supposition that the section on the introverted man has received such niggardly treatment from subjective causes. One might have expected after the searching and unfair delineation of the extroverted type a similar thoroughness of description of the introvert. Why is it not forthcoming? Let us suppose that Jordan himself is upon the side of the introverts. It would then be intelligible that a description like the one he gives to his opposite type with such pitiless severity would scarcely be acceptable. I would not say because of a lack of objectivity, but rather for a lack of discernment of his own shadow. How he appears to his countertype, the introvert cannot possibly know or imagine, unless he allows the extrovert a privileged recital of it, at the risk of being obliged to challenge him to a duel. Just as little as the extrovert is disposed to accept the above characteristics without more ado, as a malevolent and striking picture of his character, is the introvert willing to receive his characteristics from an extroverted observer and critic for it would be just as depreciatory. As the introvert who tries to get hold of the nature of the extrovert invariably goes wide of the mark, so the extrovert who tries to understand the other's inner mental life from the standpoint of externality is equally at sea. The introvert makes the mistake of always wanting to relate action to the subjective psychology of the extrovert. While the extrovert can only conceive the inner mental life as a product of external circumstances. For the extrovert, an abstract train of thought must be a fantasy, a sort of chimera, when an objective relation is not in evidence. And as a matter of fact, introverted brain weavings are often nothing more. At all events, a lot could be said of the introverted man and one could draw a shadow portrait of him neither less complete nor unfavorable than that which Jordan in his earlier section drew of the extrovert. Jordan's observation that the pleasure of the introvert is of a more genuine nature seems to me important. This appears to be a peculiarity of the introverted feeling in general. It is genuine, it is because it is just. It is rooted in the man's deeper nature. It wells up out of itself, as it were, having itself as its own aim. It will serve no other ends, lending itself to none, and is content to accomplish itself. This coincides with the spontaneity of the archaic and natural phenomenon 
which has never yet bowed the head to the ends and aims of civilization. Whether rightly or wrongly, or at least without consideration of right or wrong, of suitability or unsuitability, the effective state manifests itself, forcing itself upon the subject even against his will and expectation. It contains nothing from which one might conclude a thought-out motivation. I do not wish to enlarge upon the further sections of Jordan's book. He cites historical personalities as examples, whereby numerous distorted points of view appear which derive from the fallacy already referred to, i.e. the author introduces the criterion of active and passive and mixes it up with other criteria. From this melody, the conclusion is frequently drawn that an active personality must also be counted as a passion-less type, and vice versa, a passionate nature must likewise always be passive. My standpoint seeks to avoid this error by altogether excluding the factor of activity as a point of view. To Jordan, however, the credit belongs of being the first, so far as I know, to give a relatively appropriate character sketch of the emotional types. End of section 16. Recorded by Penny Witt. Voiceover with P.com. Section 17 of Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines. Section 17. Chapter 5. The Problem of Types in Poetry. Carl Spittler's Prometheus and Epimetheus. Part 1. Introductory Remarks on Spittler's Characterization of Types. If, among the themes offered to the poet by the intricacies of emotional life, the problem of types did not play a significant role, it would practically prove that such a problem did not exist. But we have already seen how, in Schiller, this problem stirred the poet in him as deeply as the thinker. In this chapter, we shall turn our attention to a poetic work which is almost exclusively based upon the motif of the type problem. I refer to Carl Spittler's Prometheus and Epimetheus, which first appeared in 1881. I have no wish to explain at the outset that Prometheus, the forethinker, stands for the introvert, while Epimetheus, the man of action and afterthinker, signifies the extrovert. In the conflict of these two figures, the principal issue is the battle of the introverted with the extroverted line of development in one and the same individual. Though the poetic presentation has embodied the conflict in two independent figures with their typical destinies, it is self-evident that Prometheus exhibits introverted character traits. He presents the picture of a man faithfully introverted to his inner world, true to his soul. His reply to the angel is a telling expression of his nature. Quote, Yet is not mine to judge my soul's appearance? For behold, my mistress she is, my God in joy and sorrow. And whatsoever I am, I have from her alone. And so with her will I share my glory, and if need be, boldly will I renounce it. End quote. In this act, Prometheus surrenders himself unconditionally to his own soul that is, to the function of relation to the inner world. Hence, the soul has also a mysterious metaphysical character, precisely on account of its relation to the unconscious. Prometheus concedes it absolute significance as mistress and guide, in the same unconditional manner in which Epimetheus yields himself to the world. He sacrifices his individual ego to the soul, to the relation with the unconscious, as the mother womb of eternal images and meanings. He thereby surrenders the self, since he loses the counterweight of the persona, that is, the relation to the external object. With this surrender of his soul, Prometheus drops away from every connection with the surrounding world, thus escaping the indispensable correction gained through external reality. But this loss is irreconcilable with the nature of this world. Therefore, an angel appears to Prometheus, clearly a representative of world government. Expressed psychologically, he is the projected image of a tendency directed towards reality adaptation. The angel accordingly says to Prometheus, quote, It shall come to pass, if thou dost not prevail and free thyself from thy soul's unrighteous way, 
that the great reward of many years and thy heart's content and all the fruits of thy subtle mind shall be lost unto thee. End quote. And in another place, quote, Rejected shalt thou be on the day of glory for the sake of thy soul, who knoweth no God and heedeth no law, for to her arrogance nothing is holy, neither in heaven nor upon the earth. End quote. Because Prometheus has a one-sided orientation to his soul, every impulse toward adaptation to the outer world tends to be repressed and to sink into the unconscious. Consequently, if perceived at all, they appear as separate from individuality, hence as projections. In this connection, it would seem that there is a certain contradiction in the fact that the soul, whose cause Prometheus has espoused, and which he is, as it were, accepted in full consciousness, appears as a projection. Since the soul, like the persona, is a function of relationship, it must consist in a certain sense of two parts, one part belonging to the individuality, and the other adhering to the object of relationship, in this case the unconscious. One is indeed generally inclined, unless one is a frank adherent of the Hartman philosophy, to grant the unconscious only the relative existence of a psychological factor. On the grounds of the theory of cognition, we are as yet quite unable to make any valid statement with regard to an objective reality of the phenomenal psychological complex, which we term the unconscious, just as we are equally powerless to determine anything valid about the nature of real things which lie beyond our psychological capacity. On the ground of experience, I must, however, point out that in relation to our conscious activity, the contents of the unconscious make the same claim to reality, by virtue of their obstinacy and persistence, as do the real things of the outer world, even when this challenge appears very improbable to a mentality with a preferential bias towards external reality. It must not be forgotten that there have always been many for whom the contents of the unconscious possessed a greater reality than the things of the outer world. The history of human thought bears witness to both realities. A more searching investigation of the human psyche shows unquestionably that there is, on the whole, an equally strong influence from both sides upon conscious activity so that, psychologically, we have a right, on purely empirical grounds, to treat the contents of the unconscious as just as real as the things of the outer world, albeit these two realities may be mutually contradictory and appear entirely different in their natures. But to superordinate one reality over the other would be an altogether unjustifiable presumption. Theosophy and spiritualism are no better than materialism in their outrageous encroachments upon reality, we have, in fact, to resign ourselves to the sphere of our psychological possibilities. The peculiar reality of unconscious contents, therefore, gives us the same right to describe these as objects as the things of the outer world, whereas the persona, considered as a relation, is always conditioned by the outer object, and hence is as firmly anchored in the outer object as it is in the subject. The soul, as the relation to the inner object, is similarly represented by the inner object, in a sense, therefore, it is always distinct from the subject, and is actually perceptible as something distinct. Hence, it appears to Prometheus as something quite separate from his individual ego. In the same way as a man who yields himself entirely to the outer world still has the world as an object distinct from himself, so the unconscious world of images remains as an object distinct from the subject, even when a man is wholly surrendered to it. Just as the unconscious world of mythological images speaks indirectly, through the experience of external things, to the man who abandons himself to the outer world, so the real world and its claims find their way indirectly to the man who has surrendered himself to the soul, for no man can escape both realities. If a man is fixed upon the outer reality, he must live his myth. If he is turned toward the inner reality, then must he dream his outer, his so-called real life. Thus the soul says to Prometheus, quote, a god of crime am I, who leadeth thee astray upon untrodden paths. But thou wouldst not hearken unto me, and now hath it come to pass according to my words. For my sake have they robbed thee of the glory of thy name, and stolen from thee thy life's content. End quote. Prometheus refuses the kingdom the angel offers him, which means that he refuses adaptation to things as they are, because his soul is demanded from him in exchange. While the subject, that is Prometheus, is essentially human, the soul is of quite a different character. It is demonic, because the inner object, namely the suprapersonal collective unconscious to which it is attached as the function of relation, gleams through it. The unconscious, regarded as the historical background of the psyche, contains in a concentrated form the entire succession of anagrams, that is imprints, 
which from time immemorial have determined the psychic structure as it now exists. These anagrams may be regarded as function traces, which typify, on the average, the most frequently and intensely used functions of the human soul. These function engrams present themselves in the form of mythological themes and images, appearing often in identical form, and always with striking similarity among all races. They can also be easily verified in the unconscious material of modern man. It is intelligible, therefore, that avowedly animal traits or elements should also appear among the unconscious contents by the side of those sublime figures which from the oldest times have accompanied man on the road of life. The unconscious disposes of a whole world of images, whose boundless range yields in nothing to the claims of the world of real things. To the one who personally surrenders himself wholly to the outer world, the unconscious comes in the form of some intimate and beloved being, in whom, should his destiny lie in extreme devotion to the personal object, he will experience the duality of the world and his own nature. In like manner, there comes to the other a demonic personification of the unconscious, embodying the totality, the extreme oppositeness and duality of the world of images. These are borderline phenomena which overstep the normal. Hence, the normal mind knows nothing of these cruel enigmas. They do not exist for him. It is always only the few who reach the rim of the world where its mirage begins. For the man who stands always upon the normal path, the soul has a human, and not a dubious, demonic character. Neither do his fellow men appear to him in the least problematical. Only complete abandonment, either to one world or the other, evokes their duality. Spittler's intuition caught that picture of the soul, which in a less profound nature would at most have found utterance in dreams. Accordingly we read, quote, And while he thus demeaned himself in the fury of his passion, there played a strange quiver about her mouth and face, and ever and again her eyelids flickered, shutting and opening hastily, and behind a soft, delicate fringe of her lashes there lurked something which threatened and crept about like the fire which glideth stealthily through the house, or like the tiger stealing among the bushes, while from the dark foliage, in broken flashes, gleameth ever and anon his yellow mottled flanks. End quote. The line of life which Prometheus chooses is thus unmistakably introverted. He sacrifices all connection with the present in order to create in anticipation the distant future. It is very different with Epimetheus. He realizes that his aim is the world and what the world values. Hence, he says to the angel, quote, Yet now I long for truth, and my soul lieth in thy hand. And it please thee, therefore, give me a conscience that will teach me shun, and ness, and every just precept. End quote. Epimetheus cannot resist the temptation to fulfill his own destiny and submit himself to the soulless point of view. This junction with the world is immediately rewarded. Quote, and it came to pass, as Epimetheus rose up, that he felt his stature was increased and his courage more steadfast. He was at one with all his being, and his whole feeling was sound and mightily at ease. And thus he strode with bold steps through the valley on a straight course, as one who feareth no man, and with a bold glance like a man inspired by the contemplation of his own riches. End quote. He has, as Prometheus says, bartered his free soul for shun and ness. The soul is lost to him in favor of his brother. He has followed his extroversion, and because this orientates him toward the external object, he is caught up in the desires and expectations of the world, seemingly at first to his great advantage. He has become an extrovert, after having lived many solitary years under the influence of his brother as an extrovert falsified through imitation of the introvert. Such involuntary simulation dans le caractère occurs not infrequently. His conversion to true extroversion is, therefore, a step towards truth, and deservedly brings him a partial reward. Whilst Prometheus, through the tyrannical claims of his soul, is hampered in every relation to the external object, and has to make the cruelest sacrifices in service of the soul, Epimetheus receives an immediately effective shield against the danger that most threatens the extrovert that is to say, a complete surrender to the external object. This protection consists in the conscience, which is based upon traditional right ideas, and which, therefore, possesses the not-to-be-despised treasure of inherited worldly wisdom, 
which is employed by public opinion in much the same fashion as the judge uses the penal code. This provides Epimetheus with a circumscribed code which restrains him from abandoning himself to objects in the same degree as Prometheus does to his soul. This is forbidden him by the conscience, which stands in the place of his soul. When Prometheus turns his back upon the world of men and his codified conscience, he falls into the hands of his cruel soul mistress with her arbitrary power, and only through endless suffering does he make expiation for his neglect of the world. The prudent restraint of a blameless conscience sets such a bandage over Epimetheus's eyes that he must blindly live his myth, but ever with a sense of doing right, since he dwells in constant harmony with general expectation, with success ever at his side since he fulfills the wishes of all. Thus men desire to see the king, and thus Epimetheus plays his part to the inglorious end, never forsaken by the strong backing of public approval. His self-assurance and self-righteousness, his unshakable confidence in his general worth, his unquestionable right-doing and good conscience, present an easily recognizable portrait of that extroverted character which Jordan depicted. Compare page 102 and the following pages, describing the visit of Epimetheus to the sick Prometheus, where King Epimetheus is anxious to heal his suffering brother. Quote, and when all was duly accomplished, the king stepped forth, and supported by a friend on the left hand and on the right, he lifted up his voice in greeting and spake these well-intentioned words. My heart grieveth me on thy account, Prometheus, my beloved brother. But now take heart, for behold, I have here a salve of virtue for every ill. Wondrous is its healing power, both in heat and in frost, and thou mayest use it alike to comfort or chastise thyself. And speaking thus, he took his staff, and bound the cell fast, and proffered it him all warily, with weighty mane. But hardly had Prometheus perceived the odor and aspect of the ointment than he turned his head away with disgust. Whereupon the king changed the tones of his voice, and began to cry aloud, and to prophesy with great heat, Of a truth it seemed thou hast need of greater punishment, since thy present fate doth not suffice to teach thee. And speaking thus, he drew a mirror from his cloak, and declared unto him all things from the beginning, and became very eloquent, and knew all his faults. End quote. The words of Jordan are speakingly illustrated in this scene. Quote, Society must be pleased if possible. If it will not be pleased, it must be astonished. If it will neither be pleased nor astonished, it must be pestered and shocked. End quote. In the above scene, we find almost the same climax. In the Orient, a rich man makes known his rank by never showing himself in public unless supported by two slaves. Epimetheus affects this pose in order to make an impression. Well doing must at the same time be combined with admonition and moral discourse. And, as that does not produce an effect, the other must at least be horrified by the picture of his own baseness. Thus, everything is aimed towards making an impression. There is an American saying which runs thus, quote, In America, two sorts of men make good, the man who can do something and the man who can bluff well, end quote, which means that pretense is sometimes just as successful as actual performance. An extrovert of this kind preferably makes his effect by appearance. The introvert tries to force the situation and to this end may even abuse his work. If we fuse Prometheus and Epimetheus into one personality, we should have a man outwardly Epimethean and inwardly Promethean, an individual constantly torn by both tendencies, each seeking to enlist the ego finally on its side. End of section 17. Recording by Olivia. Section 18 of Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines. A Comparison of Spittlers with Goethe's Prometheus. Considerable interest is to be found in comparing this Prometheus conception with that presented by Goethe. I believe I am justified in the conjecture that Goethe belongs more to the extroverted than the introverted type. While Spittler would seem to belong to the latter, only an exhaustive examination and analysis of Goethe's biography would succeed in establishing the justice of this assumption. 
My conjecture is based upon diverse impressions, which I will refrain from discussing, owing to my inability to furnish sufficient explanations. The introverted attitude need not necessarily coincide with the Prometheus figure, by which I mean that the traditional Prometheus figure can also be interpreted quite differently. This other version is found, for instance, in Plato's Protagoras, where the distributor of vital powers to the creature fashioned by the gods in equal measure out of earth and fire is Epimetheus and not Prometheus. Prometheus, conforming to the classical taste, both in this situation and throughout the myth, is principally the cunning and inventive genius. With Goethe, two conceptions are presented. In the Prometheus fragment of 1773, Prometheus is the defiant, self-sufficing, godlike, god-disdaining creator and artist. His soul is Minerva, daughter of Zeus. Prometheus' relation with Minerva has a clear similarity with the relation of Spittler's Prometheus with his soul. Thus, Prometheus says to Minerva, From the beginning thy words have been celestial light to me. Ever as though my soul spake unto herself, she revealed herself. And in her of their own accord, sister harmonies rang out. And when I deemed it was myself, a deity gave utterance. And did I dream a god was speaking? Lo, twas mine own voice. And thus with thee and me, so one, so closely knit are we, my love is thine eternally. And further, as the twilight glory of the departed sun hovereth over the gloomy Caucasus, and encompass my soul with holy peace, parting, yet ever present with me, so have my powers waxed strong, with every breath drawn from thy celestial air. Thus, Goethe's Prometheus is also dependent upon his soul. There is a strong resemblance to the relationship of Spittler's Prometheus with his soul. Thus the latter says to his soul, And though I be stripped of all, yet I am rich beyond all measure, so long as thou alone remainest with me, well, my friend falleth from thy sweet lips, and the light of thy proud and gracious countenance goeth not from me. In spite of the similarity of the two figures and their relations with the soul, there remains, however, an essential difference. Goethe's Prometheus is a creator and artist. Minerva inspires his clay images with life. Spittler's Prometheus is suffering rather than creative. Only his soul creates, and her creating is secret and mysterious. She says to him in farewell, and now I depart from thee, for lo, a great work awaiteth me. Tis a mighty deed, and I must hasten to accomplish it. It would seem that with Spittler, the Promethean creativeness is allotted to the soul, while Prometheus himself merely suffers the pangs of a creative soul. But Goethe's Prometheus is self-active. He is essentially and exclusively creative, defying gods out of the strength of his own creative power. Who helped me against the insolence of the Titans? Who rescued me from death, from slavery? Didst thou not thyself accomplish all, O sacred glowing heart? Epimetheus, in this fragment, is only sparingly sketched. He is, throughout, inferior to Prometheus, an advocate of collective feeling, who can only understand the service of the soul as obstinacy. Thus he says to Prometheus, Thou standeth alone. Thy obstinacy knoweth not that bliss when the gods and thou and all thou hast, thy world, thy heaven, are enfolded in one embracing unity. Such indications are to be found in the Prometheus fragment are too sparse to enable us to discern the character of Epimetheus. But the delineation of Goethe's Prometheus reveals a typical distinction from the Prometheus of Spittler. Goethe's Prometheus creates and works outwardly in the world. He peoples space with the figures he has fashioned and his soul has animated. He fills the earth with the offspring of his creation. He is both master and educator of man. But with the Prometheus of Spittler, everything goes to the world within and vanishes in the darkness of the soul's depths, just as he himself disappears from the world of men, even wandering from the narrow confines of his home, that he may become the more invisible. In accordance with the principle of compensation, a basic principle in our analytical psychology, the soul, that is, the personification of the unconscious, must be especially active in such a case, preparing a work which, however, is as yet invisible. Besides the passages already quoted, Spittler gives us a complete description of this anticipated compensation process. This we find in the Pandora interlude. Pandora, that enigmatical figure in the Prometheus myth, is in Spittler's creation the divine maid who lacks every relation with Prometheus but the very deepest. 
This conception is founded upon the version of the myth in which the woman who figures in the Prometheus relation is either Pandora or Athena. The Prometheus of mythology has his sole relation with Pandora or Athena, as in Goethe, but in Spitteler a noteworthy departure is introduced which, however, is already indicated in the historical myth, where the Prometheus-Pandora relation is contaminated with the Hephaestus-Athena analogy. With Goethe, the version Prometheus-Athena is preferred, but in Spitteler Prometheus is removed from the divine sphere and is given a soul of his own. But his divinity and his original relation with Pandora in myth are preserved as a cosmic counterplot enacted independently in the celestial sphere. The happenings of the other world are the things that take place on the further side of our consciousness, that is, in the unconscious. The Pandora interlude, therefore, is a presentation of what goes on in the unconscious during the suffering of Prometheus. When Prometheus vanishes from the world, destroying every link that binds him to mankind, he sinks into the depths of himself, into his walled-in isolation, his only object, himself. And godlike withal, for God, according to his definition, is the being who is universally self-contained, who, by virtue of his omnipresence, has himself as universal object. Naturally, Prometheus does not feel in the least godlike. He is supremely wretched. After Epimetheus has come to spit upon his misery, the interlude in the other world begins. In that moment, naturally, when all Prometheus' relations in the world are suppressed to the extreme limit, Experience shows that it is in such moments that yield the unconscious contents the likeliest possibility of gaining independence and vitality, even to the point of overpowering consciousness. Prometheus's condition in the unconscious is reflected in the following scene. And on the clouded morning of the same day, in a still and solitary meadow above all the worlds, wandered God, the creator of all life, pursuing the accursed round in obedience to the strange nature of his mysterious and sore sickness. For by reason of this sickness, he could never make an end of his revolving task, might never find rest for his feet upon the weary path, but ever with measured stride, day after day, and year after year, with heavy gait, and bowed head, with furrowed brow, and distorted countenance, must he make the round of the still meadow, whilst ever towards the midpoint of the circle sped his darkling eye. And as to-day he performed the daily inevitable round, while the more sorrowfully he sunk his head, and the more he dragged his heavy steps for weariness, as though the grievous vigils of the night had spent the very fountain of his life, there came to him through the night and the dim dawn Pandora, his youngest daughter, who approached with uncertain steps, honoring the hallowed ground, and stood there humbly at his side, greeting him with modest glance, and questioned him with lips that held a reverential silence. It is at once evident that God has the malady of Prometheus, just as Prometheus allows all his passion, his whole libido, to flow inwards to the soul, to his innermost depths, in complete dedication to his soul's service, his God also pursues his course round and round the pivot of the world, thus spending himself like Prometheus, whose whole being comes near to extinction, which means that his libido has entirely passed over into the unconscious, where an equivalent must be prepared, for libido is energy which cannot disappear without a trace, it must always create an equivalent. The equivalent is Pandora and the gift she brings the father, for she brings him a precious jewel which she intends for the easing of men's woes. If we translate this process into Prometheus's human sphere, it would mean that while Prometheus is suffering his godlike state, his soul is preparing a work destined to alleviate the sufferings of mankind. His soul wants to get to men. Yet the work which his soul actually plans and carries out is not identical with the work of Pandora. Pandora's jewel is an unconsciously mirrored image which symbolically represents the actual work of Prometheus's soul. The text shows unmistakably what the jewel is. It is a God-deliverer, a renewal of the sun. This longing expresses itself in the sickness of the God. He longs for rebirth, and to this end his whole life force flows back into the center of the self, that is, into the depths of the unconscious, out of which life is born anew. This may explain why the appearance of the jewel in the world is depicted in such curious assonance with the scene of the birth of the Buddha in the Lalita Vistara. Pandora lays the jewel beneath a walnut tree, just as Maya bears her child under a fig tree. 
Quote, in the midnight shades beneath the tree, it glows and sparkles and flames. And like the morning star in the dark heavens, its diamond lightning flashes afar. Then sped on eager wing the bees and butterflies, which danced above the flower garden to play and sport around the wonder child. And out of the heavens came larks in steep descent, eager to pay homage to the new and lovelier sun countenance. As they drew near and beheld the bright radiance, their hearts swooned. And enthroned over all, fatherly and benign, the chosen tree, with his giant crown and heavy mantle of green, held his kingly hands protectingly over the faces of his children, and all his ample branches bowed themselves lovingly down and leaned towards the earth as though they wished to screen and ward off curious eyes, jealous that they alone might enjoy the gift's unmerited favor, while all the myriads of gently moving leaves fluttered and trembled with rapture, murmuring in joyous exultation a soft, clear-toned chorus in whispered accord. Who could know what lies hidden beneath this lowly roof, or guess the treasure reposing in our midst? End quote. So with Maya, who, when her hour has come, bore her child beneath the Plaska fig tree, which drooped its sheltering crown to earth. From the incarnate Bodhisattva, unimaginable radiance extended over the world. Gods and nature alike took part in the birth. As Bodhisattva treads the earth, there grows at his feet an immense lotus, and standing in the lotus he views the world. Hence the Tibetan prayer, Om Mani Padme Hum. Oh, behold the jewel in the lotus. The moment of rebirth finds Bodhisattva beneath the chosen Bodhi tree, where he becomes Buddha, the Enlightened One. This rebirth, or renewing, is accompanied by the same dazzling light, the same prodigies and apparitions of gods as at the birth. But in the kingdom of Epimetheus, where in place of the soul conscience reigns, the inestimable treasure gets lost. The angel raging over the stupidity of Epimetheus reviles him. And hadst thou no soul, that like the wild and unreasoning beasts, thou should hidest thyself from the wondrous Godhead? We see that Pandora's jewel is a renewal of the God, a new God. But this takes place in the heavenly sphere, that is, in the unconscious. Such intimations of the process as penetrate consciousness are not understood by the Epimethean element, which dominates the relation to the world. This is elaborately presented by Spittler in the following passages, in which we see how the world, that is, the conscious, with its rational attitude and objective orientation, is unfitted to make a true estimate of the value and significance of the jewel, for which reason the jewel is irretrievably lost. The renewed God signifies a renewed attitude, that is, a renewed possibility of intense life, a recovery of life, because, psychologically, God always signifies the greatest value, hence the greatest sum of libido, the greatest intensity of life, the optimum of psychological activity. Accordingly, with Spittler, the Promethean, just as much as the Epimethean, adaptation proves to be inadequate. The two tendencies are dissociated. The Epimethean attitude harmonizes with the actual conditions of the world. The Promethean, on the contrary, does not, which means that the latter must work out a renewal of life. This tendency creates also a new attitude to the world, the world to which the jewel is given, but, of course, without the consent of Epimetheus. Nevertheless, in the Pandora gift, as represented by Spittler, it is not difficult to recognize a symbolic attempt to solve that same problem we discussed in the chapter on the Schiller letters, namely, the problem of the reconciliation of the differentiated and undifferentiated functions. Before we proceed further with this problem, however, we must turn back to Goethe's Prometheus. As we have already seen, there are unmistakable differences between the creative Prometheus of Goethe and the suffering figure of Spittler. A further and more important distinction lies in the relation with Pandora. With Spittler, Pandora is a being of the other world, a duplicate of the soul of Prometheus belonging to the divine sphere, but with Goethe she was altogether the creature and daughter of the Titan, and therefore in absolute dependence upon him. The relation of Goethe's Prometheus with Minerva puts him in the place of Vulcan, and the fact that Pandora is wholly his creature and does not figure as a being of divine origin makes him a creative deity, thus removing him altogether from the human sphere. Hence Prometheus says, And when I deemed it was myself, a deity gave utterance, and did I dream a god was speaking? Lo, t'was mine own voice. With Spittler, on the other hand, Prometheus is stripped of all divinity. Even his soul is only an unofficial demon. His divinity becomes a law unto itself, quite severed from the human. Goethe's conception is classical to this extent. It emphasizes the divinity of the Titan. Accordingly, 
Epimetheus, by contrast, must also be very inferior, whilst with Spittler he appears as a much more positive character. In Goethe's Pandora, we are fortunate in possessing a work which conveys a far more complete portrait of Epimetheus than the fragment so far discussed. There, Epimetheus introduces himself as follows. For me day and night are as one, and ever I bear with me the old evil of my name. For my progenitors named me Epimetheus, thinking on the past, hasty actioned, backward turning with troubled fantasies to the melancholy opportunities of past days. Such bitter toil was laid upon my youth that turning impatiently towards life, I seized the present heedlessly, but only one tormenting burdens of fresh care. With these words, Epimetheus reveals his nature. He broods over the past and can never free himself from Pandora, whom, according to the classical myth, he has taken to wife. That is, he cannot rid himself of her imagined memory, though she herself has long since deserted him, leaving him her daughter, Epimelia, anxiety, but taking with her Elpora, hope. Epimetheus is here so clearly figured that we are at once able to recognize which psychological function he represents, while Prometheus is still the same creator and modeler who daily rises from his couch with the same unconquerable urgency to create and to influence the world. Epimetheus is entirely given up to fantasies, dreams, and memories, full of anxious misgivings and troubled deliberations. Pandora appears as the creature of Hephaestus, rejected by Prometheus but chosen by Epimetheus for a wife. He says of her, even the pains which such a treasure brings are pleasure. Pandora is to him a precious treasure, in fact, the supreme value. Quote, and forever is she mine, the glorious one. Supreme delight hath she revealed to me. I possessed beauty, and beauty hath enfolded me. In the wake of spring splendidly she came. I knew her, I caught her, and there was it done. Clouding thoughts vanished like a mist. She lifted me from earth to heaven. Seekest thou for words worthy to praise her? Wouldst thou extol her? She is already beyond thee. Set thy best beside her. Tis at once worthless. Her words bewilder thee, but lo, she is right. Thou mayest oppose her, the fight she doth win. Thou faltereth in serving her, but yet art her thrall. Goodness and love would she ever repay. High esteem helpeth not, she bringeth it low. She setteth her goal, and taketh her flight. If she barreth thy way, at once she doth hold thee. Wouldst thou make her an offer? She'll raise thee thy bid, till thou givest riches and wisdom and all in the bargain. She descendeth to earth in myriad forms, she hovereth over the waters, she strideth the plains, in divine proportions she shineth, proclaimeth, with form ennobling the inner meaning. When giving, she lendeth him power supreme, radiant with youth she came, in womanly form. For Epimetheus, as these verses clearly show, Pandora has the significance of a soul image. She represents his soul, hence her divine power, her unshakable superiority. Wherever such attributes are confirmed upon certain personalities, we may with certainty conclude that such personalities are symbol-bearers, in other words, imagines of projected unconscious contents. For it is the contents of the unconscious which operate with the supreme power above described, and especially in the way incomparably seized by Goethe in the line, Wouldst thou make her an offer? She'll raise thee thy bid. In this line, the characteristic effective reinforcement of certain conscious contents through association with analogous unconscious contents is beautifully pictured. This reinforcement has in it something demonic and compelling, and thus has a divine or devilish effect. We've already described Goethe's Prometheus figure as extroverted. It is still the same in his Pandora, although here, the relation of Prometheus with the soul, the unconscious feminine principle, is lacking. Instead, however, Epimetheus appears as the introvert, directed towards his inner world. He broods, he recalls memories out of the grave of the past, he reflects. He differs absolutely from Spittler's Epimetheus. We might say, therefore, that here, in Goethe's Pandora, the position indicated earlier, where Prometheus becomes the extroverted man of affairs, and Epimetheus the brooding introvert, has actually transpired. This Prometheus has somewhat the same quality in extroverted form as Spittler's in the form of the introvert. In the Pandora, on the contrary, Prometheus is definitely creative for collective ends. He has set up a regular manufactory in his mountain where necessary articles for the whole world are produced. Hence, he is cut off from his inner world, which relation now devolves upon Epimetheus, namely, that secondary and purely reactive thinking and feeling of the extrovert 
which possesses all the characteristics of the relatively undifferentiated function. Thus it comes about that Epimetheus is unconditionally pledged to Pandora, because in every respect she is superior to him. Psychologically, this means that the conscious Epimethean function of the extrovert, namely that fantastic, brooding, ruminating fancy, becomes intensified by the intervention of the soul. If the soul is coupled with a relatively undifferentiated function, we must draw the conclusion that the superior, that is, the differentiated function, is too collective. It is in the service of the collective conscious, and not in the service of freedom. Wherever such a case occurs, and it happens very frequently, the less differentiated function, that is, the other side, is reinforced by a pathological egocentricity. The extrovert fills up his spare time with melancholic or hypochondriacal musing. He may even have hysterical fantasies and others' symptoms, while the introvert wraps himself about with compulsive feelings of inferiority which take him unawares and put him into a no less dismal plight. The resemblance between the Prometheus of Pandora and the Prometheus of Spittler goes no further. He is merely the collective itch for action, which in its one-sidedness signifies the repression of the erotic. His son, Phaleros, he whom Eros loves, is simply erotic passion, for, as the son of his father, he must, as is often the case with children, retrieve under unconscious compulsion the unlived lives of his parents. The daughter of Epimetheus, the unreflecting, the type that acts heedlessly after first deliberating, is significantly Epimelia, anxiety. Phaleros loves Epimelia, Pandora's daughter, and thus the guilt of Prometheus, who has rejected Pandora, is expiated. Prometheus and Epimetheus become simultaneously reconciled, whereby the Promethean industry turns out to be unrecognized eroticism, while Epimetheus's persistent reference to the past is shown to be rational misgivings, which might well check the equally persistent productiveness of Prometheus and restrain it within reasonable bounds. This effort of Goethe to find a solution, which appears to be evolved from an extroverted psychology, brings us back to Spittler's attempt, which we left for the time being, in order to discuss Goethe's Prometheus figure. Spittler's Prometheus, like his god, turns away from the world, the periphery, and gazes inwards to the middle point, that narrow passage of rebirth. This concentration, or introversion, brings the libido gradually into unconscious whereby the activity of the unconscious contents is increased. The soul begins to work and creates a product which tends to emerge from the unconscious into consciousness. The conscious, however, has two attitudes. The Promethean, which withdraws the libido from the world, introverting without giving out, and the Epimethean, which is constantly responding in a soulless fashion held by the claims of external objects. When Pandora makes her gift to the world, it means, psychologically, that an unconscious product of great value is on the point of reaching extroverted consciousness, that is, it is seeking a relation to the real world, although the Promethean side, that is, the artist intuitively apprehends the great value of the work, his personal relations to the world are so subordinated to the tyranny of tradition that the work is merely appreciated as a work of art, and not at its real significance, namely as a symbol that promises a renewal of life. In order to convert it from a purely aesthetic interest into a living reality, it must also reach life, and be accepted and lived into the sphere of reality. But if the attitude is mainly introverted and given to abstraction, the extroverted function is inferior and is therefore under the spell of collective restrictiveness. This restrictiveness prevents the soul-created symbol from living, Thus, the jewel gets lost. But one cannot really live if God, that is, the highest symbolic expression of living value, cannot also become a living fact. Hence, the loss of the jewel also signifies the beginning of Epimetheus's downfall. And now, the in anti odromia begins. Instead of taking for granted, as every rationalist and optimist is inclined to do, that a good state will be followed by a better, since everything tends towards upward development, the man of blameless conscience and universally acknowledged moral principles makes a compact with Behemoth and his evil host, and even the divine children entrusted to his care are bartered to the devil. Psychologically, this means that the collective, undifferentiated attitude to the world stifles man's highest values. It thus becomes a destructive power whose influence multiplies until a point is reached when the Promethean side, 
namely the ideal and abstract attitude, places itself at the service of the soul, and, like a true Prometheus, kindles for the world a new fire. Spittler's Prometheus has to come out of his solitude and tell men, even at the risk of his life, that they are in error, and where they err. He must acknowledge the relentlessness of truth, just as Goethe's Prometheus, in Phaleros, has to experience the relentlessness of love. That the destructive element in the Epimethean attitude is actually this traditional and collective restrictiveness is clearly shown in Epimetheus's raging fury against the Lamb, an obvious caricature of traditional Christianity. In this effect, something gleams through which is already familiar to us in the approximately contemporary Asses Feast of Zarathustra. It is the expression of a contemporary tendency. Mankind is constantly inclined to forget that what was once good does not remain good eternally. He goes along the old ways that once were good, long after they have become injurious to him. Only through the greatest sacrifices and with untold suffering can he rid himself of this delusion and discern that what was good once is now perhaps grown old and is good no longer. This is so in the little things as in the big. The ways and customs of his childhood, once so sublimely good, he can barely lay aside, even when their harmfulness has long since been proved. The same, only on a gigantic scale, is the case with historical changes of attitude. A general attitude corresponds with religion, and changes of religion belong to the most painful moments in the world's history. In this respect, our age has a blindness without parallel. We think we have only to declare an acknowledged form of faith to be incorrect or invalid, to become psychologically free of all the traditional effects of the Christian or Judaic religion. We believe in enlightenment, as if an intellectual change of opinion has somehow a deeper influence on emotional processes, or indeed upon the unconscious. We entirely forget that the religion of the last 2,000 years is a psychological attitude, a definite form and manner of adaptation to inner and outer experience, which molds a definite form of civilization. It has, thereby, created an atmosphere which remains wholly uninfluenced by any intellectual disavowal. The intellectual change is, of course, symptomatically important as a hint of coming possibilities, but the deeper levels of the psyche continue for a long time to operate in the former attitude, in accordance with psychic inertia. In this way, the unconscious has preserved paganism alive. The ease with which the classic spirit springs again to life can be observed in the Renaissance. The readiness with which the vastly older primitive spirit reappears can be seen in our own time, even better, perhaps, than in any other historically known epoch. The more deeply rooted the attitude, the more effective must be the means that shall set it free. Ecrasé l'enfant, the cry of the Age of Enlightenment, heralded the religious upheaval within the French Revolution, which, viewed psychologically, meant nothing but an essential readjustment of attitude, which, however, was lacking in universality. The problem of a great general change of attitude has never slept since that time. It leaped to the surface again in many prominent minds of the 19th century. We have seen how Schiller sought to master the problem. In Goethe's treatment of the Prometheus and Epimetheus problem, we again recognize the attempt to make some sort of reconciliation between the more highly differentiated function, corresponding with the Christian ideal of favoring the good, and the relatively undifferentiated function, whose repression and non-recognition corresponds with the Christian ideal of rejecting the evil. In the symbols of Prometheus and Epimetheus, the difficulty which Schiller endeavored to master philosophically and aesthetically is shrouded in the garment of classical myth. Therewith something happens which, as I pointed out earlier, is altogether typical and regular, namely, when a man meets a difficult task which he cannot master with the means at his command, a retrograde movement of the libido automatically begins, that is, a regression occurs. The libido draws away from the problem of the moment, becomes introverted, and activates a more or less primitive analogy of the conscious situation in the unconscious, together with an earlier mode of adaptation. This law determines Goethe's choice of a symbol. Prometheus was the savior who brought life and fire to mankind languishing in darkness. Goethe's deep scholarship could easily have found another savior. The actual form of the determinant, therefore, is not sufficiently explained. The explanation must lie rather in the classical spirit, which was felt to contain an absolutely compensatory value for that particular time, the turning point of the 18th century. It was expressed in every possible way, in aesthetics, philosophy, morals, even politics, Philhellenism. 
It was the paganism of antiquity, glorified as freedom, naivete, beauty, and so on, which responded to the yearnings of that time. This yearning, as Schiller so clearly shows, arose from a feeling of incompleteness, of spiritual barbarism, of moral servitude, of ugliness. These feelings proceeded collectively and individually from a one-sided valuation whose inevitable consequences enabled the psychological dissociation between the more highly and less differentiated functions to become manifest. The Christian dismemberment of mankind into a valuable and worthless portion was unbearable to that age, which, compared with earlier times, was much more highly sensitized. Sinfulness had stumbled upon the idea of an everlasting natural beauty, a conception which was already possible for that age. It reached backwards, therefore, to an older time when the idea of sinfulness had not yet disrupted the unity of mankind, when both the higher and the lower in human nature could still live together in complete naivete without offending moral or ascetic susceptibilities. But the effort towards the regressive renaissance shared the fate of the Prometheus fragment and the Pandora. It was stillborn. The classical solution would no longer do, for the intervening centuries of Christianity, with their profound tides of spiritual experience, could not be denied. Hence the penchant for the antique had to content itself with a gradual attenuation into the medieval form. This process becomes manifest in Goethe's Faust, where the problem is seized by the horns. The divine wager between good and evil is accepted. Faust, the medieval Prometheus, enters the lists with Mephistopheles, the medieval Epimetheus, and makes a pact with him. And here the problem is already so well focused that we can see that Faust and Mephisto are one and the same individual. The Epimethean element, which refers all things to the retrospective angle and leads them back into the original chaos of fluid shapes and possibilities, is sharpened into the form of the devil, whose evil power opposes every living thing with the cold devil's fist, and who would force the light back into the maternal darkness from which it was born. The devil has throughout a true Epimethean thinking, the nothing-but intellectual attitude which reduces everything living to original nothingness. The naive passion of Epimetheus for the Pandora of Prometheus becomes Mephistopheles' devil's plot for the soul of Faust. And the cunning foresight of Prometheus in declining the divine Pandora is expiated in the tragedy of the Gretchen episode and the yearning for Helen, with its belated fulfillment, and in the endless ascent to the Heavenly Mothers, the eternal feminine draws us upwards. We have the Promethean defiance of the accepted gods in the figure of the medieval magician. The magician has preserved a trace of primitive paganism. In himself, there is an element still untouched by the Christian cleavage, that is, he has access to the unconscious that is still pagan, where the opposites still lie together in their primeval naivete, beyond the reach of sinfulness, but liable, when accepted into conscious life, to beget evil as well as good, with the same primeval, and therefore demonic, force, a part of that power which ever willeth evil, while ever creating the good. He is, therefore, a destroyer as well as a deliverer. Hence, this figure is preeminently fitted to become the bearer of the reconciling symbol. Moreover, the medieval magician has laid aside the antique naivete, which is no longer possible, and through stern experience has thoroughly absorbed the Christian atmosphere. His pagan element immediately urges him to a complete Christian denial and mortification of self. His craving for deliverance is so imperative that every possible means must be seized. But in the end, the Christian attempt at solution also fails, for then it is seen that it is precisely the longing for deliverance, the obstinacy and self-confidence of the heathen element, which offers the real possibility for deliverance, because the anti-Christian symbol affords a possibility for the acceptance of evil. Goethe's intuition, therefore, has apprehended the problem with enviable clarity. It is certainly characteristic that the other, more superficial attempts at solution, the Prometheus fragment, the Pandora, and the Rosicrucian compromise, with its attempt at a syncretism of Dionysian joyousness with Christian self-sacrifice, remained uncompleted. Faust's redemption begins with his death. His life sustains the Promethean divine character, which only falls from him in death, that is, with his rebirth. Psychologically, this means that the Faust attitude must cease before the unity of the individual can be accomplished. The figure which first appeared as Gretchen, and then on a higher level as Helen, and finally became exalted into the Mater Gloriosa, is a symbol that I cannot now exhaust in its manifold meanings. 
I will merely point out that it deals with the same archaic image with which the Gnosis was so profoundly concerned, namely, the idea of the divine harlot, Eve, Helen, Mary, and Sophia Archimoth. End of section 18. Recording by Olivia.